Welcome to the Cato Institute for our Constitution Day Conference. My name is Ilya Shapiro, and I'm Vice President and Director of the Robert A. Levy Center for Constitutional Studies. I'm also the publisher of the Cato Supreme Court Review, the 20th volume of which you can buy at cato.org uh, or download the articles for free. Thanks to the George M. Yeager Family Foundation, whose generosity allows us to Nineteen becomes an endemic part of our lives. We may still be dealing with uh, lingering mask mandates and other restrictions of dubious constitutionality, let alone We hold this event on September 17th because on this day, 234 years ago, the framers completed the Constitution in Philadelphia and sent it to the states for ratification. Liberty through limited government animated the Declaration of Independence, while the Constitution set out to make a more perfect union that would better secure and protect liberty. Later, we saw what's called the completion of the Constitution in the second founding of the post-Civil War amendments, though that was largely thwarted by a Supreme Court unwilling to defend individual rights, has nominated, sorry, has animated our center. And you can read about that dynamic in fellow at Cato and editor-in-chief of the Cato Supreme Court Review. He's also the editor of two books, A Conspiracy Against Obamacare and Deep Commitments, The Past, Present, and Future of Religious Liberty. And he co-hosts Free Thoughts, a weekly podcast on libertarian theory, history, and philosophy. Trevor first came to Cato as an intern right after graduating from the University of Denver. Thank you very much, Ilya. It is a pleasure to be actually here. Uh, this is my 11th Constitution Day, including the one when I was an intern. Um, and uh, what a difference a year makes. I guess last year I was bald uh, voluntarily um, and 60 pounds heavier and doing this from my dining room table. So this is much better uh, than it was last year. Um, a, year a year ago, too, we were facing a end up into a shameful debacle although some of us might have suspected, um, and Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was still alive. Uh, she died the day after Constitution Day on September 18th, 2020. So the confirmation of Amy Coney Barrett to Ginsburg's seat was difficult, although probably not as contentious as Justice Kavanaugh's. And now we have a new court. A 6-3 conservative Republican appointed majority is certainly a very different thing than a 5-4 Republican appointed majority. So what have we learned in this past year, aside from the lessons of working from home, maybe a pandemic hobby, gardening, knitting, mine was buying synthesizers and making a discotheque in my house. We also learned that people who own tigers are crazy. Uh, we, learned that, we also learned that justices are judges and not politicians. We learned that you can get nine justices to agree on a religious liberty case, but to agree on a donor privacy case, uh, both of which we discussed on this panel, hopefully. Um, 
We learned that while Chief Justice Roberts had power as the swing justice, that power maybe has diminished as Justice Barris joined the court. Although I'm not sure that is the case, as I think, especially over the decisions in the final months of the term, we saw Chief Justice Roberts, I think, fingerprints over a lot of the coalition building that he was striving for. Professor Laycock? Oh, you, oh. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we've learned that telefo- telephonic oral arguments are, in some ways, better. Um, I'd have to ask the advocates, uh, maybe some people in this room who've done it, but the serial questioning often makes for more substantive legal uh, discussions and less showboating. Uh, one wonders if Justice Scalia would be able to interrupt the word it with a question on telephonic oral arguments. Oral arguments, as Ilya said, will be back in person for the coming term, albeit with an empty courtroom or a mostly empty courtroom. It'll be interesting to see if any of the justices change their style uh, based on what they experienced in the last term. We've also learned that pandemics can be devastating with only over 670,000 Americans dead and untold costs in so many ways. So I very much thank you for being here and for the speakers for being here, many of whom traveled from out of state. As the pandemic continues, we try to establish some, some, some sense of normalcy at Cato in a let's not let the virus win kind of way. And Cato will be reopening in full on Monday. So this is a good dry run for what we're going to be doing. Um, I'd like to thank some important people, Roger Pilon, who I did not see yet this morning, uh, who founded the department and gave me my job out of the internship. Uh, without Roger, I would be a libertarian ranting in bars, practicing corporate law in Denver. Um, I'm still a libertarian ranting in bars, but I, I get to work at the Cato Institute. So, <clears throat> And of course, Ilya Shapiro, who I've been, been one of my partners I partnered with on so many briefs that I'm, I don't even know the count at this point and now directs the department uh, with skill. Clark Neely is a somewhat newly minted vice president of legal affairs uh, and someone who is a tireless champion of human liberty and justice. My associate editors, Will Yateman, you will see later, Tommy Berry, Walter Olson, and Ilya, and also our excellent legal associates who helped us with all the site checking and nit finding, which trust me is a whirlwind endeavor when you try and publish a law, law journal in five weeks. That would be Spencer Davenport, Stacey Hansen, Navid Rajendran, Mallory Reeder, Christian Townsend, and legal interns Madeline Brooks and Richard Freidel. And last but definitely not least, Sam Spiegelman, who will be representing the audience questions all day, uh, who is an excellent editor and attention to detail. I'd like to thank Linda, Kiana, and the conference staff who have been trying to do something This year, it is definitely not in their job description originally, including remote events and David Tassi for doing the technical. And of course, the authors, I don't know if there's a general award you can give to Supreme Court Review groups of authors who all go under their word limits. Definitely last year's was did not get that reward, but all of you get that reward this year. Um, So this is another edition of the Cato Supreme Court Review. Uh, For some housekeeping, due to DC restrictions, you have to wear your mask at all times, even when asking a question. Bathrooms are up the spiral staircase and down the spiral staircase. There's also one next to the elevator, but that's only a single bathroom, so I wouldn't advise queuing up for that one. Lunch will be served in the George M. Yeager Conference Center at noon, and as Ilya mentioned, if we survive rain, the reception. The hashtag Cato SCOTUS is how you can ask questions on Twitter. And of course, as we say, the reception will be after Professor Barkow's lecture. So moving to our first panel, Uh, We're going to start with the way it's listed in the program. I'd like to introduce, just in time, uh, Professor Douglas Laycock, the Robert E. Scott Distinguished Professor at the University of Virginia School of Law. The rest of the bios that are extensive for all of our speakers are in the review and in your packet. Uh, Professor Laycock will be discussing the Fulton case. Professor Laycock. Well, I apologize. The last email I got said 1045, and I thought I was in plenty of time. Um, So I am uh, describing... uh, Fulton versus Philadelphia, which has very little relevance in the way of holding, although more than you might guess, uh, it's uh, all an opinion about signs and omens and portents with respect to employment division versus Smith. Smith was the 1990 case in which Justice Scalia uh, cut back on the free exercise clause, but Smith announced two rules, one of which has gotten lots of attention, the other which got very little until recently. Uh, Smith said... uh, If a law is neutral and generally applicable, uh, it raises no free exercise issue as applied to religion. It does not matter how severe the burden is. Um, Smith itself involved the central ritual of a worship service. It does not matter how trivial the government's interest is. There's just no issue, and the government doesn't need a reason. Um, 
And the second rule is, but if the law is not neutral and generally applicable, then it is subject to the compelling interest test as before. And whatever you think about the merits of the Smith rules, this is one of the worst opinions in the history of the Supreme Court. Everything is done in parentheticals and subordinate clauses and uh, qualifications. There's no clear announcement of the rule. And there's very little about what counts as a neutral and generally applicable law. Um, and uh, the rhetoric of the opinion is as though everything is neutral and generally applicable. But the details of the opinion are, if it's got an exception, it's not generally applicable. Um, and I've been pounding on that for 30 years now, and no one paid any attention uh, in the academic world until pretty recently. Lower court opinions began to change after 1993. From 90 to 93, everything was neutral and generally applicable. A law that excluded churches by name was neutral and applicable because Churches treated just like lecture halls and concert halls and theaters um, are analogized instead to grocery stores. Um, <clears throat> but um, the protective part of Smith, that rules that have exceptions are not generally applicable and are subject to compelling interest analysis, has gotten uh, a lot more attention. A gay child was an anti-gay family, most obviously, or perhaps vice versa. Um, and so Philadelphia had real problems on general applicability. The path the court picked out uh, depends on details of the Philadelphia law that will never arise in quite the same way again. Some other things the chief said in the course of that holding do matter. difficulties. Um, second, the court, Philadelphia actually had never made an exception that was relevant sexual orientation discrimination in the placing of children, but they explicitly Yeah. They can refuse an exception to the church without having to worry that there might someday arise a, a more sympathetic unguided discretion in the free speech context. <clears throat> um, third, the court said it doesn't matter if this arises in the context of awarding government contracts. Oh. Um, it doesn't matter if this 
Um, it's, Philadelphia hasn't treated as a compelling interest if it reserved the right to make uh, exceptions. Uh, and, and finally, this is less holding than simply a characterization, significant because unanimous. The church here only seeks to practice its own beliefs. It does not seek to impose those beliefs on others. Much of the rhetoric in this context has been, whenever you see an exemption, you're trying to impose your belief on whoever it is you're dealing with. This is no sides uh, to have space to live according to their own uh, beliefs and values. Um, <laughs> Omens and prognostication. Five votes that Smith was wrongly decided. Um, Alito wrote a 77-page concurrence. It was probably originally a majority that he lost uh, to explain why Smith should be overruled. Uh, Barrett and Kavanaugh said Smith was wrong, but we're not sure what to replace it with, and we're not eager to overrule it until we figure that out. Uh, in addition, Justice Breyer, 25 years ago, and Bernie uh, said Smith should be reconsidered. Uh, Roberts has joined such opinions on, on occasion in certain cases. Um, so five, possibly six, possibly seven votes to reconsider Smith when they're finally forced to do it. There are two cases in the docket, the Diocese of Albany, about whether Catholic institutions have to cover abortion in their employee insurance plans, and Dignity Health, a case from California about a Catholic hospital that refused to permit a we want to talk about is Justice Barrett's question, what replaces Smith? Um, she wants to think that through further, which is, of course, it protects any other uh, fundamental right. Uh, free exercise is a fundamental First Amendment right like uh, all the others. Um, about, uh, she didn't cite this, may have alluded to it, United States v. O'Brien on burning your draft card to protest the Vietnam War. That was nominally intermediate scrutiny. It required a substantial government interest. And the interest they accepted barely would have passed rational basis context in some other, some other context. Um, it's important that you keep your draft card and not burn it, because if you forget where your draft office is, it will remind you it has the address. That's not quite as crazy as it sounds, but it's pretty crazy. It's not a substantial government interest. So uh, review will be watered down. That has been the experience. Even under the compelling interest test, the government has won majority of free exercise cases. Uh, intermediate scrutiny will be watered down even uh, further. The compelling interest test is not strict in theory and fatal in fact and has not been for a long time. Free exercise involves conduct, and there is more good reasons for government to regulate conduct uh, than to regulate speech or to permit racial discrimination. Um, so, yeah, government will win, legitimately win, more free exercise cases under the compelling uh, interest test. Uh, Justice Barrett may have been thinking about the time, place, and manner speech cases. Um, if the government regulates where you can speak or when you can speak, but leaves open ample alternative means of communication, that is subject to much more deferential review, doesn't get the compelling interest test. Um, and that makes sense. Uh, but it doesn't apply to many free exercise cases because there are not typically ample alternative means of practicing the religious practice at issue. And the fact that you can practice some other religious practice doesn't matter. The church says, it's, it's against our faith, it's sinful for us to place children in same-sex families. It doesn't matter to say, well, you can still say the Mass, you can still have communion, you can still build churches, you can still do all these other things. Yeah, well, Catholics do a lot of things. Uh, and religious practices are not fungible, and the ability to practice one is not a substitute for the other, as the court said in Holt v. Hobbs, a prisoner case just a, a, a few years ago. It's like saying uh, ample alternative means of communication means you can spread some other message. Uh, no, that doesn't count. You have to be able to spread the same message in alternative channels and forums, and you have to be able to engage in the same religious practice. Religious practices are not 
uh, fungible. Um, secular exceptions uh, still matter, uh, because even if the court overrules Smith, because they undermine the state's claim of a compelling government interest. You didn't think it was compelling over there. You didn't think you, it was impossible to grant an exception over there. Why is it impossible to grant uh, a religious exception? Um, some cases have to be treated differently, always have been. If your religious claim aligns too closely with secular self-interest, uh, the government, one way to put it is the government has a compelling interest in disallowing that because it will invite too many phony claims and it will encourage too many people to convert to the religion. If you could get an exemption for paying taxes because it was against your religion to pay them, the whole libertarian community and the Republican Party would convert in a heartbeat, and a lot of Democrats wouldn't be very far behind. And so the court rejects those claims, right? No one's ever won a tax exemption case on a constitutional uh, theory. Um, some of these, uh, uh, finally, one last point. A compelling interest test works best if it is understood as a balancing test uh, with uh, a heavy thumb on the side of the constitutional right. And often the court has characterized it just that, just that way. Podium, I can take Harris. undertaking. Over the next several years, the Supreme Court 
uh, expanded this right in a number of cases, many of which, although not all of which, were uh, cases out of the civil rights movement. Some also involved uh, the Red Scare efforts to force, for example, teachers to declare all of their past affiliations over a period of as long as five years, any group they'd belong to or a meeting had attended, that sort of thing. Uh, and, and so by the late 1960s, there was a pretty strongly uh, uh, entrenched right to keep your associations private, including an important case of uh, investigation or of law. Then came the political cases, however. In 1974, Congress passed uh, amendments to the Federal Election Campaign Act, and although the, the federal election laws had long required some disclosure of, of political contributions, there had never really been an enforcement mechanism, and it had never really been taken seriously by anybody. After 1974, political actors had to take it seriously. And so what that did was uh, bring a challenge in the Supreme Court to a number of provisions of the Federal Election Campaign Act. The plaintiffs in that case did not directly challenge, however, the broad scope of uh, disclosing political contributions. Uh, rather, they challenged uh, only uh, the, uh, uh, the law as it pertained to minor parties, the idea that it wasn't really necessary for parties who weren't going to elect anybody anyway. And in certain cases, they challenged the, the breadth of the law. The scope of the law at issue in the Federal Election Campaign Act was you had to disclose any speech relative to a clearly identified candidate, uh, a, an extremely, obviously, broad uh, category that could take in almost everything that people want to, uh, want to talk about. And so the Supreme Court there upheld disclosure, and thus you ended up with sort of two tracks going off. You had the NAACP track saying people have a right to keep their you know, activities private uh, from a nosy government, and you had the political track saying people did not have a right to keep their activities private from a nosy government. Now these two can be reconciled largely because the political track, uh, the Buckley track, was based on the idea that this was specifically related to political campaigns and the discussion of candidates, very narrowly defined. Uh, it, it applied to candidate campaigns, political parties, and PACs, and it applied to other groups that would specifically advocate for the election or defeat of a candidate by saying things like vote for, vote against, defeat, support. Anything less did not get you that kind of disclosure. So ever since Buckley, uh, the, the Supreme Court case in, in the Federal Election Campaign Act, the goal of people who want to regulate more political speech has been to try to expand this definition of political speech to, to include more activity within the definition of political speech. Now note that what the NAACP was doing, and what was done in these other cases as well, uh, without going into detail on all of them, certainly was politically related. Right? I mean, the NAACP was leading the fight for civil rights in the South. How could you possibly not say that in some broad colloquial sense that was political speech? But it wasn't what the Supreme Court meant in Buckley where it upheld the limits or where it upheld yeah, the, the requirements of compulsory disclosure uh, by uh, referring to things directly related to trying to elect a candidate uh, and funds directly given to a candidate or to a political party. So this is what sets up uh, the issue in Bonta. Over time, uh, courts have become more and more lenient in allowing states to apply compulsory disclosure on people whose speech is only, only has an attenuated connection to political uh, uh, races. And that has particularly become the case since Citizens United v. Uh, Federal Election Commission in 2010, where there is some sloppy language by Justice Kennedy. He takes a, a sentence from Buckley and says, as we said in Buckley, and then he adds stuff that they didn't say in Buckley to it, and kind of gives this impression that, you could, that states maybe can require disclosure on an awful lot of things. And so we've begun to see that in recent years. Um, pressure here. Courts begin to interpret it more as a, a, a rational basis type law. The court had used the term that it required exacting scrutiny in the past, but the courts began to interpret exacting scrutiny as meaning nothing more than that there be a substantial connection between the requirement for disclosure and uh, some state interest. Okay. Well, even given the way our legislatures often act, almost all laws have some connection <laughs> right, to some legitimate state interest, at least something that you can plausibly state with a reasonably straight face. And the courts were therefore almost always saying, well, there's a, there's a, a connection between the state interest and the disclosure, done, okay, 
the disclosure is, is fine, this enforced disclosure. And what we've seen over the last several years is an effort to keep pushing the boundaries here, uh, to create name and shame, to try to isolate people, to threaten them with retaliation. We see a lot of this unofficially in you know, Twitter mobs and efforts to get people fired from their jobs and so on. But we also see this officially. For example, uh, Senator Durbin sent out a letter to a large number of supporters of the American Legislative Exchange Council, which is a group of mostly conservative but bipartisan state legislators. Uh, demanding that they reveal if they gave to this group and if they supported certain positions that the group gave and telling them, by the way, we're going to call you out at a hearing at which you're going to prevent, present the mother of uh, Trayvon Martin, who you may recall was uh, killed uh, by a, uh, I, I guess we'll call him a vigilante, uh, self-styled block watcher in an argument that the two had. Um, you had Elizabeth Warren demanding that think tanks, including center-left ones like the Brookings Institute, reveal who is funding these, these studies that are critical of my legislative proposals. Uh, we need to know. Why do we need to know? Uh, presumably so we can uh, bring them into line and let them know uh, who's boss here. I don't know. Uh, we shouldn't kid ourselves as to what's been going on here. And in fact, in the case, in uh, Bonta, uh, a group of Democratic senators filed a brief specifically saying that the information needed to be available so that they could flush out dark money from the political system. So what was the actual dispute in Bonta? Well, at one point, uh, when Kamala Harris was attorney general, she began demanding that uh, charities and other nonprofits submit to the state before they could solicit in California uh, uh, copies of their Schedule B that they submit to the IRS. And this is the form you submit to the IRS that includes the name of your large donors. Um, of course, California is where a lot of the money in the country is. New York, by the way, followed suit. So pretty soon, charities that would not disclose their donors to the attorney generals of New York and California could not solicit in those states, probably the two wealthiest states in the country and in the place where you find a great number of, of large donors. This was eventually challenged by Americans for Prosperity Foundation and the Thomas More uh, Legal Center. Uh, and uh, uh, these two uh, organizations won in the trial court lost in the Ninth Circuit, and eventually brought their claim to the Supreme Court. Again, the argument was that they have a right to keep their donors private unless the state has a need for the organization. Both groups con conceded that if the state were really investigating them for fraud or something or needed the information in some way, they could get it through an audit letter or a subpoena. It was just the bulk collection of this information from literally tens of thousands of charities that was problematic. Um, the, court, the decision of the court, I think, is very uh, appealing, uh, to me at least, for a, a number of, of reasons. First, the court was very sensitive to, and even mentioned uh, briefly, at least in the line, current developments of this sort of mob justice and people being hounded from jobs and businesses being boycotted and so on, for it is routine legal uh, speech. The court also noted uh, the broad array of amicus groups uh, that were involved in the case, groups that came in on the side of the charities. And they ranged from the Council on American-Islamic Relations to religious uh, Christian conservative groups. They ranged from Planned Parenthood to Right to Life chapters. Uh, it was an extremely broad uh, collection here. And so the court noted that this really is a, a sensitive issue. This was important because one of the positions of the state was there's no harm under the First Amendment at all. Why? Because we're just collecting the information for ourselves. We're not going to publish it. So it's not really disclosure, and there's no harm. Now, of course, I think many in this audience would be the kind who would say, wait a minute. The government's exactly the people I want to keep this information uh, from. That's who I want to, want to prevent from getting it. Um, so the court agreed on that point. The court agreed that it was not necessary that the state be planning to disclose the information publicly. In this position, by the way, the state's case was not helped by the fact that they actually had published about 1,800 of these forms. And another uh, couple hundred thousand of them were literally available on the web if you had a modest knowledge of how HTML addresses worked and uh, wanted to sit down and actually go through it, you could actually get into about a, hundred, a couple hundred thousand of these Schedule Bs that the uh, Attorney General of California was collecting. Uh, so the state wasn't helped by that. But they promised to do better, and the Ninth Circuit said, OK, that's fine, good, good enough for us. 
Um, good enough for the dissenters uh, as well in the Supreme Court, but not for the majority. And, and again, the majority's key point here wasn't so much that the state was releasing the information, it's that it didn't really matter whether the state was releasing the information. We might also consider the fact that even if the state's motives are pure today, they developed this huge data bank of information, they may not be pure tomorrow or under a succeeding administration that would have this type of information. Secondly, the court reiterated a point uh, that had drifted away, that exacting scrutiny required uh, narrow tailoring, right? Now, this is not the strict scrutiny, least restrictive means, but it does say that if the law substantially burdens activity that is unrelated to the state interest, you've got a problem. And here again, they're collecting hundreds of thousands of these forms under the vague assertion that they may need it for law enforcement if they want it to investigate somebody. Here again, the state's case as a factual matter was undercut by the fact that at trial, uh, the state had not been able to show that it had ever used these forms, not even once uh, that these forms had been necessary to instigate uh, an investigation of an organization. But nonetheless, that's, where they, uh, that's uh, what they argued. The key point here again is the Supreme Court says it doesn't really matter, right, it's, uh, you still have to narrowly tailor things, uh, even if you might have used it in some cases. And uh, the state, uh, the court then suggested that lower courts need to look skeptically at that asserted state interest. So when the state of California said, well, law enforcement, we might need it to investigate charities, the court said, no, you got to be kind of careful about that. Uh, you can't just do that uh, in this kind of broad fashion. The idea that it may be more convenient for you isn't enough. Administrative convenience won't do it. Um, and so with that, you put some real teeth into the exacting scrutiny standard. And it basically says now that, again, it's really none of the government's business who you give money to, what organizations you support or belong to. It may become the state's business if they have a legitimate investigation going on that requires them to actually get that information. But they can't just generally say that they need it or they want it or it will be convenient for them to have it. So let me close by getting to the the point I mentioned earlier, that this goes in a sense to that greater relationship between people and the state. The state's position was sort of like, we're just asking you for information, just give it to us. And, and they really didn't argue that they needed much of a reason other than this vague, almost hand-waving, well, law enforcement, we have to enforce the law against charities, so they're charities, so they should have to give us the information. Um, and this is what the court rejects. And it is a relationship between the people and the government that I think is improper. It should be the other way around. Government has to justify why they want something from the people. And if the person's only response is, because I don't want to give it to you, that's good enough until the government actually presents a reason why it needs it. The person who is being asked to disclose doesn't have to show a record of harassment, doesn't have to show religious beliefs against flaunting their charity, doesn't have to show concern about being hassled by other people asking for funds. It's enough to just say, no, I don't want you to have it. Uh, so it is a big, uh, big win in that respect for privacy. And I want to uh, note by, by saying one argument that was made repeatedly by uh, many folks in the lower courts uh, was that uh, this was um, uh, necessary, you know, as a society to, to, we had to be bold. People needed to be held accountable. They frequently quoted the late uh, great Justice Antonin Scalia, who said in one of these cases, a case, by the way, relating specifically to overt political vote for vote against activity, said, harsh criticism short of unlawful action is a price our people have traditionally been willing to pay for self-governance. Requiring people to stand up in public for their political acts fosters civic courage without which democracy is doomed. I do not look forward to a society which campaigns anonymously, hidden from public scrutiny and protected from accountability and criticism. This does not resemble the home of the brave. Okay, and this was cited repeatedly, mainly by people who hated Justice Scalia and his jurisprudence in, in most aspects. But what I think is... Uh, important to note here, and why I think Justice Scalia was wrong and the court was right, is this simple proposition. Um, the Supreme Court, well, let's look at Antonin Scalia, for whom I have tremendous admiration, uh, whom I knew a little bit, I know people his family better, uh, but Justice Scalia had an outgoing personality. He liked verbal combat. A lot of people shy away from that. Justice Scalia spent most of his adult life in jobs in which he could not be fired, and the last 30 years of his adult life in a job in which his pay could not be reduced. Nor did he ever have to worry about the effects of a boycott on his business leading to his 
employees becoming unemployed because of declining business or his shareholders losing money that maybe they were counting on for their pensions and that sort of thing. Uh, Justice Scalia was famous for chasing away his U.S. Marshals uh, when, he, when he traveled, but he was able to invoke the protection of U.S. Marshals any time that it might be necessary. They did watch over the court and protect his workplace and so on. In other words, he was in a very, very unique position. And the other element here, the big element of this, is not just what is the relationship between people and the government, but who is the First Amendment for? Is the First Amendment only for the strong? Is it only for those who are willing to stand up and risk being fired from their jobs or being harassed on the streets or concerned about their family members being targeted? Or does the First Amendment also protect more ordinary citizens who have ideas that maybe we should hear in the public, who have thoughts that we should hear and positions that should be debated and discussed in the public? Is our society better off if those people are chased out of the realm of the public uh, sphere? I think the answer is pretty clearly no, and I think in this case, the Supreme Court gave ample support to that position. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brad. Next, we'll be hearing from Tommy Berry, who is pinch hitting for David Hudson, who wrote the article in the volume you have with you on the Mahonoi case, um, otherwise known as the cussing cheerleader case, which of course got a lot of, of press, uh, but we'll see if, what, how significant it actually might have been. Tommy? All right, uh, thank you, Trevor. I am excited. Uh, this is my first opportunity to speak on a Cato Constitution Day panel. Uh, it is bittersweet because uh, Professor Hudson wasn't able to be here, but I will, as he said, try to pinch it as, as best I can. So this is Mahanoy. Uh, I like to call it the salty Snapchatting sophomore case. Uh, to understand it, I first have to give a brief history of the most important student speech case at the Supreme Court before Mahanoy, which was Tinker versus Des Moines School District from back in 1969. Uh, Tinker was about a group of Iowa public school students who planned to wear black armbands on their sleeves at school to protest the Vietnam War. The school found out about the protest, uh, found them in school, sent them home, told them they were suspended until they came back without the armbands. They sued, their case eventually reached the Supreme Court, and the court held that their suspension violated the students' First Amendment rights. In a memorable turn of phrase, Justice Abe Fortas wrote for the court that, quote, it can hardly be argued that either students or teachers shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech or expression at the schoolhouse gate, end quote. But the court also acknowledged the, quote, need for affirming the comprehensive authority of the states and of school officials consistent with fundamental constitutional safeguards to prescribe and control conduct in the schools, end quote. The court described the student speech regulations as a collision between these two values. And that notion of free speech and school discipline as competing and conflicting values has really underlined the school speech cases ever since. So how did the court attempt to balance those values in Tinker? It announced a rule that a public school student may, quote, express his opinions, even on controversial subjects like the conflict in Vietnam, if he does so without materially and substantially interfering with the requirements of appropriate discipline in the operation of the school. Applying this test to the black arm pro armband protest, the Tinker Court easily found the suspension was not justified. The court explained that there was no evidence that the armband protest had, in fact, disrupt disrupted the work of the school or any class. And most importantly, the court rejected a theory that a generalized fear of potential disruption was sufficient justification for speech suppression. The court held that, quote, undifferentiated fear or apprehension of disturbance is not enough to overcome the right to freedom of expression, end quote. And the court explained schools, quote, need more than a mere desire to avoid the discomfort and unpleasantness that always accompany an unpopular viewpoint, end quote. Because there was no actual disturbance or specific reason to expect a disturbance, the suspension violated the First Amendment. So ever since Tinker was decided, substantial disruption has been the linchpin of student speech cases. If schools can show that a statement or silent protest did in fact cause a substantial disruption, or that the school had a concrete and specific reason to believe that it would, then courts will generally uphold restrictions on that speech. 
But if not, students have a First Amendment right to speak their mind without the interference of public school officials, who are, lest we forget, government actors. But Tinker's substantial disruption test left two key unanswered questions. First, is there any implied reasonableness limitation to the reaction of listeners and the disruption that reaction may cause? Suppose a student makes a mildly controversial statement in school, but other students who hear it are so offended that they immediately raise a hue and cry, announcing that they are so psychologically wounded that they can't go on with their lessons that day. Well, <clears throat> the mildly controversial statement did, in fact, cause a substantial disruption. So if that's all that matters, then under Tinker, the principal could tell the student, don't ever make that mildly controversial statement again, or you'll be sent to detention. But that certainly seems like a rule that would give a lot of power to listeners. It would tell students, if you don't like what someone else is saying, then raise as much of a ruckus as you can when you hear it. So some scholars have argued the Tinker Rule should carry or does carry an implied limitation to only disruptions that are reasonable reactions to the speech at issue. Disproportionate reactions, sometimes called the heckler's veto, shouldn't justify punishing speech. And the second key unanswered question was whether the Tinker Rule applies to student speech delivered outside the school environment. A school is, of course, a community, and a conversation between students off campus over the weekend can have repercussions later during school hours. In other words, it's plausible to imagine scenarios <clears throat> where speech off campus causes a disruption on campus. But if Tinker applied to speech off campus, students would never have a waking moment when they can know they are completely free of their school potentially monitoring and reviewing their speech. Controversial views posted on Facebook or Twitter from a student's bedroom could become the grounds for discipline days later. That potential chilling effect convinced some scholars that the Tinker Rule should not extend past the schoolhouse gates, at least not without some major caveats. And lower courts grappled with this question for years, generally holding that some off-campus speech could be punished for causing a substantial disruption on campus, but often adding additional requirements besides substantial disruption, such as that the speech also has to have been directed towards members of the school community, or had a reasonable likelihood of reaching the school, or dealt with issues closely related to the school. And that brings us to the case of Brandy Levy, who, by the way, in the court documents is referred to by just her initials BL because she was a minor at the time, but she has voluntarily chosen to be identified in the media. As a rising sophomore in Manoy City, Pennsylvania, Brandy tried out for the cheerling squad, but she only made junior varsity. She was frustrated with that and also unhappy with her position on a private softball team, and she was anxious about upcoming exams. So one Saturday, hanging out with a friend at the local Cocoa Hut, she pulled out her phone, took a selfie with the friend, raised their middle fingers, and posted it to Snapchat. She also added a vulgar caption, which I'll read verbatim, so those of you offended by profanity, shield your ears now, and please don't create a substantial disruption. The Snapchat read, quote, fuck school, fuck softball, fuck cheer, fuck everything, end quote. Brandy's cheer coaches found out about the snap. Brandy was suspended from JV cheer for the full year, and she sued. Reviewing Brandy's case, the Third Circuit decided that they were going to be the first circuit to establish a categorical bright line rule for off-campus student speech. The Third Circuit held that Tinker does not apply to off-campus speech at all. Whether it causes a substantial disruption on campus or not, the court held that off-campus speech is off limits for discipline, unless it falls into some other First Amendment exception. The court suggested that off-campus physical threats of violence or harassment would likely fall under such exceptions, true threats and the like, but it left those details for another day. Because Brandy's snap was made outside of school, the Third Circuit held the school could not punish her for it, whether or not it caused a disruption, and it declined to uh, make a ruling on that factual question. Well, this was quite a categorical ruling, the most, ever by a circuit, most categorical ever by a circuit court on this issue, and perhaps for that reason, the Supreme Court took the case up for review. By a vote of eight to one, the Supreme Court affirmed the Third Circuit's judgment that Brandy's punishment was unconstitutional, but it did not affirm the Third Circuit's categorical rule. Instead, in an opinion by Justice Stephen Breyer, who is often fond of multi-factor balancing tests rather than bright line rules, including in his own personal life, the court opted to provide only general guidelines for how lower courts should approach off-campus speech cases in the future. 
First, the court declined to foreclose the application of Tinker to off-campus speech in every instance, holding that the reasons justifying Tinker do not, quote, always disappear when a school regulates speech that takes place off campus, end quote. The court suggested, without limiting itself to the examples offered, that some circumstances potentially calling for regulation of off-campus speech might include bullying classmates, threats aimed at teachers or other students, cheating or otherwise breaking the rules on school assignments, and breaches of school security devices. Then, in the crux of the opinion, the court identified three features of off-campus speech that, in the court's words, diminished the strength of the unique educational characteristics that might call for special First Amendment leeway to regulate speech. The first of these three features is that, quote, off-campus speech will normally fall within the zone of parental rather than school-related re responsibility. And this point, by the way, was emphasized in Cato's amicus brief, which argued that punishment of off-campus speech should be left entirely to parents and, if necessary, to law enforcement. The second feature is that, by definition, off-campus speech includes, quote, all the speech a student utters during a full 24-hour day, end quote. Regulating only on-campus speech means a student can wait to step off the school bus and then speak their piece. Regulating speech off campus, by contrast, quote, may mean the student cannot engage in that kind of speech at all, end quote. In the court's words, that means judges, quote, must be more skeptical of a school's efforts to regulate off campus speech, end quote, and this skepticism should be ratcheted up even further when political or religious speech is at issue, at which court point courts should impose, quote, a heavy burden to justify intervention, end quote. And the third and final feature is that public schools have a, quote, interest in protecting a student's unpopular expression, end quote. In other words, the mere fact that speech is unpopular with other classmates is not a justification for schools to restrict it. If anything, it's the reasons why schools should be especially vigilant to protect it. Applying these guidelines to the facts at hand, the court easily found that the school was not justified in punishing Brandy for her single snap. Indeed, the court strongly suggested that even if Brandy had said the same things on campus, it would not have met Tinker's substantial disruption standard. Judge Thomas Ambro of the Third Circuit had concurred in the judgment below on those narrower grounds, and the Supreme Court noted that its reasons resembled those of the Third Circuit panel's concurring opinion. At the Supreme Court, in a concurrence, Justice Alito, joined by Justice Gorsuch, stressed that public schools only have the right to regulate student speech to the extent that parents have impliedly consented to that regulation by enrolling their children. Alito stressed that such implied consent is much less likely for off-campus contexts, where parents themselves retain control and supervision of their children. In a solo dissent, Justice Thomas argued that the court's student speech doctrine, going all the way back to Tinker, is not consistent with the original understanding of the First or Fourteenth Amendment. Thomas argued that the right of schools to regulate students in place of their parents, or in lawyer Latin, in loco parentis, was an accepted doctrine at the time of the founding with few limitations, and that the First Amendment was not understood to create any such limitations on that doctrine, and the Fourteenth Amendment was not in, understood to apply those limitations to the states. So where does Mahanoy leave us? Overall, it's of course a win for student speech. It should not go unappreciated that this is the first time since Tinker that the Supreme Court has actually invalidated a school's punishment of student speech after Tinker uh, students at the Supreme Court were on an 0-3 losing streak. Going forward, the guidelines that the court established mean that students speaking off campus should rarely have their speech curtailed. But nonetheless, the hesitancy of the court to establish any bright line rule not even that regulating off-campus political or religious speech is categorically out of bounds is disappointing. As the court has recognized in other contexts, bright line rules avoid the chilling effect that can come from uncertainty and even a remote possibility that speech might be punished. While the opinion provides public school students many reassurances, it doesn't provide them any certainties. In addition, the opinion was a missed opportunity to address the heckler's veto problem, something that Justice Kagan had suggested in oral argument it might be appropriate to clarify. Had the court made clear that overreactions to speech can't justify discipline, that alone would have allayed the fear that students might be punished for controversial Facebook posts or off-campus political speeches somewhere. But perhaps one unexpected benefit <clears throat> of this case is that in, in the briefing, the court was made aware of many examples of recent lower court decisions that arguably did allow a heckler's veto. Even though addressing that issue wasn't necessary to decide this case, 
It's possible that the heckler's veto question could be the subject of the next big student speech case at the Supreme Court. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy. Uh, excellent job of pinch hitting. Who's the most successful pinch hitter in the, his in the history of the major leagues? Lou Gehrig for Wally Pipp. Okay, see. <laughs> yeah, we'll call him Lou Gehrig. Technically not pinch hitting. It was yeah, yeah, yeah. Wally Pipp had a headache that day. I think Edgar Martinez might have. Anyway, <laughs> uh, we're going to open up for questions in a second. I'm going to take some moderator's privilege uh, before Kirk we Gibson, get. Kirk Gibson, that's a good one. Uh, Ilya says Kirk Gibson. Kirk Gibson. On oh, two yeah. bad legs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On two bad legs. Um, I'd first like to ask one for Professor Laycock. Um, are you optimistic that if they're the next case, is there a single step to overturning Smith now, or is it going to take an, an intermediate step of some sort to try and rectify, or at least maybe Justice Barrett's hesitancy? Um, I don't know the answer to that. You know, it, it's, it's a commonplace. Sometimes they squarely overrule, and sometimes they nibble away for years until it doesn't mean anything anymore. Uh, and they could take either path here. They've been nibbling, right? and, and they've, and you know, I'm, I may be the biggest academic defender in the country of the view that if there's a secular exception, there has to be a religious exception. In my view, they've carried that too far. They used secular exceptions that were not analogous in some of the COVID church cases. Um, that was the tool they had to work with, and they and they made it work. They could they could keep up that process until. Uh, the unprotective rule of Smith doesn't mean much of anything anymore. Um, the cost of that is that it, it it leaves arguments for government lawyers to make. It vastly complicates every case. Uh, they don't have standards about what's analogous and what isn't, or they do, but it's not very clear. Um, and so it would be much better if they just flat overruled. And um, you know, for years, lawyers going up there chose to argue within Smith rather than to ask for overruling. Um, I think now there are enough uh, tea leaves towards overruling, and and these upcoming cases have so few exceptions, maybe no exceptions at all, really, that are analogous. Um, you know, the the pressure to actually overrule is going to get uh, a lot greater, and the argument will be more fully developed, and more squarely presented. But how they will react, I, I don't have a clear prediction. Thank you. Uh, for Brad, when I was doing media on Americans for Prosperity Foundation. Uh, uh, mostly what I got was sky is falling campaign finance questions, as I'm sure you probably did too. Um, now, that being said, there are some language in the opinion, such as the, the now this says has teeth, uh, that says that we might be able to challenge some more literal political, quote unquote, political campaign under the standard. Do you think some of those could be fruitful? I, I don't think that uh, uh, Bonta really gets at campaign finance things. This was raised, this, this was the great boogeyman. And it's interesting to note that even while the state of California was arguing in court that it had no intention of making any of this information public, it was arguing to the IRS that they needed to keep Schedule B because uh, it was valuable in fighting dark money. Well, the only way you can fight dark money, which is, by the way, perfectly legal to spend, and, and therefore there's no need for a criminal investigation or anything, the only way you can fight dark money is by making the information public. So <laughs> it's interesting that you had that little dichotomy there. But the court has traditionally upheld campaign finance laws on two grounds that were not here uh, in this case. One is that it helps voters to spot potential corruption. They see you got a large contribution from somebody and then you changed your vote or something like that. Uh, and the other is what the court has called an informational interest. Uh, and again, if the state is promising not to reveal the information anyway, then there's not really an informational interest at stake. I think that, um, by the way, this informational interest has been largely misunderstood. It is not a broad uh, right of voters to know. It's not so voters can hold people accountable for what they've done. As stated in Buckley v. Vallejo, it was very, very clearly an interest in helping voters to determine how a person would act in office. That is, if a person was getting campaign finance support from, say, the National Rifle Association, then they probably really were pro-gun. Uh, if they were getting support from Planned Parenthood's PAC or whatever, then they probably really were pro-choice. It wasn't this kind of broad, who cares. So there might be some like disclosure thresholds in campaign finance that are very low. Some states have $10, $20 uh, thresholds for disclosing. Might be an argument that this is really not necessary to the state's compelling interest is not, uh, or to the state's substantial interest, I should say, is not uh, uh, 
uh, narrowly tailored. But I think the core of campaign finance law, that is disclosure of large contributions to political campaigns and parties, is, is pretty safe for the time being. And one more for Tommy. Now, it seems to me that everything got, in the last, since the advent of social media, things are getting much stranger when it comes to off-campus versus on-campus speech. And due to the multi-factor balancing test, I, it seems to me that the next case will come very quickly, like to the court. Uh, would you agree? Like that, because it, we, we haven't resolved much, and who knows what even the next, you know, TikTok, Snapchat, Instagram, whatever comes next, it's going to integrate the off-campus and on-campus in a way that we need to lie. Sure, and I mean, uh, it's also ironic that this case was decided in an era when so many public school students were doing online speech, or online school, yeah. so literally there was no in-person thing. Or no and schoolhouse e gates. Or and, and even as many of the briefers noted, like off-campus, on-campus is, a, is a, a generalized and not really ideal way to describe this distinction. I like to think of it more as like in the school context versus not in the school context, because really the point of Tinker was are other students a captive audience to you? Like the like the the you know the quintessential example of a tinker violation is standing up in the middle of algebra class and giving a political diatribe, and so the court you can't do that, right? But the on campus off campus I think is too is too generalized because say a student has their phone under their desk in math class and they post something to Snapchat. I don't really think that should qualify as on campus because the other students around him or her aren't forced to read that during algebra class. It's not the same thing as yelling out with a bullhorn or something like that. And so yes, I agree. I think the Supreme Court is unlikely to take another case. They've basically told lower courts, look, don't make a categorical rule like the Third Circuit did, work this out case by case. But in fact, we just filed a, an amicus brief, um, Cato and uh, Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, in a Tenth Circuit case um, on a similar, a similar issue, also about Snapchat. And so again, and, and this was uh, one where someone made a stupid, stupid uh, joke, uh, Holocaust joke, and apologized to the local Jewish community and was very penitent, but nonetheless um, was expelled. And so again, there, um, question, uh, courts are going to have to draw the line of like, how offensive does something have to be? And does it matter if students, like, through their parents or through outside the school realm, can be sufficiently disciplined without the school needing to step in? Should I mention that I once got punished in high school for wearing a shirt with profanity on it, and I strongly considered making a federal case of it, but I did not. Um, okay, over here, uh, we're gonna open up here. Sam, you, uh, can you queue up the next one? You just keep on, or actually, I'll go to you first, yeah, from the, from the internets. Uh, we do not yet have any internets questions. We don't have any internets questions. Okay, not well, any internets that are people, hashtag Cato Scotus, ask us questions. Not from any the that are uh, discernible. <laughs> <laughs> from the tubes, send them forth. Uh, over here, thank you, Nicole. <clears throat> Snap your grams, send them forth. Can we get questions on Snapchat? Is that a thing? I don't, know. I don't think Snapchat, so. I, is this Snapchat totally passe? Can we write questions for ourselves? <laughs> Uh, yeah, we, that too, yeah. We'll, we'll open that up for you. Kids, ask for your parents' Twitter account. Yes, sir. Um, I think, I, I can't tell. Try again. Um, I think, can you, try, you try it again, Nicole? Just check it. Well, I, how, how far, how close do you have to hold There you go. There you go. Okay. Yeah. Hey, uh, Pat's fan retired, government guy. I was wondering, what is the status of, I think it was called the Johnson Amendment from the mid-50s, where supposedly... Uh, Church, he was trying to protect, uh, LBJ was trying to protect himself from uh, uh, reverends and priests, um, that a church would, could lose their um, tax, uh, tax exempt status if they did political speech. Does that still exist? And I've always been a little surprised that you never hear about it being enforced or challenged, but I know it exists. Uh, it, it, it still exists, um, is rarely enforced. Um, if a church spends a big chunk of money and buys uh, full-page ads endorsing a candidate, it will be enforced against them. That's happened once in a reported case. Um, but if the church simply, um, in the course, ordinary course of activities of the minister endorses a candidate from the pulpit, or if uh, you know, the church lay group uh, organizes a, uh, a get-out-the-vote drive with a bias in favor of one party or the other, uh, the IRS doesn't do anything with that. And I think... I think they shouldn't. I think they're afraid to litigate the constitutionality of censoring sermons. 
Um, in 2004, uh, Alliance Defending Freedom uh, organized a bunch of evangelical ministers to endorse candidates from the pulpit, videotape themselves doing it, and send the tapes to the IRS. They were trying to revoke a test case. The IRS didn't bite. Um, and that was kind of the end of enforcing the Johnson Amendment. Uh, the Republicans in Congress tried to repeal it a couple years ago. That didn't go anywhere either. Uh, but you know, it, it, it's not quite a dead letter, but very close. That's almost better than the civil disobedience in Cohen v. California. Um, I have over here on that side, Nick. David Sobelson, uh, Press Associates. I'd like to ask uh, Professor Smith if Schedule B is constitutional. <laughs> uh, well, the, the court in uh, Bonta specifically makes a line that uh, talking about tax matters and so the the argument Schedule B, by the way, by the IRS's own uh, rulemaking on a late in the Trump administration, that the IRS did away with Schedule B filings for all but C three organizations. And the argument one can make for C3 organizations, at least, is that, well, the donor is getting a tax deduction, so we need to see the information from the recipient to see if they match up when this donor is claiming this deduction. Is the recipient actually saying he got it, or is the donor maybe uh, 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 lying to us? But um, and, and the courts have traditionally been very reluctant to interfere in tax collection matters, as I think has been raised on this panel. But... I do think that there, there's some doubt about it. Again, they've got to show that it's narrowly tailored, that it's really fitting into some government uh, uh, interest, uh, and, and it would be examined under this uh, tougher standard. And of course, again, the uh, people being forced to disclose it uh, no longer have to uh, suggest that, well, uh, it's, it's only being given to the government uh, because as the court noted in, in Bonta, that can be enough. So I, I I, I would be hesitant to say Schedule B is clearly unconstitutional, but I, I do think there is a, a pretty strong argument that can be made that, that the government's going to have to show that it really needs the information, and whether it can, I think, is is somewhat doubtful. That was a big question. That case that we all knew some justice was going to ask, so it was definitely something that was prepared for. Asked that, and we addressed it in our brief too, and we said pretty much that it might be unconstitutional. Who knows? Um, is, Sam. Yes, uh, this would be a question for Tommy. Um, may have been answered, but we have from Anonymous. Um, Mysterious. <laughs> Good job. You listened to Professor Smith. I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll clean it up. Um, so suppose a student makes a joke uh, on Twitter on their phone on school grounds, but it's on their phone, so they're not expressing it to any other student. Um, essentially, does the on-campus grounds... Yeah. Uh, qualification, does that apply to everything said on their phone while they're there during school hours? It's it's an open question. I, th I don't think it should because I think, uh, as I mentioned, I think the test should be are, are your fellow students a captive audience in some place they have to be to uh, under the rules of the school in class and re recess, whatever, on school grounds. And again, if, if you tweet out something on your phone, you're not forcing everyone sitting around you to also be on their phones. Now, you might have a different reason to discipline. If someone's on their phone, they're not paying attention to the algebra test, for, for sure. Um, but uh, it, yeah, I, th I think uh, this, was, this was something I was not convinced by. The uh, lawyer for Mahanoy at oral argument and in the briefs really stressed line drawing problems and said they'd be intractable. I really don't think they're as, they're as difficult um, as Mahanoy argued, especially because it, it wasn't really relevant here, but there's another call, case called Frazier about vulgar speech, and the Supreme Court has pretty explicitly ca cabined that to only on-campus speech. So in other words, if they can draw the, the line for Frazier, I don't think it's any harder to, to draw a line for Tinker. Yeah, right next to Sam, Nicole. Fred Boning from the Daily Ripple, and this is for uh, Mr. Smith. Um, yesterday, I think, uh, Pennsylvania legislators um, subpoena are, are trying to subpoena all the voting records, um, including um, driver's licenses, uh, social security numbers, uh, voter history, all that, to give to a third party uh, vendor to investigate some sort of voter fraud or something. How does that relate to the California case? 
Well, I, I, I'm not sure of the exact nature of what they've subpoenaed. I just saw sort of the headlines on that, and I think that would make a difference in the arguments they claim for needing the information. But again, it, what it would come down to is, you know, does the state have a legitimate need for that information, and is the request narrowly tailored? If their request is we need to do a comprehensive audit of everybody who voted and make sure they say they are who they, you know, we'd have to look at that. Is that is that how how true is that? Do they really need to get that information on, on all voters? I do think the court would look at it also a bit differently in the sense that, and this is a point that Justice Scalia made in the in the case where he was quoted uh, for the part I quoted, uh, where voting in a, in a sense we talk about the right to vote, but in a way it's a power to vote. It's it's an official act. It exercises power over your fellow citizens. And so I think that that also might fit into a, a somewhat different category when we, when we think about uh, uh, whether or not you have to disclose who you are, for example, by presenting an ID uh, to vote or, or things uh, along those lines. So it's a complex issue. I could see people invoking some of the principles of Bonta, but I doubt that Bonta has much controlling uh, influence over that, that scenario. Um, up, up here on the aisle there. Yeah, a little bit closer. I do have a comment on that. I have, I have some I think it's a, sort of the same. It's the same question about Schedule B. I mean, uh, the argument, this, the courts are reluctant to get into tax matters. Uh, obviously, this is being floated as sort of a uh, tax uh, provision. We need to see what you know people's inflows and outflows are to see if they're maybe understating their income. Uh, I think that in the end, the court would uh, have to look at the question of, you know, does the government really need the information as it says it does? How, how serious is the uh, threat to, to individual, uh, uh, well, individual depositors and so on? So again, uh, most of these cases don't give us a clear answer to such, you know, extenuated hypotheticals. I do think the principles here will come in, in – to play as to people's right to privacy, but I don't think it's a dispositive type case. I, th I would handicap any case that challenged what at least a court would essentially just say is a legitimate law enforcement purpose, whatever they say. If it's law enforcement that they're going after, it's going to be very hard to win that case unless it starts attaching to sort of political speech or something like that. Now, of course, in the Smith case, it applied to, you know, they were wanting this, the information from, I mean, in the AFP case, I mean, they wanted information from you know, a food bank. I mean, that was specifically mentioned in the opinion, right? We need to know who the donors to a food bank are. So it implicated all even non-political or ostensibly political nonprofits. Um, I think I saw one in the middle there. Can you make sure that mic is on, Nicole, please? Is it on? Yeah. Tom, uh, Tim Halseal from Delaware. Um, a lot of public schools, in fact, most public schools, if not all, have anti-bullying rules. Uh, that encompass you know, uh, speech that occurs off campus. They don't defer uh, just to the authorities to investigate and reprimand. And that most of those anti-bullying rules are broadly interpreted. Are there any cases in the pipeline dealing with that? I, I don't know of any specific cases. I think generally speaking under Mahanoy, those are likely to survive. But the devil may be in the details, as you said, of how broadly are they are they interpreted? There, um, I, I think the court, the court certainly stressed that political speech or religious speech or speech with some kind of public value 
um, shouldn't you know shouldn't be like uh, lightly curtailed. And Justice Alito actually had some good kind of tough hypotheticals at oral argument of mixes between the two. Someone saying like, you know, the war the war in Afghanistan is is awful, and we're imperialists. And and Joe's brother is one of those of those soldiers who's killing people on our behalf. So there's a mix of a political message, but also an insult at, at someone in the in the school. And and those are the tough tough cases that that schools are likely to deal with. But I think, um, you know, reading reading both the majority opinion and Justice Alito's concurrence, lower courts are hopefully going to be pretty deferential to speech with a with a political valence to it unless it's like clearly just a fig leaf to try to get away with bullying and, and not not sincere in that way. Um, and, I, and I think also any sort of speech where the notion is like it creates a, a hostile environment, but it's not particularly directed at another s student. Again, that's that's pushing the line where it's arguably just generalized comments, not not one of those narrow exceptions like bullying that that the Justice Breyer's opinion said would justify it. I have a question for Professor Laycock. Um, I remember when I read Smith in law school, and it seemed eminently sensible to me, and I think it did to Scalia when he wrote it, too. Um, I mean, you kind of mentioned it in your in remarks, but what, I mean, what, what really is wrong with that decision? Like, it, it, I mean, it's just a matter of misinterpreting the free exercise clause as a matter of originalism, or is there something more to it? Well, there, there's, there's no originalism in the opinion. There's almost no text in the opinion. He says, you know, O'Connor's separate opinion says, look, it says you can't prohibit the free exercise of religion. Scalia agrees this was an exercise of religion. They prohibited it. What part do you not understand? Um, and he says, well, the text doesn't have to be interpreted that way. That's the entire textual argument. Um, and so, you know, every colony, including the most intolerant, like Massachusetts and Connecticut, once they came around to the idea of free exercise and said, uh, okay, Quakers can live here now, we're not gonna hang you for being a Quaker any longer. Um, shortly thereafter came to the idea of religious exemptions. They did it legislatively, they didn't have judicial review yet. But they exempted um, the Amish from swearing oaths and from serving in the militia. They exempted all the dissenting churches from paying the church tax until they finally repealed the church tax. Um, they exempted in a couple of colonies uh, Quakers from removing their hats in court. That was a famous incident with William Penn. Um, in Rhode Island exempted the Jewish community from the Christian incest laws and let them apply the Jewish rules instead um, because it didn't achieve the purpose of allowing free exercise. Right? If we, we won't kick you out for being Quaker anymore, but we'll kick you out for refusing to swear an oath, or we won't let you vote because you refuse to swear an oath. Um, Religiously motivated practices are an essential, integral part of the exercise of religion. And if you don't protect those, you haven't protected the exercise of religion. And you force people to suffer for conscience or they leave the state. A lot of people moved out of intolerant colonies in the colonial period. Um, you create more social conflict um, over religion. People aren't willing to surrender their religious practices just because the state says you have to. Um, so the, the Smith opinion, wildly underprotected uh, free speech, uh, free exercise. And we have similar exemptions in the free speech context. The, the anonymous speech cases started out with, if you are especially vulnerable, if you're the Socialist Workers Party, if you're the NAACP in Alabama in 1958, you get exemptions that other people don't get. There's nothing particularly novel about this. These are just as applied challenges under the free exercise clause. Thank you, Sam. From online audience. Yes, uh, Tommy, uh, you're apparently very popular. Uh, this is uh, also from Anonymous um, and cleaned up. Uh, what is your impression of the uh, current court's likelihood of ruling on, uh, say, an issue where uh, a school is monitoring uh, student social media accounts, like not just being on, tw not just following them on Twitter, but if they're blocked, uh, you know, requesting those the records of, of their posts from Twitter or requesting their Google searches, um, do you think it would be any different than how the current court views uh, uh, the government, you know, the federal government doing that? I, yeah, I think pre, sort of preemptive monitoring without a specific reason, just sort of scanning for anything objectionable. Um, what I, I think courts would look uh, very skeptically at that, be uh, again, because the Supreme Court sort of tried to narrowly describe the type of justifications 
Um, and we still have to remember the tinker, like on top of these other justifications, you still have the baseline tinker requirement of a substantial disruption. So it seems like a school sort of monitoring something in advance, it's almost like they're looking for trouble or they're looking for something that they, that they are hoping they can say, oh, this will cause a substantial disruption, rather than actually waiting to see if the substantial disruption happens. And this, this was, these issues of surveillance and reporting were very much on uh, a lot of the amicus's, Amici's mind, including our brief, that basically you don't want to create a culture that arguably happened in this case. Like, how did the snap get to the cheer coach? It was apparently like a chain of screenshots and taking pictures of one phone screen with another phone screen. And, you know, there, there's an undercurrent of, like, other, other classmates kind of threw Brandy under the bus, and it didn't really, wouldn't have been an issue if they hadn't done that. And you don't necessarily want to <clears throat> incentivize students to go looking for offensive things people have said on their personal time and get them punished at school. So I would hope that, that, that courts will consider that when they're looking at these cases of, did this cause a disruption organically or was this kind of manufactured? Is there another one, Sam, or? No. Um, I have a question for Brad, because I have moot the case and did a lot of things, but one of my favorite things about America's for Prosperity case, having worked on so many constitutional issues, it, almost everything is on summary judgment, unless it's a criminal defense or something. So when you're doing a gun case or campaign finance cases, it's just a lot of supposition about what might be true. Um, like in McCutcheon, we had this long discussion of how are people passing money through various things, and no discussion of does this actually happen. So what was the significance in this case that there was a trial? Well, I mean, it was very significant. In fact, uh, the first challenge uh, to this policy implemented by then Attorney General Harris was filed by my organization, the Institute for Free Speech, uh, then known as the Center for Competitive Politics. Uh, and uh, our, we had a cert petition pending at the Supreme Court that they did not hear. They waited until this case was decided. Then they granted our cert petition and immediately sent it back to the Ninth Court to follow Bonta and, and decide this. But the difference was that we didn't have a trial. Ours was on, on motion. And the trial did allow them to develop the record. And while in the end, the court's holding is quite broad. In fact, they say the statute's facially invalid. It's not just for these people. I have to think that the record was very influential. The fact that California did uh, let thousands of these forms out into the public realm. The fact that at trial, California's own witnesses said, oh, no, you know, we never really used that information to do audits, uh, has to influence just the general atmosphere at the court and, and the tone at the court. And I think that, by the way, one thing that that's, comes out of the case is that even that while you no longer have to show, for example, a history of specific retaliation, which the plaintiffs did here, and you don't have to show... Uh, uh, that the state's going to let it out into the to the public. Uh, I think that if you, if a, a court were to uphold another statute as being properly narrowly tailored, then a group could still, as Professor Laycock kind of suggests, ask for an as applied exception on the basis of presenting evidence of harassment and on the basis of presenting evidence perhaps that the state wasn't very good at keeping information private. <clears throat> Yeah, the Pyrrhic victory in that case could have been that the only people who get donor privacy or, or organizations are those that literally demonstrate threats, uh, which was which was a con big concern. Am I seeing anyone? I have a question for, uh, Lake, for Professor Lakehawk, and I think that that would probably uh, uh, in the panel. Um, how surprised were you that it was nine zero? Or and do you have like does that give you hope and or is, was it kind of a Roberts getting people together thing? It's Roberts getting people together. I, I was not astonished. I was surprised. Um, you know the and particularly Justice Kagan is not hostile to free exercise, and and I don't really think Justice Sotomayor is either. Although that's a little less clear. Um, there have been a number of unanimous decisions over the past 20 years protecting free exercise. The, the Muslim beard in prison was unanimous. The ministerial exception, minister can't sue her church for employment discrimination, was unanimous. Um, this little group in New Mexico used an hallucinogenic drug in their worship service under RIFRA was unanimous. Um, so it's not that the liberals are opposed to free exercise. It is that they have other values they care about more. Um, and to some extent, the Republicans do too, the conservatives do too, it's just a different list, right? <laughs> so um, so the liberals all dissented in the contraception cases. 
they have dissented in most of the gay rights cases, but not all. Um, you know, Hurley, the case about a gay rights group in a in in the awesome. St. Patrick's Day parade was unanimous. Um, and and but the but in the gay rights cases, I expected to get uh, dissent from uh, Kagan, Sotomayor, and, and Breyer. And we didn't, I think, principally because Roberts wrote it so narrowly uh, that you know, these facts will never arise again. Um, and Philadelphia can obviously fix it on the remand. They can draft something that is unambiguously exception-free, and then they will tee up the issue of whether to overrule Smith. Um, but there are some much broader things in the opinion that they didn't object to, right? including this isn't a compelling interest. They're not imposing their beliefs on anybody else. Uh, it doesn't matter that it's contracting. So yeah, I was surprised at the, at the unanimity. Thank you. So if there's no more questions, I am also out of questions. Uh, unless any of the panels have a question. No? OK. Well, join me in thanking our panel. <clears throat> And lunch, lunch will be held, as I said, up the spiral staircase to your right, and bathrooms are on the way to the conference center for lunch. So, <clears throat> thank you. For, oops.
All right, ready? All right, everyone, welcome back from lunch. We're gonna keep this conference running like the well-oiled machine that it is and start right back up at one. My name is Thomas Berry. I'm a research fellow here in Cato's Levy Center for Constitutional Studies. And this was my first year as managing editor of the re review, where I had a front row seat to just how insanely hard Trevor has to work to make this happen, and how insanely cooperative and timely and patient our authors have to be to make this happen. So my thanks to Trevor, to all of our authors, and everyone Trevor named and thanked in the first panel. Uh, every year at Constitution Day, there's one panel that seemingly doesn't have as coherent a theme as the others. Sometimes we even call it the potpourri category as if we're on Jeopardy. Although even with our four panels today, we still won't have nearly as many hosts as Jeopardy has had this year. And you might think that this is the potpourri panel with the odd combination of a tech case, a criminal law case, and a takings case. But I would beg to differ. In fact, not only are these three all cases all connected by being about property rights, broadly defined, they're also all three about the scope of reasonable incursions on others' property. How many lines of someone else's programming code can be copied without paying them? And does it matter what that code does? Under what circumstances can the police or other government actors enter your property without permission because they suspect a medical or other non-criminal emergency? And can a government regulation allow lengthy, uncompensated entrances onto your property by people you'd otherwise prefer to keep out for some supposedly public benefit? In other words, all three cases that are gonna be discussed on this panel ask when others can permissibly cross our property lines without permission, in both the literal sense of a line, such as a home's entryway or a private field's boundary, and in the digital sense of a line of code. Here to discuss these three cases, we have three distinguished scholars, one of them from the home team here at Cato. I'll introduce them one at a time before each of them speaks. As always, we abbreviate the intros here so we have more time to hear from the panelists themselves and because you can read their full bios in the review, which you all have. And I'd like to remind our online audience to submit questions on our event webpage at Cato's website or on Twitter using the hashtag Cato SCOTUS, Cato S-C-O-T-U-S. First is Adam Mossoff. 
He is a professor at the Antonin Scalia Law School, George Mason University. Adam also serves on the board of directors of the Center for Intellectual Property Understanding and is a senior fellow and chair for intellectual property at the Hudson Institute. He previously served as a Heritage Foundation fellow. Adam will be speaking about Google versus Oracle. Adam? Thank you, Tommy. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, to see everyone, although uh, although still masked, but uh, but uh, but at least we're seeing each other. It's a step in, in at least in the right direction, um, and. Um, uh, and I appreciate that you uh, uh, didn't go into all these details. As I was telling Tommy, you know, it, it, academics collect titles, and so it ends up being a lot like the Game of Thrones, where you're like professor of law and 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 visiting fellow and a killer of dragons and and all sorts of things. Um, and um, and I also am not using PowerPoint. Um, as a as a committed classical liberal, um, I am a I am a long standing believer in Lord Acton's lesser known dictum that if power corrupts, PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. So uh, so <clears throat> you'll have to just listen. So um, <laughs> so I'm speaking today, of course, about uh, about the case Google versus Oracle. Um, <clears throat> and what's uh, very interesting about this case um, is that. It represents a, uh, a significant point about the protection of, of, of computer software programs in our innovation economy and in the high tech sector more specifically. But it also represents something a little more interesting that I discovered in, when the case came down, which is that the past 50 years has represented the personal computer and software revolution in our society starting in the 1970s. It was in the 70s that the Apple, the Apple uh, II comes, first comes out and when you have the development of personal computing uh, capabilities and operating systems that run on general purpose computers. And in 1970, then professor of law at Harvard Law School, Stephen Breyer writes in a very famous article called The Uneasy Case for Copyright where he largely concedes that he doesn't think there is one, but there might be in some minor small cases that, quote, computer programs should not receive copyright protection at the present time, end quote. Um, writing almost 50 years later now in 2001 in Google v. Oracle, uh, now Justice Breyer concludes that Google is not liable for copyright infringement for copying 11,500 lines of code from Oracle's Java program. Now this was a blockbuster case. Um, and not just because of this nice little bookend of the past 50 years by Justice Breyer. Um, <clears throat> it, was, it represented a clash of titans in the high tech sector, Google versus Oracle. Um, it represented the first time ever that the Supreme Court promised to answer uh, the question of the copyrightability of, of computer software code. And it, re it reflected the first time in several decades that the Supreme Court was addressing the issue of fair use doctrine and copyright. Um, and it was the very first time that the Supreme Court was applying the doctrine of fair use to the copying of a computer software program. It was, the decision was 6-2 with Justice Breyer writing the opinion. Um, <clears throat> Justice Thomas and Alito, Justice Thomas dissented, who was joined by Justice Alito. And the reason why it's 6-2 is because Justice Barrett didn't participate in the, in the opinion because she had not been yet confirmed by the Senate at the time the oral argument was held in November. Now, this opinion is really radical, and I can't go into all the aspects of it. So I'm just going to touch on some of the basic details of it in my opening remarks, and hopefully we can get into some of the, some of the issues, um, both in the tech space and in the copyright and innovation policy space um, in, in the question and answer period. But the opinion is really radical and novel in both its substance and form, um, and just in its decision. Because this is the very first time that the US Supreme Court has held that an explicit copying by a commercial actor for a commercial purpose to create what ends up being a competing product in the marketplace is not copyright infringement because it is in fact counts as fair use. That, that is a radical decision. Um, and, uh, and Justice Thomas in his dissent repeatedly points out this point and how radical it is. Now to fully understand that, I 
need to, of course, I think I want to give you the background of the case, a little bit of the tech background. It's really easy for people like me who are tech geeks, but, um, but I, I recognize that not everyone lives in the world of code um, and, and understands APIs and th throws around acronyms like this. Um, I guess that's how people often feel when non-lawyers are talking to lawyers. Um, so, um, so first I'll give the background, both the tech uh, uh, background, the commercial background between Oracle um, and what, uh, between Google and what was then uh, Sun Microsystems before it got purchased by Oracle. And then I'll talk about the case um, and discuss some of the implications of it before I sit down. All right. So the background. So this case involved, um, as I mentioned, Google's copying of 11,500 lines of code from a program known as Java. Now, most of you probably know Java. Um, you've, you've seen the little coffee cup icon some, at some point or other in your computer screen or, or, or in a, some other uh, mobile device. Java is a program that effectively enables the, uh, your, the various programs that you have on your smartphones and in your la laptop computers and on your desktop computers to communicate with other programs. So it's not a program that you directly use as what we in tech geeks uh, speak call an end user. You are just end users. You're not people. You're end users. You don't experience the, 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 the Java program. You, uh, you use Word. You use your email client. You use Excel. You use your browser. But how your browser and how Word and how your email client communicate with your operating system, with the server, so when you send your email and it goes to your main server and how that server then communicates with the internet uh, uh, backbone and the server is running the internet and then they communicate with the server, computer server receiving the email on the other end and so on and so on are done through programs that are, go, uh, that are referred to as application program interfaces. So these are programs that are under the hood, so to speak, uh, to use a car metaphor, uh, in your computer that you don't directly experience, but these are the programs that allow your different computer programs to interact with each other flawlessly so you can send your email, check your te send a text, check uh, surf the web, and do other things that my students unfortunately do during class. So, uh, so, um, <clears throat> so, the, um, so these programs go by the acronym APIs. Um, so, um, and, and, they, and Java is a very successful API. So, it was, so we are now going to go back to ancient history, um, and the year is 1995. So if, this was, if you're watching this on a streaming show, you would, the, ca the camera would fade out, and you would see 1995 again, and Friends would be on, and, uh, <laughs> and Seinfeld, and uh, we'd, you know, we'd be listening to grunge rock. Um, and 1995, Sun Microsystems comes up with Java. Now, Java is a really radical API because Java is capable of running on any machines. So all you have to do is, you, as a computer developer, you're writing a program or a computer manufacturer creating a laptop, is put what's called a Java virtual machine, which is a program that we're uh, on on your on the computer device and any other device, regardless of whether it's an Apple device, whether it's an Android, whether it's a, uh, whether it's Windows, whether it's anything, can run the program that you're running on it. So how you can send an email from your you know, Windows system to an Apple system, and so on and so on. And uh, this is a small example of an API. So in fact, uh, Sun, uh, Sun Microsystems' uh, uh, motto was, write once, run anywhere. And so the key to it, that, as you see, is interoperability, which is what drove the internet, the explosion of the internet. And this is why Java became so successful and massive successful program. And therefore, Sun Microsystems, which was later purchased by Oracle in 2009, um, which is why it's Google v. Or uh, ends up being o uh, Google v. Oracle at the Supreme Court, um, <clears throat> this becomes extremely successful. And they make tens of billions of dollars licensing this program to other com uh, computer uh, program uh, ma uh, creators and manu uh, computer manufacturers. So, um, <clears throat> The, the, so this is an incredibly successful program. And Google is coming up now with its Android uh, phone system. And it wants to use that phone system. And it, or it wants its phone system to be successful. So it enters into licensing negotiations with, with I'm just going to start referring to it as Oracle, because Oracle purchased on microsystems with Oracle. These negotiations fail, because while Google wants Android to be open source, it doesn't want it to be interoperable. So in fact, while Android is open source, in fact, it's proprietary open source. You can't run something on Android on anything. 
Um, and this is because Google makes money by collecting data on its users and, <clears throat> and then selling that data and acquiring other information. That's their business model. That's why they're willing to, quote, give away their Android systems for free. Um, but Oracle made money by licensing its programs. And in fact, it had three pro licensing programs. Two were paid, and one was actually open source. But it was true open source. It was GPL, uh, so it required interoperability. Google wanted open source, but not interoperability. And so, of course, the licensing negotiations broke down. And so Google did what Google sometimes does. It just, it just took the program to make their computer, uh, to make their Android phone successful, immediately usable by programmers, and the rest is history. The Android is the largest selling phone in the world, incredibly successful, and Google has made tens and tens of billions of dollars off of it. All right, so <clears throat> Oracle sues. Understandably, you, you directly copied our program. And the case raised two issues. Is the program copyrightable in the first place? And secondly, even if it is, was Google's use of it fair use? And, and then the, third, and the court added a third issue on its own about the standard of review. And that ended up being the proverbial dog that, didn't, that doesn't bark uh, um, because it didn't really play a role in the case. And so I'm not going to uh, talk about that. All right, so the copyrightability issue. So this is what actually most of the oral argument was spent on, um, and, um, and a lot of the briefing was spent on. And it's really surprising because in the opinion, Breyer skips over the copyrightability. In one sentence, they say, we shall assume for the sake of argument that the, that the Java API program and the declaring code within it that was copied by, by Google is copyrightable. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And, um, and as I mentioned, this was really strange because it took up a substantial portion of the oral argument. I um, mean, in fact, at one point, Justice Kagan says, I'm surprised and confused by the nature of Google's arguments about the copyrightability of, the, of this code. Gorsuch agreed with her. And if you're a lawyer appearing before the US Supreme Court, and you've got both Kagan on one side and Gorsuch on the other, both saying, we agree with each other that your argument is surprising and confusing, you're not in a good spot to be in. And the reason why they were surprised and confused is because there was a long-standing debate about whether, the, about whether computer software should be copyrightable, copyrightable or not, going back to the 1960s. And Congress stepped in in 1980 and said, we're resolving this, 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 uh, this dispute definitively. And they passed a law. And just to be very clear, they didn't come up with some fancy acronym for this law, you know, like the Patriot Act or something like that. They called this law the Computer Software Copyright Act of 1980. And it's explicit and clear. It says, quote, a computer program is a set of statements or instructions to be used directly or indirectly in a computer in order to bring about a certain result, end quote. And it says, and that computer program is copyrightable. And notice, it's expansive. It includes any computer program, directly or indirectly. It doesn't make distinctions between types of computer programs, whether you're Word or an API. It says all computer programs are copyrightable. Now, Google was arguing, well, but this, co this program is functional in nature, and it's the only, you know, it's, it's not really just an expression. It's how the computer works. And that's not what copyright is about. That's what you get patent laws about and things of this sort. Um, this is called the method of operation argument or merger idea that the idea that that the expression is so intimately connected with the nature of a function of doing something that you can't separate the two, and then therefore the expression isn't copyrightable as expression because you're actually getting copyright protection for this broader purpose, this abstract idea that you can't do it. But <clears throat> but the Statutory text is explicit. So Justice Breyer is basically doing what you expect Justice Breyer to do in, uh, in, um, <clears throat> that, and that we've seen him do in economic liberty cases and in, uh, and, 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 other, and, and in other areas where he has his policy preferences that he made very clear in 1970, and he's going to, to get, uh, uh, implement those policy preferences, although he can't do it through the statute, so he skips over the statute. But he makes it very clear that, well, this is just for the sake of argument. And yet later he says, if it's copyrightable at all, in fact, then fair use doctrine applies. Um, and Justice Thomas, rightly in his dissent, calls him out on this and says, hey, if you had actually addressed the, the copyrightability issue front and center, you would have realized that this can't be fair use. Um, now, how do we, what happened with the fair use analysis? Um, so the fair use analysis, Justice Breyer emphasizes emphatically that, well, this is, this is an equitable doctrine, and so we can, we can address it in a very open uh, and different way. For those who don't know fair use, fair use is, 
the a doctrine that goes back to 1841, Case Folsom v. Marsh, and, uh, Justice Story, where Justice Story said, yes, copyright is private property that's protected against piracy. He actually used that term. But sometimes there are exceptions um, when you don't have an interference with the market of the copyrighted work. This was eventually codified in 1976 by Congress in Section 107 with four factors. Um, that are applied by courts. They're, they look at the purpose and character of the uh, use, including whether it's commercial. They look at the nature of the copyrighted work. They look at the amount and substantiality of, of its use and the effect on the market or the value of the work. So you can see that largely the, the focus here is on whether you're interfering with the market use or market value of the work. In fact, this explains why the key concept in fair use doctrine is this idea of is the use transformative? In that sense, is are they taking it out of the relevant market context and the relevant commercial uses by the copyright owner and using it in some other way? A classic example is you use a movie or a story like Friends or Seinfeld for comedic purposes or parody yourself. Um, so you're as as a, as, a, as another type of parody, you're not actually interfering with the direct use of that of that of that product. So. <clears throat> So Breyer says, well, I'm going to exploit the equitable nature of, of this doctrine um, and start with factor two, which courts almost never do. Factor two is the nature of the, of, the, of the copyrighted work. And he says, well, this is code. This is functional. This is a user interface. And therefore, it gets thin copyright protection. Well, if you're sensing a sense of deja vu about this is functional, this is a user interface, if that was Google's argument against under the copyrightability issue, you're not mistaken. That is. So you can see that he's smuggling into fair use these issues that had to have been addressed under the copyrightability assessment that were clearly precluded by the statutory text of the Copyright Act. Um, and, in, and then he downplays. He says, well, coding is, is, is straightforward. It's just mechanical. He compares it to uh, cooking recipes, the QWERTY keyboard, a gas pedal, these are all of his metaphors in the opinion, um, even a programmable cooking robot. Um, but those of us who are tech geeks were, should be a little surprised by that because we know, in fact, coding can be very creative and often is creative. Um, and in fact, yep. Um, and in fact, um, you know, we aspire for the elegant solution. I'm now out of time, so I will, um, I'll just note at, in, conclude, in conclusion that um, that, uh, that he engages in a very expansive notion of what counts as transformative, that, well, if you're applying it to a new use, then that counts as transformative, but new uses can, can, are covered by the Copyright Act. If you take a Harry Potter book and put it into a space context, you will be sued by J.K. Rowling for the use of Harry Potter, even though you put it into a space context. And therefore, what's really going on here at the end of the day is that Google wanted a successful Android phone. It wanted to launch it immediately. It wanted the value of Java. It, want, it had a business model that was not compatible with the business model that Java would have required it to implement. And therefore, it took Java and put it into this new business model. And it was succeeded. And the Supreme Court, through Justice Breyer, let them get away with it. So thank you. All right, great. Thank you, Adam. Uh, next up, we our next speaker is Christopher Slobogan, who is the Milton R. Underwood Chair in Law and Director of the Criminal Justice Program at Vanderbilt Law School and Affiliate Professor of Psychiatry at Vanderbilt School of Medicine. Uh, he is an Associate Reporter at the American Law Institute's Principles of Police Investigation Project. Before joining the faculty at Vanderbilt, he taught at several institutions, including my alma mater, Stanford Law School, and the University of Kiev, Ukraine, where he was a Fulbright Scholar. And he will be speaking on Coniglia versus Strom. Christopher? Well, first of all, I want to say how happy I am to be here in person. It's terrific. And to commemorate this occasion, I wore my Declaration of Independence tie, not only because it's the Cato Institute, but because I feel I'm finally independent from this virus because I can now come into an in-person conference. Now, as Tom said, I'm going to be talking about police invasions of property. Um, like a lot of us, over the last couple of years in particular, I've been thinking about the role the police should play in American society. And it's, it's certainly plausible to argue that we've allowed the police to gobble up too much power in the guise of protecting community safety. So when the Cato Institute asked me to pick a Supreme Court opinion to write about this term, I settled on Coniglia versus Strom, 
which is a Supreme Court case which deals with the so-called community caretaker exception to the warrant requirement to uh, the Fourth Amendment. Um, I thought it'd be a great opportunity to explore in a relatively nuanced way the policing role in the United States, particularly given the First Circuit's opinion in this case, which declared that police are the preeminent community, care community caretakers, caretakers of the community. And it turns out that the subsequent Supreme Court opinion in Coniglia did provide a springboard for talking about the police role in a number of different areas. I'm going to focus on three. Uh, the role of the police in dealing with people who have mental illness, uh, the scope of the so-called emergency aid exception, and the scope of the special needs exception to the warrant requirement. So I'm going to start with talking about police and people with mental illness. So probably a lot of you know a huge proportion of 911 calls to the police involve situations uh, involving people who have uh, mental illness. There's a significant number of 911 calls every day that deal with that kind of situation. Uh, people with mental illness might be suicidal, they might have scared other people, their family might have had, had finally given up taking care of them and called the police for that purpose. Unfortunately, the police are precisely the wrong people to call in many of these situations. Why? Because they're armed and they're trained to use force. And when in doubt, they often use that force and often use those weapons, even when the research shows they've been trained in crisis intervention. So as a result, in the last five years, 25% of the people killed by the police have been mentally ill. And another hammer that the police have is, of course, the authority to arrest. Far too often, people with mental illness end up in jail as opposed to in treatment where they should be. Some of you may have heard of the CAHOOTS program, strangely named program in Eugene, Oregon, and it's demonstrated beyond Cavill that it is possible to handle these kinds of situations without the police at all. Just having mental health professionals there who know how to handle these kinds of situations can often be the way to deal with, uh, with, with people who have mental illness. So how does all this re relate to the Coniglia decision? Well, Edward Coniglia was a severely depressed individual who was contemplating suicide. His wife called the police. Now, why didn't she call the community mental health center? Well, maybe there wasn't one in this area, but most likely it's because you call the police when you got a problem. That's what you do. Um, I don't blame her for calling the police. I think the problem lies with the dispatcher. 911 dispatchers need to know enough to ask the right kinds of questions to determine what the situation is all about, the triage. Ask the right questions, figure out if there's imminent harm, and if not, send in a local caregiver. Well, that's not what happened in the Coniglia case. Instead, the police were sent. Now, fortunately, no violence ensued in this case. Okay? There was no violence, but still, the point remains that in a lot of these cases, a trained mental health professional with no weapons whatsoever is the best kind of person to deal with this kind of situation. Bottom line is police are not always the optimal caretakers. Um, so the second issue my article talks about is what happened after the police took Edward to the hospital. They went back to his house and seized his guns. And since they didn't have a warrant authorizing them to do so, Coniglia claimed his Fourth Amendment rights were violated. Um, now the state argued in response that, hey, this is just a community caretaker exception. And they got that phrase from a 1973 Supreme Court case, Katie versus Dombrowski, which stated that, uh, involving a car search, where the court stated that police, quote, frequently investigate vehicle accidents in which there is no claim of criminal liability and engage in what, for want of a better term, may be described as community caretaking functions, totally divorced from the detection, investigation, or acquisition of evidence relating to a violation of a criminal statute. So the police Coniglia, the state was arguing, were not involved in the detection, investigation, or acquisition of criminal evidence, so they didn't need a warrant. And the First Circuit agreed. Uh, the First Circuit stated, quote, a police officer over and above his weighty responsibilities for enforcing the criminal law must provide an infinite variety of services to preserve and protect community safety. And here's the interesting part. The Supreme Court reversed the First Circuit unanimously, which of course is a relatively rare event these days, and in a four-page opinion, which also is relatively rare at the Supreme Court level. Um, and in signing with Coniglia, the court said that a warrantless entry is not permitted unless there's true agency, unless imminent harm is impending. Um, and since Edward was not in the home at the time the police went in to seize the guns, there wasn't this kind of agency. So therefore, the Fourth Amendment was violated. In other words, police responding to the First Circuit said police are not authorized to provide an infinite variety of services to preserve and protect community safety, at least if those services require entry into a home. And Justice Alito, in a concurring opinion, stated flatly, there is no freestanding community caretaker exception to the warrant requirement. And I think most of the justices agree with this. However, there were, were a couple of other concurring opinions, uh, one by Chief Justice Roberts, 
which perhaps wanted to inject a little caveat to this notion that Justice Alito broached in his concurring opinion. And he, he made his concern apparent with the question uh, during oral argument addressed to Coniglia's attorney, where he said, well, what if this happens? Could, could the police do a warrantless entry if they got a call, if they were responding to a call from neighbors of an elderly woman who they had invited to dinner two hours earlier, who had not shown up, who did not respond to calls that had not been seen leaving her house? What did Coniglia's attorney say? No, they could not make a warrantless entry for at least 24 hours. And if they were going to make an entry after that time, they needed a missing person warrant in order to go into the house. Well, you could tell that a lot of the justices weren't very happy with that, ranging from Roberts to our friend Justice Breyer, um, who also joined Roberts' concurring opinion. So I think there certainly are definitions of the what, what courts call the emergency aid exception, which is what Just Chief Justice Roberts' hypothetical deals with, um, that avoid going down the rabbit hole that Coniglia's attorney did. So in my article, I talk about a possible formulation which would require probable cause to believe serious physical injury either has occurred or is likely to occur, and immediate assistance from the police is thereby needed. Now, there are a lot of restrictions in that formulation, but I think actually, despite all those restrictions, it would still produce the result that I think Chief Justice Roberts wanted in his hypothetical. If the police were the only available option, and that's an important part of my formulation, the police have to be the only good available option. If they are, they show up, they check the neighbor's story, uh, it checks out, they knock on the door, and no one responds, then they'd be able to go in under this formulation. But at the same time, um, it does require true exigency. It requires an emergency. Um, and thus it avoids what criminal law scholars and criminal procedure scholars often call pretextual police actions. Why would it avoid those? At least it's my hope it would avoid those, because police normally would have to explain themselves to a magistrate before they went in. So it would deter, for instance, police claiming, oh, we heard a loud noise, or there was a door that was ajar, or we knocked on the door and no one came to it immediately as a ruse. It would prevent them from using those kinds of statements as a ruse to get into a house without a warrant. And by the way, if you look at lower ca court cases, there are all sorts of cases like this. Some of them involving people who turned out to be criminals, some of them being 1983 suits asking for damage from the police because they barged into a home pretextually. Um, and the formulation that I just advanced is meant to try to avoid that. Uh, but of course, there's another solution to all of this as well, uh, going back to what I said earlier, and that is to avoid police involvement entirely. I mean, think about Chief Justice Roberts' hypothetical again. Why send in a cop at all? Why shouldn't it be a social worker who responds to this situation? There's no need for armed force in this kind of situation with all the potential chaos that might create. And so that segues to my third and final point, um, which deals with how courts might approach the many searches and seizures which the courts have dubbed special needs situations, which often occur outside the home as opposed to inside the home. Um, this first Supreme Court opinion using the special needs phrase was New Jersey versus TLO, which involved a search of a school child's purse for cigarettes without a warrant and a less than probable cause. And in upholding that search, uh, the court stated, well, actually, this is Justice Blackmun's concurring opinion, the state of this, but it's been language now that's been picked up by other Supreme Court cases. That school searches involve, quote, exceptional circumstances in which special needs beyond the normal need for law enforcement make the warrant and probable cause requirements impractical. You can see how this resonates with the community caretaking exception, right? In both those situations where we're not dealing with criminal law enforcement, at least allegedly. This special needs kind of language, the, the court later applied to an entirely different set of cases involving searches and seizures of groups in the complete absence of suspicion. Here I'm talking about, for instance, uh, home safety inspections or illegal immigrant checkpoints, or license checkpoints, or drug programs, programmatic kinds of searches and seizures. The court has also just used special needs lingo to justify those kinds of situations because, the court says, they don't involve ordinary crime control. They're outside of the usual criminal investigation setting, at least according to the court. Now, the court's special needs jurisprudence has been criticized by lots of people, including me, but the point I want to make here is a little bit more circumscribed. It is whatever the Fourth Amendment should say with respect to situations where it's school officials or inspectors who are engaging in a search and seizure. When it's the police who are involved in these kinds of special needs situations, then we are most likely to be concerned about misuse of force and pretextual actions. And thus, in those situations, at least, the Fourth Amendment's constraints ought to apply with full force. So what does that mean with respect to the two variants of special needs, searches and seizures that I've been talking about? Well. Um, the constraints are clear 
with respect to the first variant, that is focused on a particular individual, like in the TLO case, there the usual warrant and probable cause and exigency requirements ought to apply. So for instance, um, if a school resource officer is in fact a cop in disguise with a weapon and with the ability to invest, with training and investigating criminal situations, then I think that kind of search, even for a school disciplinary infraction, as occurred in TLO, ought to be based on a warrant or something like it in the absence of exigency. Um, in the second special needs variant, which involves, remember, search and seizures of groups, like inspections uh, and checkpoints and so on, an individualized suspicion requirement doesn't work because we're dealing with a suspicionless search and seizure of groups, but there still can be significant regulation of these kinds of situations, especially when the police are involved. I think there has to be, and I think the most effective way of reducing or preventing arbitrary police action is in these kinds of cases is to require statutory authorization of the program, um, even-handed implementation across the entire targeted group, and a ban on pretextual actions. So for instance, uh, police should not be able to set up license checkpoints anytime they want to in any neighborhood they want to with drug sniffing dogs waiting in the wings. Instead, there has to be statutory authorization of providing neutral criteria for when and where checkpoints are, may be set up and seizures have to be based on a predetermined basis. Every individual, every fifth individual, something like that. And drug dogs could not be involved at all unless the statute specifically authorized it. So, in other words, what I'm saying is application of Kedigas versus Strom's rejection of a freestanding caretaker exception to special needs situations would curb police overuse of their administrative authority, uh, especially its use of that authority as a pretext to engage in legislatively unauthorized agendas. Uh, but that's only if the police are needed at all. And this goes back to my original point. The more important question is whether police should be involved in school searches, inspections, checkpoints, and so on in the first place. Because I think, um, and again, this is, this is expanding Coniglia a little bit, but what I think one could certainly argue after Coniglia is that a sustain for the caretaker exception now makes this kind of question, should the police be involved at all, uh, constitutionally pertinent from now on. And most generally, repeating my overall theme, Coniglia's rejection of a freestanding caretaker exception provides doctrinal support for the fledgling movement to de-police those government services that whatever might be their tradition do not require armed individuals trained to fight crime. Thank you. All right, great. Uh, thank you. And finally, we have my own boss, Ilya Shapiro. So pressure's on to get this intro right. Ilya is a vice president and director of the Robert A. Levy Center for Constitutional Studies at the Cato Institute and publisher of the Cato Supreme Court Review. Ilya is also the chairman of the Board of Advisors of the Mississippi Justice Institute and a member of the Virginia Advisory Committee to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. And Ilya will be speaking on Cedar Point Nursery versus Hasid. Ilya? Thanks very much, Tommy. You did a nice job yourself at the, uh, on the first panel. Um, so I guess uh, Tommy described me as being a member of the home team, and I'm also like he was a pinch hitter, um, because Greg Sisk, uh, who with uh, our associate Sam Spiegelman co-authored the, the article on this case, uh, was not able uh, to be here. Um, I actually consider this uh, Cedar Point case to be the most important one of the whole term. Uh, it's not the one that got all the uh, attention or controversy. That would probably be the, the election regulation case you'll hear about in the next panel. Um, it, it, it wasn't one that, um, I don't know, was supposed to be the blockbuster, like a religious liberty case that you heard about in the, in the last panel. But I think in terms of longstanding uh, impact on the direction of the law, uh, as I'll describe, I think it's pretty uh, important. Uh, and I'll agree with my uh, former uh, law school how do you call it, when Adam Mossoff was not my classmate, he was a year ahead of me. And so anyway, my, my former law school attendee, uh, I don't know what the, the term is, Adam. Uh, mentor, sure, I will accept that, I will accept that. That, that PowerPoint is not only, PowerPoint not only corrupts absolutely, but it's unconstitutional, at least as applied in 90% of cases. And so I won't be using that uh, uh, either. Although I was, Adam, disappointed that there, there were not enough Star Wars references or even references to your new motorcycle, which is quite snazzy. I've seen, check it out on Facebook. He has, he has a new 
uh, motorcycle. Uh, and uh, our other panelist, Chris Slobogan, he and I, we didn't arrange this, but he and I have the same tie, his in gold, mine in blue. So lots of uh, residents on this panel. So why is this case so important? Well, it, it, it undertakes um, uh, somewhat of a shift in, in our understanding of property rights and their enforcement. Uh, the California Agricultural Labor Relations Act granted labor groups a right to take access to uh, agricultural property to seek support for unionization. Under this regulation, agricultural employers had to allow union access onto their property for up to three hours a day, 120 days a year, a third of the year. Three hours a day, a third of the year. Chief Justice Roberts, uh, writing for a six to three majority, I hope I'm not, uh, you know, uh, at this point it's not spoiler alert. If you're here, you probably are aware with how this case was decided. But Chief Justice Roberts, writing for a six to three uh, majority, takes the complaint's uh, allegation of facts and runs with them. And he clues, in, clues us in right from the beginning of his opinion uh, how uh, the court is going to rule. So in October 2015, at five o'clock in the morning, Members of United Farm Workers entered Cedar Point's property. Cedar Point's is a, is a, a strawberry nursery. Uh, the organizers moved to the nursery's trim shed where hundreds of workers were preparing strawberry plants. Calling through bullhorns, the organizers disturbed operations, causing some workers to join the organizers in a protest and others to leave the work site altogether. And there's a similar story at Fowler Packing Company, which is a Fresno-based grower and shipper of table grapes. So Cedar Point uh, sought declaratory and injunctive relief uh, against the California Agricultural Labor Relations Board uh, to stop them from enforcing the, the regulation. The district court ruled against them, as did the Ninth Circuit, reasoning that there are only three kinds of regulatory takings. A regulation that affects a permanent physical invasion, so the case of Loretto, where, albeit it was small, just a cable box that was uh, on uh, the property owner's property, but that was a permanent invasion. That's a compensable taking. Regulations that deprive an owner of all economically beneficial use, so that's the Lucas case, and all others, which employ this complicated balancing test under a case called Penn Central. And, and uh, the Ninth Circuit uh, said that uh, Cedar Point was here. Uh, John Roberts, uh, in his, again, majority opinion, highlights Judge Ikuda's dissent. Uh, the, the Ninth Circuit decided not to uh, uh, take this case on bonk, but there were seven judges who dissented. Uh, and she, uh, he eventually adopted her dissent as the court's opinion. Ikuda wrote that the access regulation appropriated from the growers a traditional form of private property, an easement in gross, and transferred that property to union organizers and so uh, concluded that this was a per se physical taking under Supreme Court precedent. This was a bold leap, but not unfounded. Roberts uses some more of the same precedents that Akuta used in her uh, opinion, uh, but saying that uh, in the court's takings jurisprudence, um, there were interferences for the right to exclude. That is, if you've learned anything about basic property rights, whether in law school or otherwise, there's a bundle of sticks that, that your rights, uh, uh, that, that, that comport with, with what your rights are. One of those is the right to exclude others from your property, and this was a clear physical violation of that. Uh, Roberts then quotes the takings clause. This is what we're litigating under, after all, the Fifth Amendment. Nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation, and contextualizes the clause within the founders' intense focus on property rights, quoting Adams, Property must be secured or liberty cannot exist. And Blackstone, not a founder, but, you know, good enough, uh, quote, that sole and despotic dominion which one man claims and exercises over the external things of the world in total exclusion of the right of any other individual in the universe. And so Roberts writes, when the government physically acquires private property for a public use, the takings clause imposes a clear and categorical obligation to provide the owner just compensation period. And then he has a laundry list of cases uh, to show why this access regulation uh, constitutes a physical taking. So the court has found that formal physical condemnations count as, as per se takings, or when the government takes possession but not title, or the occupation of property without taking possession or title. And so we can see where he's going. Uh, these sorts of physical appropriations constitute the clearest sort of taking. The government must pay for what it takes. And so in this case, quote, the access regulation appropriates a right to invade the grower's property and therefore constitutes a per se physical taking. So we're not even arguing over how to balance 
the factors in the Penn Central regulatory taking test, which typically results in no compensation. We're just saying clear rule. The, you know, the state is giving access to a third party in perpetuity for a certain, doesn't matter that it's not you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, this is enough. There, in fact, there are cases where the court has found compensable takings when there is a temporary physical invasion of property or a permanent non-physical invasion. So this is of that ilk. Things like air flight invasions, the right to fire artillery over land, um, uh, trespass by boats over waters, are takings equivalent uh, trespasses. And again, this is a straightforward uh, reading of the right to exclude. Um, now, while the court has in the past attempted to distinguish uh, these sorts of takings from Loretto uh, uh, by calling that invasion, remember the installation of a cable box, by saying that that permanence is the key thing here, Roberts reasons that this distinction has no bearing um, on whether a regulation that works a true physical interference is or is not a taking. In other words, the durational, how long, or the spatial uh, magnitude of an interference is a compensation question. It's not a question of whether there is a taking. So, for example, to begin with, we have held that a physical appropriation is a taking, whether it's permanent or temporary. Next, we've recognized that physical invasions constitute takings, even if they're intermittent as opposed to continuous. And what matters is not that the easement notionally ran around the clock, but that the government had taken a right to physically invade the land. And so he concludes this uh, passage, the upshot of this line of precedent is that government authorized invasions of property, whether by plane, boat, cable, or beachcomber, are physical takings requiring just compensation. Or in other words, because the government appropriated a right to invade, compensation uh, is due. So I think Roberts gets all of that right, uh, whether on purpose or not. Uh, he does go to some length to distinguish this new per se rule from Loretto, maybe even subsuming Loretto, again, the, the, the permanent small cable box, uh, within its scope by casting aside the requirement that a physical invasion be permanent. This is a fairly radical position, actually, in a good way. Uh, Roberts focuses on a number of precedents that the court has long ignored in order to leave untouched that permanence uh, requirement, which is, does not appear in the takings clause, or as uh, uh, takings were understood, property rights violations were understood uh, at common law. But Roberts does get something wrong. He discusses the development of pure regulatory takings, meaning where there's no physical component, it's just a regulation. And he claims that this, these did not emerge until a case from 1922 called Pennsylvania Coal versus Mahan, but not so. Courts before then simply didn't call regulations regulatory takings. Uh, but we're still more than willing to invalidate them for failure to prevent or stop a public, a public harm resulting from a private use, either under the takings clause or the due process clause. And so cases like uh, foundational cases like Muggler versus Kansas in uh, the 1880s or Pompelli versus Green Bay Company from the 1870s, uh, which ma marked the court's gradual recognition of what we now call regulatory takings, uh, compensable ones uh, uh, at that. Um, but anyway, that's for a future case because this was a physical appropriation. This wasn't a, a pure regulation. That's the, the debate wasn't whether a purely regulatory, a pure regulation was compensable uh, or not. Uh, moreover, uh, Roberts uh, responds or preempts or rebuts uh, or prebuts uh, uh, concerns that this opens up uh, any regulation that affects property whatsoever, including you know health inspectors, building code, the police chasing a criminal. That that opens the government up to takings claims. Instead, he he rejects um, uh, you know he says only regulations that that prevent the owner's right to exclude in a way that is not recognized at common law. So for example, we cannot agree that the right to exclude is an empty formality subject to modification at the government's uh, pleasure. On the contrary, it's a fundamental element of the property right. But our holding does nothing to efface the distinction between trespass and takings. So isolated physical invasions not undertaken pursuant to a granted right of access are properly pursued as individual tort claims rather than a violation of uh, Fifth Amendment property right. Or many government authorized physical invasions will not amount to takings because they're consistent with long-standing background restrictions. This is where exercises of the police power, literally with the police chasing uh, a criminal uh, or, or also uh, 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 health inspections uh, when you build a new uh, 
building, getting the, 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 the building code inspector on there to, to look at it. That just one time, it's you know, not a repeated thing for many hours a, a, a day for you know, forever, for, for, for much of the year. And finally, the government may require property owners to cede a right of access as a condition of receiving certain benefits, like a license of, of, of some kind. This is a fancy way of saying that uh, plenty of public invasions if not stopping or preventing a public harm, instead pass muster under Nolan and Dolan. In other words, uh, th these are cases about what kind of exactions government can demand to get a, a, a permit to, to use your property in a, in a certain way. Um, uh, in other words, there is a, a long-standing background principle of common law that you don't even have a right to use your property in a way that may cause harm to others, uh, a nuisance or uh, what economists might call a negative externality. You know, I'm just like playing with dynamite on my property. Well, you know, that might cause some harm. Or, or spewing, you know, dumping noxious chemicals into the river or, or, or other things like that. That can be properly regulated without being a violation of the, the right to exclude or a per se taking or, or anything else. So Roberts uh, concludes, unlike a mere trespass, the regulation here grants a formal entitlement to physically invade the grower's land. Unlike a law enforcement search, no traditional background principle of property law requires the growers to admit union organizers onto their premises. And unlike standard health and safety inspections, the access regulation is not germane to any benefit provided to agricultural employers or any risk posed to the public. In other words, Although this labor regulation may be good public policy, may uh, you know, uh, be for the public use, it's not a traditional limitation on property rights and so merits just compensation. And this could affect uh, all sorts of modern or postmodern progressive regulatory schemes, but not traditional regulatory schemes. Now, what could Roberts have done better? Because I agree with uh, uh, his opinion as far as it went. It was great to do a per se taking. In fact, I argued a case in a circuit court for the first time ever this past June. It was a property rights case, and I was there as amicus to provide the uh, purest extreme position arguing the per se taking, even though the party we were supporting had won on, actually on a regulatory taking or unconstitutional exaction uh, below. But lo and behold, once Cedar Point came out, uh, that buttressed my radical position in that case, and so I called up counsel and said, you know, make sure you're getting the, the 28J letter, which is what lawyers file to update the court after they've argued of, of latest developments, and he was on the ball with that. So I fully agree with the development here as far as it goes, but he, Roberts could still have, have done even better, uh, because what are lower courts to do with an inexhaustive laundry list of so-called traditional common law privileges to access private property. Listing them just assures the skeptical that the basic functions of government will persist, uh, even as the right to exclude is afforded greater protection. Well, that, that's good. But a better approach would be to determine what it is about these background limitations on the right to exclude and other elements of ownership in that bundle of sticks that enable some public trans trespasses without compensation. As Spiegelman and Sisk uh, explain in their Supreme Court Review article, it would have been better to use the classical liberal harm versus benefit distinction to determine when a police power regulation is a regulatory taking. That is, if you're preventing public harm, uh, then that's a regulation and, and, and generally uh, would be uh, not require compensation. If you're conferring a public benefit, like the benefit of you know, labor law or unionization or, or what have you, well, then that's a taking. I mean, it might be a proper use of eminent domain. It might be a proper use of the police power, but it requires uh, just compensation. So, um, you know, two and a half cheers for Cedar Point. And as I said, this is a, a significant uh, property rights case that uh, I think will have implications uh, to the good, in my view, in different regulatory schemes, but will not kind of endanger or, or engender the parade of horribles about, you know, pushing back on, uh, uh, you know, industrial revolution era style uh, regulations of, of health and safety. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ilya. Um, I want to remind everyone watching online that they can submit questions uh, via directly via the event webpage at Cato's website or on Twitter using the hashtag Cato Scotus, C A T O S C O T U S. Um, uh, I, I think we should get right into questions if there are any in the room, uh, front row or second front row. Thank you. Uh, can you uh, wait for wait for the mic, and then could everyone in the room uh, give their name and affiliation? 
Hi, my name is Lisa Sornan. Um, my organization, the State Local Legal Center, filed an amicus brief in Coniglia. My question is for Professor Slobogan. Um, so I, I love Justice Roberts' hypothetical at the argument, and I loved it in his opinion because it was something I, I could personally relate to. Um, as a child, we lived next to an elderly woman who we were very close with who would disappear for days at a time, and I can still feel the panic that I would feel when she wasn't around. It never occurred to me why did my parents not feel the panic or, or express it. I learned as an adult she was an alcoholic and she would binge drink for a few days, and th so they knew she was okay. Anyway, but I think the point is it's something we can all relate to. I think the nub, though, of his scenario is that um, it looks like probably there's an emergency there, but no one knows, and, and that's the problem. And so um, Kavanaugh says, okay, so my test is going to be is there a reasonable basis to think there might be an emergency? If we take away your notion of like, there's someone probably better to call, because of course for the old lady, there is someone better to call. I mean, just another neighbor maybe who's willing to knock the door down. Um, but if, how do you, how did, I liked that. That, I felt that felt satisfying to me. How do you feel about that? Um, okay, it's, we don't think there's an emergency, we don't know for sure that there's an immediate emergency, but we think there might be. So is reasonable basis enough? Yeah, of course, my first reaction is you sort of um, finessed on me. I would say send in a social worker or a substance abuse counselor as opposed to a cop. But assuming we're going to use the cops, um, it is true Kavanaugh, who wrote a concurring opinion in this case, did um, suggest that the state would not be probable cause, but ra rather reason to believe, which I guess he's thinking is a lower standard than probable cause, um, to get at this idea of, well, we can never be sure and hey, it's better to err on the side of intervention just to avoid death or, or serious bodily injury. Well, of course, the mental health system has been dealing with this for ages, and the Supreme Court, as a constitutional matter, requires clear and convincing evidence that serious bodily injury will occur in the in near future, or you may not commit or intervene against a person involuntarily. So at least in that area of the law, uh, now it does have to do with civil commitment as opposed to going inside a house, but nonetheless, the court has developed a fairly stringent test. The way I finesse it, I have to admit it is a bit of finesse. I keep the probable cause standard, but you may have noticed, uh, though I said it very quickly so you may not have, probable cause to believe physical harm has occurred or is likely to occur. So what's probable cause of a likelihood? It might be Kavanaugh's reason to believe. Um, the bottom line is there has to be some concrete evidence that there's imminent harm. And actually there's a case called Sanders, which the court took a little bit later. Um, which Kavanaugh said is another case where there should have been intervention. Um, and I agree under my formulation. But I also have seen a lot of lower court cases where the police just barge in because, as I said before, there's a loud noise. Or, hey, there's a door ajar. We better check that out. Or they knock to serve process and someone doesn't come to the door within two minutes. So they go right in. And people sue. They're not criminals at all. They sue over this kind of, kind of stuff because they're, they're understandably very upset. Sanders has a benefit of a baby crack. Yeah. That's the last a baby crying and a six-year-old also well, yeah, in trouble. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, Trevor, back there. Hi, Trevor Burris, Cato Institute. Adam, I was wondering if you would fill us in on the subsequent litigation and the footnote that you had me add on your article and what had happened in the Epic versus Apple uh, due to the Google decision. Yeah, great. Um, so, um, <clears throat> uh, and so as I mentioned, um, Justice Breyer's uh, embrace of fair use to get around the copyrightability issue ended up creating a very expansive notion of fair use. Um, that what you know what counts as transformative if you're just shifting it to another type of use and diminishing the type of protection, and that this was immediately recognized as being somewhat of a radical. Uh, change to the doctrine. Um, there's several tells in the opinion, in the classic poker sense of it, that he recognizes this because he actually has to put it in a line at the very end of his opinion where he says, by the way, um, nothing we're saying here is meant to overrule any of our prior fair use opinions. <laughs> well, you wouldn't have to say that if it wasn't rising to anyone in the, in the doctrine that this contradicts other prior opinions. Um, and of course, people started to run with it. It came up um, actually it, it, the very next month, so the decision came down in April and May, it actually came up in the Epic antitrust lawsuit against, um, against Apple, because Apple was in part relying upon its IP rights and its, and its code and its app store. And on the stand, the, the Apple's expert had to confess, 
um, well, given Google v. Oracle, we may not have, we, we probably don't have copyright protection in our, in our code as, as a defense anymore. Um, but more significantly, there was a other case that was, uh, that had been occurring over the past couple of years in which the, uh, the estate of Prince had sued the estate of Warhol for the unauthorized use of a photo of Prince. You know how Warhol takes photos and converts them, the famous Campbell soup example. Um, and Warhol, the Warhol estate originally had argued fair use, um, and they had lost um, in a decision in uh, er earlier this year. And when the Google decision came down, the Warhol estate immediately filed the the. Uh, Ilya, was it the letter J, the, the 28J. J28, saying, hey, there's a Supreme Court decision that, that affects your fair use analysis, and the, and the court ordered rebriefing on the fair use analysis given the Google case, and, and, um, <clears throat> and ultimately just ruled, actually, just about two weeks ago that, no, our, our, our decision was originally correct. However, um, you might think, okay, so they, that, uh, they, the courts are cabining the Google decision to it to just the API uh, uh, APIs in the declaring code, but six, sixty law professors filed an amicus brief on behalf of the Warhol State, saying Google has changed everything, um, and you know, and it's not limited just to computer code, um, and and so you're going to see organizations, policy organizations, and well, and well law you know, Adam, sixty sixty law professors plus five Supreme Court votes gets you a change in the law. <laughs> They're going to, so you're going to see continued pressure from this very expansive decision on judges, um, from lawyers, from policy organizations, and from and from academics to 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 embrace and and drive this 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 decision into other areas of copyright law. Other questions in the room behind Trevor? Sir. Hi, Adam. Follow up question. Could you give your name and affiliation? Trey Mayfield, Juris Day. Uh, former neighbor of Trevor's. Um, to what extent do you think that what the court was doing here is akin to what it was doing a couple of years ago in the gerrymandering decision and just saying, you know what, we don't want to deal with this anymore. We are not tech savvy and it's easier to, to punt than it is to continue having to deal with something that we're, we really don't understand. Uh, you're asking the context of the Google decision? Well, I mean, it would have been, it, it, but that's not, it, that would be a, they, the court does do that <laughs> at times. Uh, you know, it, you'd be fool not to acknowledge that. But they didn't do that in this case. They actually, I mean, Justice Breyer embraced a full-throated, very expansive notion of a fair use defense in the context of computer software, to the point that it's impossible now to imagine how anyone with a who has written. Um, an API program, um, you know, it, and even in some other context, some other type of computer code that you could get copyright copyright protection, um, <clears throat> because because you hear you had a direct commercial use creating a direct competing product in the marketplace <laughs> that actually killed off Oracle's licensing revenue. Their licensing revenue. This is not mentioned by Breyer. You find this in Justice Thomas's dissent. Their licensing revenue after Google. Uh, copied the 11,500 lines dropped 97 and a half percent because every other because all of their current licensees went and either said well we're just going to stop paying you and you can't sue us because we're just going to claim fair use like the way Google is um, and Google won on this now so it's really hard to see how you could have copyright protection now for at least an API and potentially other types of computer programs so this isn't the Supreme Court punting. Um, in fact, I thought that this might even be Justice Breyer's swan song. I thought he might be retiring, given that this was such a, hmm. a full-throated application of this position that he had advocated for in 1970. That he was maybe like, "I'm going. I'm going to go out on a really strong note here," um, but um, but that doesn't. But I was I was wrong in that prediction. <laughs> I want to check if we have any online questions. Uh, we do. This is on uh, Cedar Point. Um, again, from anonymous. Um, <laughs> What would be the next law? Is that law? actually anonymous, or is it from you, the co-author of the article that I was supposed to be describing? <laughs> it, it is anonymous, but I'll, I'll, I'll add a little cleanup, so uh, that's my contribution. What would be the next logical case after Cedar Point um, for the Supreme Court? Um, do they just sort of do what, uh, what Roberts did this time, which is they take each one on a case-by-case -case where they're just answering, oh, this is a background limitation, or uh, background principle, um, and for the lower courts, what what, what does it mean if uh, all they're given is this concept of a traditional lim traditional limitation or background uh, principle? It doesn't really 
quite give any guidance to the lower courts. Right. Well, the Supreme Court in property law over the last 20 years, there's sort of been a pattern and it's all gone in, in one direction in the sense that they clarify with different kinds of takings claims that, yes, indeed, this is a taking that's compensable. And whether flooding uh, as opposed to, you know, temporary flooding, you know, the, there was a case of uh, 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 agricultural, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Commission versus... Oh, gosh, I'm getting all these agencies wrong in the case names. But anyway, it was, it was like there, there have been precedent that permanent floodings are takings and temporary physical invasions are takings. Well, what about temporary floods? And, you know, some seemingly an easy case ended up being, I think, 5-4, that, it, yes, it was a, a taking. Or the Horn case, the, uh, the raisins, pri as, a, as applied to personal property, can personal property be taken, even if you're only taking title or, you know, rather than physical possession? The answer was that to yes. So all these kind of neat little, they're almost like law school uh, hypotheticals. Uh, and so the next time the court takes up, you know, is something a per se taking? Yeah, I'm sure it will, you know, declare that it is, but who knows what that might be. For a while, we are going to have, though, a lot of claims in the lower courts about different kinds of state regulatory schemes. Not everyone is as aggressive as California, but certainly you can imagine in the environmental area, in uh, uh, maybe, 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 uh, uh, the pretext of, of food safety, but actually being more protectionist. I, I, you know, lo lots of different things that you could imagine that's not kind of something that wouldn't have occurred to a regulator to implement uh, 100 years ago, 80 years ago, uh, before kind of a more modern conceptions of uh, government power to contravene economic and property rights. Other questions in the room? Yeah, uh, fourth row uh, over in the corner here. Yeah, Pat Spann, uh, retired government. I had a, a personal a property question. I was wondering, it, it dawned on me when I was sitting on a deer stand a couple of years ago in, on my property in New York State, is there some height of that trespassing by a drone? Is, um, you know, I was thinking a drone came over my head and bothered me while I was hunting. That's probably a time to shoot the drone. But the... Uh, is that allowed? And what I mean, you know, you have property rights on the ground. Does it extend up a couple hundred feet or any feet at all? Yeah, historically, it's supposed to. You know, there's a Latin phrase that says, like, from the ground all the way up to the heavens. Yeah, yeah column rule. Uh, go ahead, say it, say it, say it. Well, I know this because I'm a Fourth Amendment scholar. I don't know nothing about takings, but yeah, there is a property right I call him, which gives you authority over your property to a particular height. Actually, it's supposed to be ad infinitum. Of course, um, of course Roman uh, aerospace technology wasn't very advanced, right. and so they, you know, with the advent of, of uh, airplanes and, and such, that, that was kind of uh, amended. Uh, although there's still a case from the 40s called uh, United States versus Cosby that talked about uh, air flight invasions that are equivalent to land invasions. There's also in the Fourth Amendment right. area, Kylo, uh, where if you're you know, flying over using uh, infrared sensors, that's a violation. So yeah, there is some limitation on drones. What exactly the height is, that uh, I don't know. You'd have to be able to prove some sort of, uh, you know, beyond, nobody's going to bring a case where it's just purely nominal, I suppose. So it'd have to be either in a Fourth Amendment context with surveillance, or it'd have to be, you know, the drone crashes, or, or there's you know, some damage before one of these cases is going to arise. We have another online question. I, I promise I'm not overloading the panel with Cedar Point questions. There are actually oh, sure. a lot of them. <laughs> um, Is this from Spam Siegelman? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, no, John no, Mark's mustache. <laughs> uh, would any of the pandemic lockdown measures, such as uh, forced business closures uh, and restrictions that otherwise impaired contracts and restricted the abilities of business to operate, would, ever, would any of those ever involve uh, a, a taking requiring compensation? I don't think that Cedar Point changed pandemic law because it asked, Cedar Point was about what constitutes a per se taking and whether a particular kind of invasion did. The pandemic cases are about whether the government was justified to such an extreme in exercising its power. You know, without the pandemic, the government uh, couldn't just order lockdowns, uh, presumably. Uh, and so, 
Um, yeah, I don't think this is going to change those kinds of cases. One, one, one exception, maybe, yep. which is the uh, CDC's eviction moratorium. Well, the, might, well, that, no, no, no. The because, CDC eviction because, moratorium is is based on uh, uh, federalism that the federal well, government. No, it was decided because they didn't reach it substantively. But let's say Congress passes a law because that was the issue. It was a it was a non delegation case, right? So, um, and they said Congress didn't authorize you to do this. So let's imagine now Congress then steps in and passes a law that allows them to have that expansive eviction moratorium. Well, then. Once a landlord has decided that a tenant should be evicted, the tenant is now no longer a tenant, they're a trespasser. And so you have a law mandating that you allow a trespasser to stay on your property. I think that that would, impl that would be implicated under Cedar Point. I'll, I'll take that as a friendly amendment to my response. Yeah. <laughs> Questions? Uh, we have a front row on this side here. Yeah, uh, my name is Stephen Keat. Uh, I'm a re retired U.S. diplomat. And specifically, I'm an economic cone officer, and a lot of my career was spent on intellectual property rights issues. So you can guess who I'm directing my question at. Um, the United States has signed on to a lot of international conventions and IPR, and we use the WTO through TRIPS as a enforcement mechanism. I, now, I could see a situation in the future where a US firm could be going and taking you know, the copyrighted IPR of someone else, computer code, and going and using it under this doctrine. And then we would be in violation of international conventions and of trips. Uh, do you see that as being a concern? Oh, that's a really that's a really interesting question. I, I initially thought you might be going to the IP waiver issue uh, before the World Trade Organization, but um, that, that's a very interesting issue. This issue actually is being litigated in other jurisdictions as well. So there's a there is actually a uh, I, not literally a companion case, but a, 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 a very similar case being litigated in England by SAS Institute. SAS Institute does the same thing that. Uh, Sun Microsystems Oracle did it creates it, it creates this kind of under the hood software for businesses to use in the operation of computer programs more generally and that's being litigated in that country as well under the same issue of whether this counts as a fair use or not and, and someone directly copying this kind of direct uh, program to program interface program um, and um, and since fair use is part of every major uh, jurisdictions copyright system um, you know it would be difficult to see how this might r run us in um, in trouble with the with trips the the IP uh, treaty that's that's enforced at the World Trade Organization um, so because I think it just would be arguably well this is an interpretation of our fair use doctrine and, and especially if other jurisdictions follow a similar type of interpretation um, because the copyrightability of computer software programs has been a serious issue of legal and policy debate, um, not just in the United States, but actually in every major developed country. Um, in fact, the United States, for instance, is the only country that actually provides patent protection for, for computer software programs, which is why copyright protection, most computer companies rely on copyright protection because that, that they can get, uh, in other countries, they can't get patent protection. More questions? I have a second row right up here. It's an interesting question. Two quick questions. One is for Adam and one is for Chris. Could, could you give your name and... Uh... Fred Bonig from the Daily Ripple. First one is about electronic music and, and how does you, did that decision affect that? And for Christopher, the one, what is the conditions of a wellness check, which is different? Um, yeah, I, it, 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 this is the problem is that the, the opinion is so expansive, but for that one line that says this doesn't apply to any, any other areas of law, you know, it could potentially be extended because it was argued under the peer-to-peer -peer file sharing cases. Well, this is this is transformative. We're actually sharing music in a way that hadn't been done before in a new format and new context, and that fits perfectly the argument by Google that we took Java and put it into a new type of open source mobile mobile phone platform system that had never been done before. So, um, and 
trust me, if you've thought of that, there are people who are thinking of that issue and are trying to figure out if they can try to exploit that hole. And yeah, and so this is going to be, this is going to all have to end up being litigated, just like it was relitigated in the Warhol v. Prince case over this past summer. Um, so I guess at the end of the day, the lesson is the lawyers win again because uh, they're the ones who are going to have to decide this. Yeah, on wellness checks, I mean, obviously one aspect of that that might be different than the situations I was talking about is there's often consent. In other words, it's part of an agreement between government and the individual. But if there's not, it's not consensual, then what I said I think applies that, first of all, why the police as opposed to social services? Uh, and in any event, um, if there is, in fact, uh, no emergency, then there shouldn't be any kind of intervention, at least by the police. More questions in the room? Uh, let's see, on the aisle over here, on this side. Uh, Jim Duholm, unaffiliated. This is a question for Ilya. Uh, as I understand the facts, in Cedar Point, there was a, a business interruption as well as an occupation of uh, real estate. Was that aspect of it? involved in the case? Is it a separate taking? Does it go to damages? Is it tough luck? Uh, it goes to damages. I assume that's going to be now litigated on, on remand. But yes, their, their claim for injunctive relief. Um, well, actually, they, they asked for declarative and injunctive relief. Um, I'm going to have to go back. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call Lifeline. Sam Spiegelman, <laughs> who uh, wrote about the case. Do you remember if there was an and aspect? I know it didn't, a, it didn't this, make it to the Supreme Court, but is there a damages claim that remains? The phone a friend or ask the audience? I I didn't even see the, uh, a damage claim yeah. at the lower level, so I don't think it was even litigated yet. Yeah. Sam, you have an online question? I do, and it's not about Cedar Point. Um, it's for Professor Slobogan, um, while social work, and this is from Ponzio Oliviero of National University. Non-anonymous. Yes. <laughs> uh, while social workers may be better equipped to handle a lot of mental health issues, um, what about when the offender is violent or armed or already using force? And where is that line drawn? And, you know, in, in, the, in the heat of the moment, who draws that line? Right. Well, that can be difficult. I think 911 dispatchers have to be trained how to triage. So, for instance, the CAHOOTS program that I mentioned before, they get about 24,000 calls. They respond to about 24,000 calls a year just in Eugene, Oregon. That's about 20% of all the calls. And they only call in the police... They only called in the police about 150 times out of those 24,000. So what happens is mental health professionals or people like them are the first responders. Then if something starts happening that requires force, they call in the police. And that seems to work very well in Eugene, Oregon. Now, it might not work in a big city environment, uh, but that would be a brief response to that kind of question. Certainly, if, you, if there's going to be danger to human beings, the police need to be considered as an option. All right. I think that's unfortunately going to be all the time we have for this panel. I apologize to any questions uh, we didn't get. Uh, we're going to move directly into our next panel at 2.15. So I've been told to tell all of you to stay in your seats, keep your seat belts fashioned, do not, do not wander around the aisles. Uh, and I want to thank our three panelists. And ne next up will be a panel moderated by Will Yateman on administrative law.
Perfect. So, welcome. Uh, my name is William Yateman. I'm a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. I'm also an associate editor for the Cato Supreme Court Review. So our next panel is on constitutional structure. Um, this is a very fast-moving area of law before the Supreme Court, and I'm looking forward to what's coming up. I'll introduce each speaker in turn. We'll go alphabetically. So I'll start with Professor Josh Blackman of the South Texas College of Law. Um, personally speaking, I think that blogging is among the highest forms of communication. Um, in my humble opinion, Josh is the nation's best constitutional blogger out there on the World Wide Web. I, I disagree. I, I, I mean, I, I recommend everyone here and watching online to please check out his posts at the Volokh Conspiracy. Um, today, Josh will be presenting on his article titled Unreviewable, the final installment of the epic Obamacare trilogy. I should add here very briefly, this is Josh's fourth contribution to the Cato Supreme Court review that ties in for second place all time. Who's first? Oh, uh, it's a two-way tie between Jonathan Adler and I forget the other scholar. It's on. It's on. Okay. I shall take this off for a minute. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here with much longer hair than my last visit. Um, Obamacare is sort of like the movie Groundhog Day for me. It's the same script that keeps repeating over and over again. This is at least my fourth time at this podium talking about Obamacare. In 2013, I was here talking about my first book, Unprecedented, The Constitutional Challenge to Obamacare. In 2016, my second book, Unraveled, Obamacare, Religious Liberty and Executive Power. I'm here today. And next year, Ilya will be bothered with another book, fo uh, book form for my next book, which we call Undefeated, <laughs> the trilogy for Obamacare. But you get a preview of that article today. Um, for whatever reason, my young career has been defined by Obamacare. When I started blogging in 2009, this new law was coming around called the ACA, and there was this individual mandate. And I was very much involved in tracking the arguments about why Congress could not make people purchase health insurance. I was by chance present at a meeting at the Mayflower Hotel where the arguments to stop Obamacare were first hatched. Randy Barnett and Todd Gaziano and others were just sitting there milling about trying to change the constitutional world. And over the past decade, I've written about Obamacare. I've followed it. I've written amicus briefs about it for Cato and King v. Burwell and in the Hobby Lobby case and Little Sisters of the Poor. And during that time, Obamacare has had three existential challenges. It's defeated all three. The first was NFIB versus Sibelius in 2012 where the Supreme Court saved the ACA's individual mandate as an exercise of the taking power. The second case with King v. Burwell, the court held that the ACA, which subsidizes health care exchanges established by the state, also subsidizes the federal exchange. And this past term, we have California against Texas. This case held that Obamacare was safe. The latest challenge to the ACA was unreviewable, hence the title of my article. <clears throat> California versus Texas began when President Trump signed the Tax Cut and Jobs Act of 2017. This law did not repeal Obamacare's individual mandate. Rather, it reduced the penalty to zero dollars and zero cents, arguably this revision toppled the NFIB saving construction. Soon, a cohort of conservative attorneys general, as well as two private plaintiffs, filed suit. The plaintiffs argued that the ACA, without the penalty, could no longer be saved as an exercise of the taxing power. And they argued the unconstitutional mandate could not be severed from the remainder of the law. This is really where the ball game was, right? If the mandate was stopped by itself, you know, victory for Cato, but not much for anyone else. They want to go big or go home. Well, they went home, as it turned out. The arguments were familiar, but Texas felt different. NFIB versus Sibelius united the conservative legal movement, of which I think we have a few card-carrying members here, and the Republican 
political apparatus who are not here at the moment. This confluence moved novel arguments about the unconstitutionality of the mandate from off the wall to on the wall, to use Jack Balkan's phrasing. In NFIB, 26 states joined the challenge against the federal government, more than half the states in the union. And these combined forces came within a single vote, just one vote, right, Ilya? Just one vote, that's all it took, <clears throat> of killing the most important social legislation in generations. Four years later, the support for King V. Burrell was still strong. That was John Adler, who apparently is beating me on the Cato Supreme Court review. Got to work harder. The conservative legal movement largely backed the challenge, which was grounded in a conventional reading of the ACA. But in 2017, the politics were different. The ACA had cracked the 50% mark for popularity. Indeed, the surge in popularity was triggered by Congress's failed efforts to repeal the law. Now that people were relying on it, like, wait a minute, I don't want this thing to go away. This is good for me. Millions of Americans now came to depend on the Affordable Care Act. As a result, many red states that joined NFIB did not support Texas's case. There was a shift. Only 18 states joined this challenge. Moreover, there was not much support for it. The Wall Street Journal, usually a good litmus test for where conservatives are, hated the case. Speaking of John Nadler, John Nadler and Michael Cannon of the Cato Institute were the architects of the King v. Burwell case. They thought this case was ridiculous, and they were quite critical of me and others for the work that we did on this case. We're cool, though. We're real friends. For some time, I was the only prominent dissenting voice, or usually am. Uh, Randy Barnett eventually came around, but uh, we were few in number. But for me, at least, and I think for Cato, this challenge was consistent with longstanding views about NFIB. And I know this case better than just about anyone else, so I can say on some ground that this is something that I've believed in a long time. So first... I long ago concluded that the private plaintiffs in NFIB had sang to challenge the ACA even with a zero dollar penalty. Remember, when NFIB was decided, the penalty had not, not yet been assessed. There was simply a mandate that said, buy insurance before 2014. The basis for the injury were they were planning to buy insurance in the future. It was not based on the penalty. And for nearly a decade, I had debated across the country this one point. The injury in NFIB was based on the mandate and not the penalty. No one cared because it was basically a moot point. But this was very important to me because to prove that there was a mandate, to prove there was an injury. See, I didn't care about the standing element. I cared about the injury element, that you were being forced to buy insurance. The second point that I've long held is that the individual mandate imposed an un constitutional command to purchase insurance without regard to the penalty. Again, the injury in NFIB was based on the mandate and not the penalty. And only through the Chief Justice's saving construction could the ACB read as a choice between buying insurance and paying a tax. This choice argument, buy insurance or pay a tax, right? only existed in the narrow confines of the Obamacare saving construction. But once the penalty was reduced to zero dollars, the saving construction failed. That choice vanished. We were left with an unconstitutional command to buy insurance. And these were the views that Cato advanced in the amicus brief they worked on with Ilya and a few other people uh, at the center. Alas, the Supreme Court disagreed with us. Wasn't even close. Seven, seven, not four, se seven. Seven members of the court found the plaintiffs lack standing. Justice Breyer, no swan song, Adam, right? Justice Breyer wrote the majority opinion, joined by the Chief Justice. Justice, oh, it kills me. Clarence, what are you doing, Clarence? Clarence Thomas joined the majority. 
Justice Sotomayor, Kagan, Kavanaugh, and Barrett. Justice Samuel Alito dissented with Gorsuch. We got two votes. We didn't even get two votes, right? The two dissenters found that the states had standing. The mandate was unconstitutional, and certain portions of the ACA should be enjoined. They were not clear which ones. But none of the justices, neither the majority nor the dissent, addressed what might be called standing through inseverability. This was a position advanced by the U.S. Solicitor General. Um, our brief was actually written before we saw their brief, but they were very much on the same page. They may borrow from us, we may borrow from them, but we were on the same page. Um, ultimately, the majority said we will not consider this argument because it was waived. The lawyer's most dreaded word is waiver. If any of you guys are law students here listening, waiver is the worst thing to have. Oh, we don't have to consider it. Let me tell you something, folks. It was not waived. I was sitting in the Fifth Circuit courtroom listening to them make the argument. My ears do not deceive me, Justice Breyer. But it apparently was not raised in the cross-petition for certiorari, and that's enough for a waiver. This is a manufactured standard. The court did not want to touch it because the argument had more merit than was given to it. And the dissenters simply said, well, we don't worry about that. We'll do state standing. So in my brief time here, I'd like to explain how we thought standing through inseverability could work, right? Um, the basis of our theory was, was actually a Thomas opinion, which is why it kills me he didn't agree with us. Uh, Justice Thomas wrote a, an opinion called in Murphy involving uh, online sports betting. And Justice Thomas said we need to reconsider severability doctrine, right? We can't just be willy-nilly and strike down statutes in their entirety. That's, that's wrong, and I agree with that. Thomas explained... We should limit the provisions we invalidate to those that injure the plaintiff. And he draws this close fit between severability doctrine and standing doctrine, that you can only invalidate provisions of law that, in fact, injure the plaintiff. And if there's no injury, in fact, you can't invalidate it in severability doctrine. So I just see this as a circle, right? Standing and severability are linked. And severability and standing are linked. I thought it would go both ways. Uh, CT disagreed, right? But let's just indulge my, my fantasy for a few more minutes that I thought might actually work. So how would this operate? The individual mandate was a command to buy insurance. It inflicted an injury in fact. I will go to the grave arguing that point. There was an injury in fact. But the biggest hurdle was not injury in fact. It was redressability. Right? That's one of the three elements of standing. You have injury, traceability, and redressability. Usually, we ask, is there some sort of injunction or some remedy that a court could order that would actually redress the plaintiff's injuries? If you're just dealing with a mandate, you've got a problem. What are you going to order? The government can't stop doing something they're not doing. Right? If they're not actually enforcing a mandate... They can't stop doing it, right? You can only be ordered to stop doing something you can actually do. And, and I, I can see this point, right? In fact, this, this was, I mean, a fairly obvious point. Justice Barrett, I think one of her first questions on the bench, asked about redressability. So this wasn't a surprise. But there was a way to address redressability sort of indirectly. And you did it through inseverability. Generally, when Congress enacts laws, they include severability provisions. They say, if whatever reason provision X is declared unconstitutional, please, courts, leave the rest of the law in place. Let as much of the law survive as possible. This makes sense, right? Congress doesn't want its handiwork to be cut short. Right? Severability clauses are fairly common. Often courts ignore them. For example, in, in uh, the Texas abortion case, the other one, Holman's Health, there was a provision in the law that said abortion clinics must have smoke detectors. Justice Breyer said, no, we can't have that. No severability killed the entire law, right? God forbid, smoke detectors. That's an undue burden, whatever, right? So courts ignore these clauses all the time. But the ACA was different. It did not have a severability clause. It had, I think, an inseverability clause. Inseverability clause. That if a certain portion of the law is declared unconstitutional, other clauses go with it, right? You cannot sever the mandate from health insurance regulations. 
the guaranteed issue, and community rating. These are the laws that make insurers cover everyone regardless of their health. The ACA said that the mandate was essential, that's where it's used in the statute, essential to the operation of guaranteed issue and community rating. Essential, the word appears there twice in the statute, not in a committee report, not in a legislative history, in the statute. In 2012, the Obama administration argued that this provision functioned as an inseverability clause. I thought they were right back then. In fact, with respect to Cato, I thought the correct remedy was if the Obamacare mandate's unconstitutional, you just take out those two parts. I, you know, whatever. That was 10 years ago. Um, so what we argued was that if the mandate's unconstitutional, then there's other provisions go with it. In this regard, the mandate and the guaranteed issue are this cohesive whole. They're like a block. Congress glued them together. And if those three provisions generate standing, those three provisions can be used for inseverability. Can you enjoin the guaranteed issue? Yeah, you can. It's a health insurance regulation. You can enjoin it. That's how you get to redressability. Injury in fact, traceability, redressability. If those three provisions are glommed together, standing's a piece of cake. We didn't think this was this radical, right? Congress very rarely tells us about inseverability. It's not very common, but they did so here. And we thought that was sufficient to generate standing. The court ran away from this argument. They did not want to touch it. They did not want to touch it at all. The, the dissenters like, ooh, we're not sure. It seems novel. And they didn't want to touch it either. Um, the upshot here, though, is that Obamacare still exists in this sort of zone of twilight, if I may borrow another constitutional phrase. The mandate's still unconstitutional. It's still there, right? No one, no, maybe no one, but few people doubt that. But at some point, Someone will raise the challenge in a defensive posture. Imagine a QUITAM challenge, right, or a False Claims Act challenge. Like, oh, you committed health care fraud. Wait a minute, you can't come at me with Obamacare. It's unconstitutional. At that point, some judge somewhere will have to decide whether the entire statute's valid. And by the way, under Fifth Circuit precedent, it ain't valid. Right, so, so if you bring this case in Texas, you're in a pretty good spot. But alas, the court did not want to decide this case. I have to go write my third book now. I think I'm out of time. Thank you all so much. And it is such a pleasure to be back here in Cato to speak to you all in person. I know you have people in Zoom land, but uh, it's, it's really, uh, after a year and a half, it's, it, it's a familiar joy to be in front of you all. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you so much, Josh. Uh, next, we've got Derek Mahler. Um, he's a professor at the Iowa College of Law. Now, I poured over Derek's CV in preparation for this introduction, and rest assured, he is incredibly accomplished. Um, he's clerked at the Eighth Circuit. He's excelled in private practice at a white shoe firm. But one thing leapt off the page of your CV. Um, in 2020, at the Yada Yada Law School, Derek gave a presentation on Seinfeld Law. I mean. I thought that was incredible. I think that's really neat. I want to learn more about it. Um, today, Derek is going to present. Doctrine about nothing. <laughs> Very indeed. The, uh, uh, Derek is going to present on his article, which is titled "Bronovich v. DNC: Election Litigation uh, Migrates from Federal Courts to the Political Process." Well, thank you. Yes, my YouTube lecture on evidence law, including all the attorney-client privilege from Jackie Childs to prospective client Kramer, is available for your viewing if you're so interested. Uh, thank you to Cato and for the participants on this panel for the, the great editing work on uh, the, the piece and for the journal. Uh, it's an invaluable resource every year, so I appreciate uh, being a part of it this time. Um, so Brnovich versus Democratic National Committee uh, was a decision issued this year. and. Um, you know, I, I, there's been a little bit of uh, election litigation that's happened around the country in the last couple of years, right? Um, uh, in terms of the major political parties, the RNC and the DNC and their Senate congressional arms, they spent or they disclosed that they spent about seven and a half million dollars back in 2012 on uh, law or litigation, attorneys' fees, and the like. Uh, that total was something north of 66 million in 2020. Um, on a wide variety of fronts, from uh, pandemic-related measures to challenges to the certification of the results of the election. Um, but one trend has been holding true in the last two decades, and that is if you're challenging an election law and it gets up before the United States Supreme Court, you're probably going to lose. Um, and this case was no exception. 
Um, so Brnovich versus DNC began in 2016 as the Democratic National Committee challenged two laws out of the state of Arizona. One was a very old standing law on out of precinct voting. That is, it prohibited voters from casting a vote outside of their home precinct. Uh, it would not count that ballot, even if you were a registered voter. The thought was, uh, you show up to the precinct, you vote in your precinct. Uh, the thought was, well, maybe we could count the vote. You know, maybe we don't know where you reside or you voted in the first congressional district where you're supposed to be in the second congressional district, but you're a registered voter. We can count your ballot for Senate, for president, for some statewide office. Some states have provisions like this, but Arizona did not. In fact, Arizona, going back to at least 1970, um, and likely since it, uh, the territory became a state in 1912, uh, had this rule on the books saying you can't uh, cast a ballot outside of your precinct and have it counted. The second was a new statute that had just been enacted in the state of Arizona that Arizona had been considering in some previous legislative sessions, which prohibited third-party ballot collection, or sometimes called ballot harvesting. That is to say, only members of your family, postal workers, county officials who are counting the ballot, caregivers, a limited set of individuals can collect your ballot once you've cast your vote. Um, the concerns arose about voter intimidation, Concerns arose, there could be voter fraud from collecting blank ballots and completing them. Uh, there have been scattered instances and reports gathered about the kind of voter intimidation concerns about collecting these ballots. Um, and so the thought was in Arizona, which had considered some similar bills in 2011, 2013, uh, to enact the statute in 2016. Um, so these two provisions were challenged by the Democratic National Committee uh, in the state of Arizona. And they used as the mechanism to challenge it a provision of the Voting Rights Act called Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. Now, a little bit of the, the, the history about how we got to this stage was that for a long time, from 1965 onward, a number of states were covered under a provision in a Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. I'm sure if I looked into the Cato journals, you could see about the 2013 litigation that arose in a case called Shelby County versus Holder, where the Supreme Court said there were a handful of states that because of their past history of racial discrimination, require to go get pre-clearance from the Department of Justice, essentially pre-approval of their, of their election laws before they could take effect to ensure that they didn't diminish the opportunity of racial minorities to participate in the political process. Um, in 2013, the Supreme Court in Shelby County said, Congress hasn't updated this formula for covering states since 1975. Uh, if that's the case, we think that the formula is out of date. Congress needs to update it. Congress this month is considering a bill, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, that would update that statute based on contemporary conditions. But what that meant is states, including Arizona, uh, that had previously been covered, can enact statutes just like the rest of the country. It passed a statute, it gets enacted, it has to be challenged in court. And litigants were looking for alternative avenues to challenge such statutes, and one was to look at the text of a statute in the Voting Rights Act called Section 2. And I'll read it very briefly. A violation of this section is, is established if based on the totality of the circumstances, it is shown that the political processes leading to nomination or election in the state or political subdivision are not equally open to participation by members of a class of citizens provided by this subsection in that its members have less opportunity than other members of the electorate to participate in the political process and to elect representatives of their choice. Um, this provision had been used principally since Congress amended it in the 80s to deal with redistricting issues. It had not been used for what plaintiffs would call vote denial cases. I can't vote in this precinct. I can't vote because someone can't collect my ballot. Or a neutral time, place, manner restriction, right? Here are the rules for how precincts operate. Here are the rules for collecting ballots. So as a result, there arose after 2013 some additional inquiry into, could this section be used to challenge election laws? It hasn't really been used to challenge these kinds of election laws, but maybe we can develop some mechanisms to do so. Arizona was one of the earlier efforts at this uh, made here. The Democratic National Committee thought this would be a good effort to potentially collect some additional votes for Hillary Clinton in 2016. The thought was statewide election, out of precinct voter ban could benefit the Democratic candidate. So the challenge was brought principally on partisan grounds, but under the Voting Rights Act on the thought that it would, uh, 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 that these statutes affected racial minorities' opportunity to participate in the political process. Um, and many commentators at the time recognized that this case might be something of an overreach in terms of the statute and in terms of its application. Um, the plaintiffs lost at the trial court and they lost at the Ninth Circuit. 
Um, but then they won at the Ninth Circuit on Bonk. And the Ninth Circuit found that both statutes ran afoul of the Voting Rights Act. And in fact, that, that Arizona had enacted its ballot harvesting law with racially discriminatory intent. Um, so that was a heavy finding from the Ninth Circuit that I think got the Supreme Court's attention when they granted cert in this case. So you have this statute, and again, it's not, it's a pretty open-ended statute, right? <laughs> One of the most important provisions is try to, to identify what is equally open to members of the political process in that its members have less opportunity than members of the electorate to participate. And so in a 6-3 decision, the Supreme Court, in opinion by Justice Samuel Alito, emphasized looking at this statute through sort of standard statutory interpretation that we're looking at what's equally open, how do we identify equally open, in that there's less opportunity, and we can measure opportunity by looking at the totality of the circumstances. Now, when a court is asked to interpret a statute that uses the phrase totality of the circumstances, <laughs> it's a challenge, right? The court offered said, we're going to offer five guideposts, but of course, totality of the circumstances is limitless. It means anything relevant to examining, less opportunity to part participate in the political process. And it offered some touchstones to think about that. Um, now, Justice Kagan in dissent and, and some critics of Brnovich have not been very happy with this opinion to say it's sort of uh, text-free. It is really not tethered to the text of the statute at all. But in a way, when you're dealing with a phrase like totality of the circumstances, I think the court is doing the best job it could. It looks, it says, here are some guideposts for lower courts. The size of the burden imposed by the voting rule, the degree to which the voting rule departs from practices in 1982 when the statute was amended, the size of disparities the, uh, that impact members of, of different racial or ethnic groups, the opportunities provided by a state's entire system of voting and the strength of the state's voting interest. And two provisions in particular stand out. The first is that when the court introduces this concept to say, what does it mean to have less opportunity to political, participate in the political process? The court tethers it to an understanding of what Congress was doing in 1982 when it enacted the statute. Say that was essentially the baseline that courts should be considering. So in, in, a, in a couple of respects, this might be a pretty remarkable proposition. One is in 1982, almost no state had anything like the absentee or early in-person voting systems like we have today. And so it's a strong suggestion, and indeed it was the case in this, in this uh, opinion, to say that those kinds of provisions are likely going to survive scrutiny. They do not deviate very far uh, from what happens in this particular case. But the second is to think about other statutes that might be challenged in the future, such as voter identification laws, which were not a very popular mechanism in the United States in 1982 and might face additional forms of scrutiny and attack in the future. But the second is a series of moves that the court makes that I think are going to become increasingly important for the lower courts as they move forward, which is to describe what the court says are the usual burdens of voting. That is, the court says we look at what the usual burdens of voting are, Voting is not a costless thing. You have to get up and do something. You have to fill in a ballot. You have to fill in a request. And the court is recognizing that there are some burdens that simply we have to overcome as members who participate in a democratic society. I think to the extent that the court looks at both the usual, usual methods of voting, usual burdens of voting, coupled with how it describes the fact how this opportunity fits into the larger statutory scheme, it's going to make it a lot more challenging for plaintiffs to challenge these statutes under the Voting Rights Act. Because as the court points out in, uh, repeatedly in the opinion, uh, voting in Arizona is easy, all things considered. There's extensive absentee voting. There's extensive in-person voting. There are ample opportunities to participate in the political process. And so seizing on a couple of isolated provisions of the code are not going to be enough to trigger concerns under the Voting Rights Act. And so that was this challenge. Now, okay, these challenges under the Voting Rights Act are pretty novel. They, they really arose in the last eight years. So it's not clear how much this changes this, the, the litigation landscape compared to the baseline a handful of years ago. Well, that was a time where the Voting Rights Act also had Section 5. But it's worth briefly, as I conclude, sort of reflecting on some recent challenges that all plaintiffs have had raising claims before the Supreme Court. You can go back to Bush versus Gore and say, Gore, as the plaintiff in Florida, lost that case before the United States Supreme Court. But there are other cases. In 2006, it issued a decision in Purcell versus Gonzalez saying, Ninth Circuit, you shouldn't be changing Arizona's proof of citizenship requirements so cl close in time to the election. Plaintiffs lose. In 2020, Democrats challenged the 
the, the, the deadlines for voting in Wisconsin during the pandemic, the Supreme Court in one of its infamous shadow docket decisions said, lower court, you were wrong in extending the deadline at this point in time. 2008, it issued a decision in Crawford saying plaintiffs who challenged Indiana's voter identification law lost. Uh, in 2015, uh, Republicans challenged Arizona's independent state or independent redistricting commission. Plaintiffs lost. In 2016, plaintiffs challenged Texas's redistricting system about whether or not non-citizens should be included in, redis in, when, in redistricting decisions in Evanwell versus Abbott. They lost. In 2019, plaintiffs challenged partisan gerrymandering decisions made in the state of North Carolina, Rucho versus Common Cause, they lost. There's more to talk about. And there's a couple places where plaintiffs win. But, but the sort of overall thrust of the Supreme Court in the last 20 years has emphatically been that the federal courts should be less involved in election litigation. And these decisions should more and more revert to the political process. The irony, of course, is that the amount of election litigation is at the highest it's ever been in the United States. And the amount of money spent on election litigation is at the highest it's ever been in the United States, which suggests that there is this sort of uh, rock and hard place of the Supreme Court less interested in hearing these cases than ever before, and plaintiffs more and more seeking out federal judicial intervention than ever before. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. That was, that was great. Oh, I'm going to take this off. Um, it is a personal pleasure uh, to introduce our final speaker, Aaron Nielsen. He is a professor at the J. Reuben Clark Law School at BYU. Um, I've admired this gentleman for years, and I've learned a great deal from him. Um, very few lawyers <clears throat> can be considered the dean of the administrative law bar. Aaron is one of these few. Um, the, the, to wit, the proof is in the pudding of all the brilliant legal minds out there. The Supreme Court appointed Aaron to argue on behalf of the FHFA in Collins v. Yellen, a major separation of powers case decided last term. So he brings a personal perspective to Collins v. Yellen. Um, I very much look forward to hearing his, about his article, which is titled, Three Views of the Administrative State, Lessons from Collin v. Collins v. Yellen. Wow, I've, I've never been called the dean of anything, so I, I'll take that. Thank you. Um, so we're going to do Collins v. Yellen, um, and it is a, let's go to the next slide, make sure, make sure this works. Here it goes. Um, as you'll see in my, my article, uh, there's actually three cases going on here. I'm not going to do all three. I'm going to focus on the second one, which is the, uh, the constitutional case. But the first one is worth $120 billion, um, so pay attention to that one as well. Um, and, but, but life is short, so we're going to focus on the second one. And I'm going to start with a little bit of um, background on the issue. And, and the issue is, what power does the president have to fire heads of federal agencies? This matters a lot for the so-called independent agencies, Federal Trade Commission, Federal Communications Commission. Um, and it's been one of the most litigated or most, most controversial constitutional question for the last two centuries. Um, so here it is. This is just the basic structure of how you can think about things. Uh, we have the executive agencies, and what makes it an executive agency is the president can fire the head. So if the president is unhappy with the secretary of state or the attorney general, um, the president can request the resignation, and if the person declines, the president can just fire and say you're out the door. Um, so most of your departments of fall within that model. Um, we also then have the independent agencies. This is the Federal Trade Commission, the Federal Reserve, the Federal Communications Commission. They often have commission in the name. Um, these are multi-member bodies. And if the president is unhappy with what they're doing, the president can't just fire them, say just you know, hit the road. Uh, instead, they have some independence. Um, then we have one, maybe two, maybe a few examples of multi-member executive agencies. Um, the American Battle Monuments Commission, I don't think most of us think about that one when we think about federal agencies, which tells you how unusual that, that setup is. And then we have a few single-headed independent agencies, the CFPB, the FHFA, the Federal Hou uh, Housing Finance Agency, which we'll talk about, Social Security, and the Office of Special Counsel. OK, so here it is. Um, the Constitution says nothing explicit about the question of if the president is unhappy with the person heading one of the agencies, 
what happens. Instead, the only way the Constitution says that you get rid of somebody is impeachment. Um, so there's four options. One option is there is no presidential removal. The only way to get rid of an attorney general or something is impeachment. Um, for the last 200 plus years, nobody has really thought that. Um, you've had a few maybe early folks, but that, that seems pretty extreme and unlikely. The other option is whenever the president wants. This is based on the vesting clause, the executive power is vested in the president, and the take care clause, the president shall take care of the laws are faithfully executed. If the president can't fire somebody who's not doing a very good job from the president's perspective, is the executive power in the president, is the, can the president take care of the laws are faithfully executed? Um, this is James Madison's view of how this is supposed to be resolved. Um, the other is like the appointments clause, but in reverse. Um, you can't um, confirm somebody without the Senate's approval. Well, how about you can't get rid of somebody without the Senate's approval? And the last option is necessary and proper clause. However, the, the Congress thinks best is the answer to this question. Um, and we've been fighting about it for more than 200 years. Um, a big case from 1926 um, is Myers v. United States. Here was a postmaster, and the question is, can the president fire a postmaster if the president doesn't think the postmaster is doing a good job? And here, in a decision written by Chief Justice Taft, former President Taft, um, one of the lengthiest decisions in the history of the Supreme Court, they say, yes, the president has a constitutional unilateral power to fire someone exercising executive power who isn't doing a very good job from the president's perspective. Um, fast forward nine years, 1935, Humphrey's executor. Uh, here you had a FTC commissioner. Um, President Roosevelt did not think that the FTC commissioner was doing a very good job. Um, relying on Myers, um, in fact, the Department of Justice told President Roosevelt this case could not be lost um, in light of Myers. Um, he fired um, the FTC commissioner, uh, who then dies and his executor sues for back pay. And the Supreme Court, in the unanimous decision, says, no, 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 no. There's a difference between a postmaster and an FTC commissioner. A postmaster, that's pure executive power. An FTC commissioner is quasi-judicial and quasi-legislative. Um, so you can't just fire the FTC. Um, then fast forward um, to the 1980s, Morrison v. Olson, a, a big important separation of powers case about the Office of um, Independent Counsel. Uh, there, there was an argument saying, well, an independent counsel, surely that is executive power. So that falls on the Myers, not the Humphreys executor side of the line. And the Supreme Court, in a lopsided 7-1 decision, says, no, 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 no. It's equally true for something like the, um, an independent counsel. The president can't just fire an independent counsel. You can have these types of independent agencies. And that's where we were. Um, the, the Supreme Court seemingly had said the final word, which is you can have the independent agencies, the independent agencies are safe. That started to change in a case called Free Enterprise Fund, uh, the Public Accounting Oversight Board. Here, um, this agency was challenged in the DC Circuit, and the difference was it was an agency that was controlled by the SEC, which itself is independent from the president. Um, so you had two levels of removal. And then on the DC Circuit, then Judge Kavanaugh um, said, well, that's unconstitutional. Um, that's not just Humphrey's executor, that's Humphrey's executor squared, um, if you add another level of removal. Um, and most people thought that argument wasn't particularly compelling. Um, it goes to the Supreme Court, and to the surprise of many, a majority of the justices say, yep, we agree, that is unconstitutional. Uh, then, uh, now Judge uh, Naomi Rao, then Professor Naomi Rao said, well, wait a minute, the same logic that you just used to say that two levels are unconstitutional would apply to one level. If the president can't control um, two levels, the president can't control one level either, um, so independent agencies should be unconstitutional. Um, well, fast forward to Sela Law last year. Um, this was the CFPB. The CFPB is a single-headed agency, tremendously powerful single-headed agency. Lots of challenges to it, including the DC Circuit. Then Judge Brett Kavanaugh says, well, this is unconstitutional because remember, we have multi-member um, agencies and single-headed agencies, and multi-headed agencies, that's FTC, okay, but a single-headed independent agency is unconstitutional, and that should fall. Again, surprising many professors, the Supreme Court took the case in a case called Say the Law and agreed with the Kavanaugh view and said the CFPB is unconstitutional um, because the president can't fire the head of the CFPB. 
Um, but in so doing, they said, well, what about the other single-headed independent agencies? The Office of Special Counsel, the Social Security Administration, and the FHFA. And it said, well, they might be different. We're not so sure. They might be different. They exercise, uh, they do not involve regulatory enforcement power remotely comparable uh, to that exercised by the CFPB. Well, then we get um, uh, the FHFA. And that's where I'm going to come into the picture here. Um, so in 2008, following the housing collapse, um, Congress enacted um, a new agency, the FHFA, um, to regulate uh, essentially Fannie and Freddie, uh, as well as a few other um, federally chartered banks. Um, and the agency is set up uh, that it's headed by a single person who the Senate confirms, but the president can only remove for cause. Um, so it's an independent agency in that sense because the president can't fire at will. Um, and there's been tremendous amount of litigation about this particular agency because as soon as the agency came into existence, it put Fannie and Freddie into conservatorships. Um, and um, so now the federal government is essentially running Fannie and Freddie. And, and then in 2012, and the, and the United States, by the way, has loaned hundreds of, of billions of dollars to Fannie and Freddie. And in 2012, as part of this agreement, uh, they essentially, um, the government calls it um, the third amendment to the agreement. The plaintiffs call it a net worth sweep. But they essentially said all the profits that Fannie and Freddie generate go to the United States Treasury. Um, so the private shareholders of Fannie and Freddie, of course, are unhappy about that, and they would like $100 billion plus back. Um, that prompts a lot of litigation, including a constitutional challenge to the FHFA, saying that you can't have a single-headed agency that's independent from the president. Um, so the position of the plaintiffs um, in, in, in this case is, this is SALA law, Humphrey's executor should be overruled, um, and we should just get rid of independent agencies altogether. There's no reason to have them unconstitutional. The Trump administration agreed on the constitutional question. Um, they didn't agree that you should pay back 100 plus billion dollars to the plaintiffs, um, but they recognized that, um, that under president, this, that this, they think that this is unconstitutional. Um, so what happens when the federal government does not defend an act of Congress is the Supreme Court appoints an amicus to defend the act of Congress. Uh, and that is where I became in. The first time in my life, I am an esquire, um, but the Supreme Court appointed me to brief and argue in defense of the Federal Housing Finance Agency. Uh, after say the law had just lost. So I had to come up with some arguments that had not just been rejected in say the law. Um, so this is what we came up with. We came up, we and me being another professor, Chris Walker at Ohio State, um, and we came up with, I thought, three pretty darn good arguments. Our first argument we came up with is, hey, this third amendment that everyone's suing about, it was actually done by an acting official. Um, we, there's been a lot of acting, so we can talk about that. They're in the news all the time. This was done by an acting official, and we made the argument the president can always just fire an acting official. They don't have tenure at all, so this entire qu question, is there's a false premise here. Um, second, uh, remember they said in SALA law that the CFPB exercises significant executive power. Well, we say, this you just said it doesn't exercise significant executive power. The FHFA doesn't do so. Um, so thus, we think that there is a distinction there. And finally, we say, uh, for cause is the weakest removal protection at all. It includes insubordination. So if the head of the agency doesn't do what the president wants, the president can fire. The Supreme Court rejects all three. Um, first, they agree with me um, that you can fire an acting director at will. Um, that is a change. The Fifth Circuit disagreed on that. But they say as a matter of text and history, uh, we're right. You can fire the acting director. But they say, but after that, there's been Senate-confirmed directors since who could have withdrawn um, from the Third Amendment. Thus, we're going to reach the constitutional merits. Um, second, this is the, the, the important stuff. Um, there is no significant executive power test. No matter how much authority an agency wields, whether it be a lot like the CFPB or a little like the FHFA, arguably, um, that's enough. You can still fire. The president can still fire. Conservatorship, we said that's not even executive power. Um, they said whether that's executive power or not, um, we think that it is. This is an ordinary conservatorship, so that still counts. Um, and we say, but this is not even like a private right. All they're doing is regulating other government entities. Um, so there's not like anybody coercive power. They're not like the CFPB saying you can't do your work. Um, instead, they're just saying like we're not going to uh, you know allow Fannie and Freddie, which are essentially government entities anyway. And they said that doesn't matter. Ordinary Americans, that, that that's not the test. The test is whether or not it would be it falls within the executive branch. Um, 
And then finally, they say that even if the president can fire the head for insubordination, so in other words, um, even if there isn't policy discretion outside of the president, if it's not pure at will, that is unconstitutional as well. That, I think, is the most expansive holding on the Supreme Court on executive power since 1926, uh, maybe even more so, because a lot of um, Myers was dicta. This is a holding of the court. Um, and the remedy, though, they say you don't get $100, million, $100 billion back. Um, instead, we're just going to say that it's void, um, the, the for-cause removal protection, unless you can show that it actually mattered in the real world, which is now being remanded. Justices Kagan and Thomas say, and by the way, you're probably not going to be able to make that showing. Um, so where we are, here is the future. Um, executive agencies, we're still going to have those. Multi-member, I guess we'll have the American Battle Monuments Commission. Um, you know, if, if I have any commissioners out there, I apologize. I'm sure it's a very, very important agency. Um, but what do we do about these independent, single-headed agencies? Well, as soon as the Supreme Court decided this, uh, President Biden fired the head of the FHFA. Several weeks later, he fired the head of the Social Security Administration. Special counsel, we'll see if that's going to be future litigation, but it's at risk. The bigger question is, what does this mean for the FTC? How can you possibly reconcile, say, the law and Collins uh, with Humphrey's executor? We will see. Um, that's going to be the next big question, is whether they overrule the multi-member commissions. Um, and the last one I want to just throw out here, the last slide, is we warned, well, how far are you really going to go with this Supreme Court? Um, what about the, um, the civil service? What about the heads of multi-member agencies that have their own authority? What, what is a civil service? What power does an FBI wield if not the executive power? Um, does that mean that the president can fire all of them as well? To which the Supreme Court said, uh, none of these agencies is before us, and we do not comment on the constitutionality of any removal restrictions that applies to their officers. Um, I suspect that is not giving a lot of people comfort um, of where the Supreme Court is taking this. And that is Collins um, in 10 minutes. There we go. All right. Excellent stuff. All right, so we're going to be operating the same Q&A structure that has been at every panel thus far. So, I mean, I think we all remember that. I am going to exercise the moderator's privilege with an opening question, um, and it, I'm going to uh, start where Aaron left right off. And, and he, he can be the first person to answer, but it's very possible our other panelists uh, will want to weigh in as well. And that is uh, Jeepers Creepers, uh, the Supreme Court in Collins v. Yellen and in other cases over the last decade, sure rhetorically is casting a great deal of doubt on the reasoning behind Humphrey's executor, which as Aaron said, is the sine qua non, is the basis of, of all these uh, independent agencies, SEC, FTC, FERC, CFTC. So my question is, um, I know it's a fool's errand to prognosticate the Supreme Court, but nevertheless, do you think it's possible Humphrey's executor is in play? They could nix it? Yeah, I, I think it's very much possible that the Supreme Court could nix Humphrey's executor. Um, there's the, I mean, the stare decisis there, which has not been true for these others. Um, but if you read Sela Law, they have a footnote where they describe the holding in Humphrey's executor. And I'm not sure it even applies to today's FTC. Um, they said this, this agency was an aid to Congress. Um, it, does not, it did not wield rulemaking authority. Well, the FTC wields rulemaking authority um, right now. So we'll see how that plays out. But um, my guess for what it is worth is um, before the Chief Justice leaves the court, uh, Humphrey's executor will be no more. Aaron, <clears throat> why do you think Scalia's Morrison Center has not been cited? I don't think it was cited in seal of law, and I don't think it was cited in Yellen either. It just seems like this canonical statement against Humphreys, and they just haven't even cited it. So uh, th that's an interesting question, and I suspect it's because um, the people who have been, been writing, um, these are folks that, so there's a generation of, of younger conservative um, who grew up you know, reading the Scalia dissent in Morrison, um, and you see that in Kavanaugh and Gorsuch, where they say this is like the greatest dissent that's ever been written, and, and so on. Uh, the folks that are writing these cases at the Supreme Court are Roberts and now Justice Alito writes Collins. And I think they see themselves more as contemporaries with Scalia rather than the generation that Scalia influenced. Um, so I don't think that it has the same um, punch with them. It's not like, oh, wow, that was the thing I read in law school that made me get interested in separation of powers. I, 
I'm pretty sure they're thinking like, no, we were thinking that stuff you know, before at the same time or, or before he was ever thinking about it. So I just think that's, that's why, but, but I don't know for sure. It could just be the, the age of the people writing the opinions. Derek, uh, John, do you have anything, anything further to say about the possibility? Uh, I, wanted to ask, I wanted to ask a different question. How did you come up with your, your argument? I know Chris well, I know you well. How did you come up with the argument? It's, it's a very creative argument. You know, what was your thought process that's actually useful to, as an amicus? To, so just, how did you do it? You had a free reign. You had no client. You were your client. It, it is unusual. I've never had a case where I didn't have a client. Um, and <laughs> usually, um, clients, are, they're very useful. Um, <laughs> because, uh, they, because sometimes a client, you don't always want to win a certain, a certain way, a certain argument is not always an argument worth winning on. Um, so it constraints in what you can do. Here we didn't have such constraints. We really just tried to find the best possible arguments that we could offer to them that were different that they hadn't seen before. Um, so we just kind of read it. Um, you know, I thought that um, the conservatorship argument was, was fairly clever um, to say that, well, conservatorship is, is something that private people have been doing for centuries. Um, you know, see Britney Spears. Um, <laughs> so how can that possibly be executive power if that's something that ordinary people have been doing outside of the, the federal government forever? Um, and the court says, yeah, we're not going to decide that bigger question because this is not a typical conservatorship, which, which is fair. Um, but that was part of how that worked is we're just like, let's just kind of be creative and think first principles. So we went back and we read <laughs> everything under the sun. Um, that you could, you know, necessity is the mother of invention a little bit. Um, so we try to come up with things that just struck us as different and new. Um, and none of them won, so I guess we can say we weren't great at it. Um, no. But, but that, was, that was the basis of the argument. At this point, though, this court had to reject every single one of these arguments. That's why I say my, this case is probably Myers or even beforehand, because they actually went through and made holdings about all of these points. Um, Public right versus private right doesn't seem to matter. Um, small amount or large amount doesn't seem to matter. Um, the president can fire for insubordination. It doesn't matter. And there's a holding of the court for each of those propositions. Stuff. The, with that, we will uh, turn it to audience questions. So please, I see a gentleman raising his hand over there. Uh, Nived, would you please, the gentleman in the fourth row? And uh, please remember to, or I think we remember your name, but uh, just again, uh, affiliation and name. Oh, <laughs> we appreciate that. Hi, I'm uh, Pat Spann, of retired military. And I must admit, I'm a little upset that uh, Mr. Nelson, uh, Professor Nelson, uh, poo-pooed the American, uh, was it the Memorial Society? Because my alma mater's board of directors are being fired, I mean, uh, board, um, the visiting board of directors, board of visitors, I'll get it right eventually, from my alma mater in college, are being fired by good old Biden because allegedly, according to the spokesman, they don't agree with his philosophies. And I'm talking about the um, academy, West Point, and the, the three academies or four academies, whatever, they're all, but the board of directors are being fired. They're supposedly on a three year term. And I'm, I'm glad to see several of them are saying, telling Biden to screw himself and are um, not leaving. So I wondered, what did, what did you envision the, the outcome of, because uh, you also did it to the um, memorial group, I think that's, there's a bunch, bunch of executive um, uh, board of directors, a board of visitors type things, advisory, they don't do anything but I guess advise. And he decided he doesn't like them because Trump had appointed them to three year terms and so now he's firing them. And I'm wondering, there, and there, several of them are, uh, um, like Conley, refusing to leave. And uh, guys like General McMaster, for God's sakes. And I'm wondering, what do you think the likelihood that they'll be able to stay for their three years? So I confess, I have not read the specific statute at issue there. So I'd like to know first, what, what if there is any tenure provision, there's a term of, term of years, but that's not itself a tenure provision, protection. Um, if, I mean, after Collins, um, the court says that unless Congress expressly creates a tenure protection, the court isn't going to read one in. Um, so you, you can blame me for that one too. Um, 
So I suspect that the answer is um, if there's not something express, um, then they're probably not going to win. If there is something express, then the question is going to be, are they exercising executive power? Um, and that would be a, 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 you know, a statute-specific inquiry. Um, but if it ever gets to the Supreme Court, I think they would be hard-pressed to win because the Supreme Court, I think, has pretty strongly taken the view that the president can fire those within the executive branch. So if they're within the executive branch, um, I, I think it's an uphill climb. Excellent. The, uh, I, I will just add very brief two cents, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but these cases have been very rarely litigated over the last 80 odd years, these removal protection cases. And there's been such flux at the Supreme Court, and now we've got Biden sort of leveraging it to the hilt where we might get more controversies that actually elucidate the law. So, I mean, it's, it's potentially something in the future. Um, another audience question, uh, I believe, uh, uh, Adam, I think you were next. I've Hi, yes, Adam. Uh, <laughs> Scalia Law. Um, so this question is for Aaron, um, and it's it's so um, there's a, there there was also another case this past term, Arthrex, that involved the appointments clause issue, and it does seem the Supreme Court seems to be very interested in this. I mean, this isn't the first appointment clause issue; it goes back to Lucia of the SEC. So they're they're very interested both in kind of the appointments of the appointment of, of people in the administrative state and the removal in the administrative state and um, and they've been developing a lot of case law on this um, which at least at a formal level looks like they're imposing restrictions on the administrative state both kind of in removal and an appointments level like you know in the appointments context they're like yes this violates the appointments clause and things of the sort and the same with Lucia. But at the same time, Leviathan continues to grow and do all the things that it's doing. So this really, it's starting to strike me. I got very excited about Lucia and Arthrex and other cases, but it's really, just, it sounds a lot like just kind of like moving the deck chairs on the Titanic while the administrative state is just moving along, right, and, and sinking our, our, our state. Um, so do you have any, I mean, what's the, we're, we're, I mean, I, I could not see the U.S. Supreme Court saying, that, you know, yeah, the, the, you know, X, Humphrey's executor is out and therefore these, all these independent agencies fall. <laughs> so where do you see the end game in this? I mean, if we're interested in limited government and rolling back the administrative state, is it really makes sense to be putting all, you know, all this effort on appointments clause and removal issues? Yeah, so there's multiple issues coming up at multiple fronts um, at the Supreme Court. Um, and this one by itself isn't, ne isn't necessarily anti-regulatory or pro-regulatory either way. It can be anti-regulatory in an administration that wants to use regulatory power less because they can control the, the independent agent. By the way, by say Humphrey's executive falls, that doesn't mean like the FCC will cease to exist. Um, there will still be an FCC. Um, it would just be that the president has control over over what it does. Um, so it wouldn't be like, you know, let's close the door on the FTC. Like, it just means that the president could fire the head of the FTC, so they're more likely to follow presidential priorities. Um, so for, you know, deregulatory presidents, they would do less. Um, for pro-regulatory, they would do more. That's one part of the thing. In that sense, I can see you're saying, like, well, how does that work? There's other things happening right now, too. Um, just not this case. So you get the challenges to Chevron deference, um, which the Supreme Court is chipping away at. It's notable that there isn't a, uh, no one's giving a talk on Chevron right now because the Supreme Court isn't citing Chevron um, right now. So you can kind of reverse engineer, um, say if you are litigating and your argument is going to depend on Chevron, you're probably not gonna have a hospitable court waiting for you at the end of the day. That is restricting the power of, of what agencies can do. Um, Likewise, we just saw, um, you know, several weeks ago on the nationwide eviction moratoria, um, that was a substantive constraint on what agencies can do. The court says that unless Congress expressly gives a really big power, uh, we're not going to read it, we're not going to infer it. That's a Chevron-ish issue, that's a non-delegation-ish type issue. That's a substantive thing uh, that will, you know, in theory constrain regulatory power. Um, but this line of separation of powers cases doesn't fit within that. I think it's, it's, it's just a different type of issue. And the courts, I really think, um, you know, I've, I've never asked the chief justice this or whatever, but I think if you ask him, like, 
why are you doing this? I think you say because it's we think it's right. Um, we think that this is this isn't strategic in that sense of whatever. We're doing this because we think that this is what Article Two of the Constitution means. And it's a pretty fundamental question, um, and the president has to ha there has to be electoral accountability for for what agencies do. Um, so that's my sense going on. So I think you're talking about other lines of of cases coming up. But this particular one, it's neither pro or anti-regulatory. It's just a question of accountability. And sometimes, you know, presidents will say, actually, we want to be really pro-aggressive. Like, again, the President Biden just fired the head of the SSA. Um, you know, I suspect that they're going to have different priorities than the Trump administration would have had on that kind of question. And I would uh, pr much prefer uh, Aaron has monopolized the yeah. question so far. So it's if we've got one for Derek or Aaron's Josh. Aaron's doing a great job. What are you talking about? <laughs> indeed he is. Indeed he is. He's our uh, amicus. Ilya, was yours? <laughs> My question's for Derek. Um, I think if we were in any other uh, institution in D.C., he'd be getting all the questions rather than Aaron. <laughs> arguably the most controversial case uh, of the term. Um, what uh, impact do you think uh, Brnovich is going to have on the litigation over so-called Jim Crow 2.0? Presumably not the Justice Department's case against Georgia, because that's based on intentional discrimination, on purpose, because they could see the, what was going to come in Brnovich, but uh, other you know, short-term uh, section two litigation. Yeah, it's great. It's um, so there, there's obviously litigation happening right now in Iowa, in Texas, uh, Florida, um, other litigation in Georgia. There are five or six or seven lawsuits in each of these states. I mean, it, it is everywhere. And sometimes it's challenging section two. Sometimes it's using something we call Anderson verdict balancing, which is kind of an ad hoc balancing test to examine uh, the scope of of uh, election uh, rules and the impact they have on voters. Um, so the sense is, right, the mood from the Supreme Court here, can I use an administrative law? The mood from the Supreme Court here is, is really, you know, skepticism of, of these kinds of challenges coming up. And I think pointing out the usual burdens of voting to say that many of these rules, you know, Harris County, Texas no longer has 24-hour voting, which happened once in the history of the state of Texas, you know. Uh, Georgia is no longer going to mail every person in this state an absentee ballot application, which has happened once in the history of the state of Georgia, right? So there are these provisions that are being challenged that are novel pandemic-related measures that are being trimmed back. And when you look at those in isolation, the court invites you to look at them, not in isolation, but in terms of the context of how the other opportunities are available. You know, I think many of these are gonna face an uphill battle in terms of, of, of winning. Um, now, again, we mentioned section two of the Voting Rights Act is sort of specific to Brnovich. But this language, I, I anticipated having a pretty significant and outsized impact in other, uh, other litigation, the Anderson Burdick framework and other kinds of challenges to election laws. Because this, this language from the court actually draws from Crawford, a voter identification case, which is an Anderson Burdick case. So we talk about it in the, in the, in the election law industry. <laughs> and, and it really is sort of bringing together and merging some of these standards to say, regardless of the fear, under the Voting Rights Act, undoubtedly, the burden is not just on voters as a whole, but on racial minorities, or particularly racial, particular racial groups that, that might be disproportionately affected by a law. But to the extent that we're looking at these burdens that are being placed around the country, uh, the courts, I think, are invited to say that these are pretty novel or nominal restrictions. And in most cases, you know, and, and I might, you know, in the back of my head, I think of one or two that might be more successful. Most cases, these, these laws are going to stand. Now, that's not to say that a district court somewhere isn't going to find or enjoin some of these things. It'll have to go up on appeal, and we'll see what happens after that. Um, but my anticipation is most of these laws are, are, are pretty marginal in their impact and will likely survive judicial scrutiny. Take Just, um, I'm, I'm going to exercise being your boss prerogative. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Trump's moderated prerogative. Uh, uh, just for, because most of our audience is, is not lawyers, let alone election lawyers, could you just explain what Anderson Burdick sure. balancing is? Yeah, so in the 1960s, the court determined that we should start reviewing um, neutral election laws in terms of the effect that they have on the voter, voters and thinking about the state's interest placed up against the burden that it places on voters. The notion is that there's this right to associate. Voters are voting on the ballot with, for a candidate, and that's this associational freedom at stake. And the court in the 60s and 70s to, begins to develop a series of cases to think about this as a balancing test. Um, so the 19, you know, the, the, the cases we use are Anderson versus Celebrezzi involving John Anderson's campaign in Ohio, where he was kept off the ballot uh, as a, as a 
ballot restriction that was too onerous, and Burdick versus Takushi, a, a, a law in Hawaii that prohibited write-in candidates from having their votes counted on the ballot. And the court has largely said, you know, we look at this, if it's a, a relatively light burden, then the state's usual regulatory interest is going to be sufficient to allow the law to survive. Whereas if it's a substantial or significant burden, the state has to have a much weightier justification in order for the law to apply. Um, you know, again, uh, Judge Chad Riedler on the Sixth Circuit has written a lot of, I think, really important separate opinions in the last year critiquing this, uh, this kind of framework to say it's a really... <laughs> It's really difficult sort of ad hoc thing for judges to do, right? How heavy is the burden? How significant is the state's interest? Um, but, you know, that was at issue in Crawford where the Supreme Court approved a voter identification law. Um, and now that the courts are being invited to look not just at one law, but look at it in the system of laws and the available opportunities you have, and I think it really is making it more difficult for plaintiffs to win these kinds of challenges. But time will tell. Excellent. Another uh, uh, audience question right back there. Derek, staying with you for a moment. So the Supreme Court and the circuit courts have shown that they really want to sidestep all this election litigation. However, the state Supreme Courts are not, several of them are not shy in interjecting themselves into the role of the legislature. I'm thinking of Pennsylvania in particular. Where do you think that's going to go in the coming years? Go in a lot of different directions. Uh, I'll offer a couple of thoughts. So one is, you know, state courts often have much looser standing grounds, the opportunity for plaintiffs to sue in state court in the first place, including, um, you know, basically generalized standing. If you're a voter, you can challenge something. Um, so that's a reason why state courts have become an attractive forum. Uh, another is a, a little bit of forum shopping. So I, I can come from Iowa. Um, the Eighth Circuit is uh, a relatively conservative circuit, if you will, compared to others. So there's been lots of movement to try to move election law cases into the state court system over the federal court system. Um, and undoubtedly, the state courts each, or the state constitutions have their own provisions that often include some kind of affirmative right to vote or something that's construed as an affirmative right to vote. And for many states, they will lockstep. They will sort of say, well, whatever burdens are appropriate in the federal courts for federal constitutional rights and the federal right to vote, we're going to say it's the same sort of interest on the state side. But, you know, a, a diverse array of, of perspectives from uh, William Brennan to Jeff Sutton have said we should really be reinvigorating state constitutions as standing on their own two feet, and we should be interpreting state constitutions in a particular way about how to empower sort of voting rights for litigants in these cases. Um, all that is up against sort of the background, which you allude to in Pennsylvania, about especially when it comes to federal elections, it is incumbent on the legislature of the state to dictate the rules for elections, the times, places, and manner of holding elections, subject to oversight by Congress. And um, you know, it hasn't gotten a lot of traction in the courts since Bush versus Gore, but there's been a little bit of movement to say legislature means legislature. And if the state Supreme Court is developing a new rule, and we have to spend some time about when it's construing an existing rule versus developing a new rule, when it develops a new rule to usurp the legislative rule. Um, so that's an issue lingering out there. The Supreme Court had an opportunity to take that case. Uh, as it often does, it determines that it's moot. It waits a long time. <laughs> the case moots itself, and it doesn't weigh in on the issue that arose in Pennsylvania in particular. Um, but it would not surprise me to see a lot of these cases moving into state courts. Um, and maybe that's what we expect. Partisan gerrymandering claims are basically foreclosed in the federal courts. They're now moving to the state courts. And that's what Pennsylvania did. Uh, and the Pennsylvania Supreme Court found that the state map was an unconstitutional gerrymander. Um, so there are I think going to be increasing opportunities for state litigation, for robust state constitutional law, and to be thinking about these. And, and, and the vision is either this is the best of federalism, it's 50 states sort of approaching things in 50 different ways, uh, and laboratories of democracy, all that. Or, you know, we think that there are some certain federal floors for conservatives thinking about the legislature has a role defined by the Constitution, for progressives to say the Voting Rights Act and other federal laws should have a more important overlay on what the states are doing. Um, and we'll see if those come to a head if Congress chooses to enact more legislation in the future. Excellent. Um, this gentleman, you, you've been raising your hand. You've been so patient. So, Devin, could we please? And please remember to state your name and affiliation. David Sobelson, Press Associates International. Um, if uh, all Section 2 Voting Rights Act, Act challenges will lead to an a examination of the overall political access in the state, 
And if overall political access in almost every state is somewhat broader today than it was in 1982, then I have to agree with you that it's very unlikely any Section 2 challenge will ever survive again at the Supreme Court, at least in this Supreme Court. I have two questions, though, about Arizona. Um, and one is, does the Arizona statute permit uh, caretakers or family members to then turn the ballot over to some more general entity to deliver the actual ballot? And if not, how do you anticipate that Native Americans who have no car, who live on reservations that are hundreds of miles away from the nearing polling place, are going to actually exercise their right to vote in the future? Yeah, so um, in terms of the, the boots on the ground facts, especially for tribal reservations in Arizona, because I think that was one of the, 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 the most significant sticking points and one of the reasons uh, I believe is the Navajo Nation joined as plaintiffs in the DNC lawsuit at the trial court level. Um, you know, Arizona has long had a ban on third parties delivering ballots that were un incomplete, uncompleted to individuals. It could only come through a postal worker or something like that. And so one thing that the lower court, again, the trial court took on a lot of evidence and found that, listen, if this prohibition has already been in place for an extended period of time, if it's already prohibited and you give, have finding a third party to collect the ballot and get it to you, you're getting the ballot somehow on the reservation. And therefore, whatever burden there is in sending it back is relatively marginal once we look at the existing statutory landscape. Now, maybe the thought is, well, maybe I should have gone bigger. Maybe I should have challenged the third party delivery as well as the third party collection. Um, but I think we, when we think about caretakers or family members or whoever it might be, um, undoubtedly, the tribal reservations are the places where, where facts on the ground are, where the records are being developed to try to challenge statutes like this. Um, in this case, the district court held a 10 day trial and took a lot of evidence, found the evidence anecdotal at best, and that there wasn't enough sort of statistical evidence to demonstrate it. To the original premise you raised, it, it's true to think about voting opportunities today and compared to 1982. It's worth emphasizing that's one factor, right? There's, the court gives five guideposts. If we can say, well, it's not really that much of a burden compared to 1982, but it dramatically affects black voters and white voters differently, right? The margin is significant in how it affects these voters. That would be enough to sort of weigh as a different factor on the other side. And so to the extent that um, Native American plaintiffs in the future are able to identify with a, with a better record developed below, you know, they're going to have more opportunities to, to succeed on challenges like that in the future. Excellent. Uh, last, well, we've got a minute 55. Devin, do you think you can make it a super quick question? Please, we'll try to. I wanted to uh, ask about the kind of next domino that I see concerning the presidential control. Um, as the court has allowed more presidential control over administrative law judges and things like that, do you see that as potentially raising substantial due process problems that might force such judges to be controlled as federal magistrates as part of an Article Three court rather than part of the executive branch controlled by the president? So that's actually a really, really hard question. Um, so the question, here's the problem. Uh, within the executive branch, you have lots of folks that apply a lot of facts, adjudicators. So in the Social Security Administration, there's all sorts of administrative law judges. And the question is, well, they're all in the executive branch and they're exercising executive power. So does that mean the president can fire all of them or threaten to fire them? Well, how is that going to affect how they, their, impar their partiality, right? Are they going to be fair to the folks in front of them if they're afraid that their decision is going to cause them to be fired? And I'm not quite sure how that's going to work out. Um, I mean, if you're even a Myers, um, Chief Justice Taft struggles with that particular uh, problem. So I think we're going to see some litigation on that. For what it is worth, uh, Chris Walker and I are working on a solution to that problem, um, but we're not quite ready to, to, to share it with the world yet. So um, wait and see, um, but, but we're thinking about it. Perfect response. Ten seconds left. The, uh, um, I, with that, you know, like the Supreme Court, they ignored the uh, inseverability provision, so it's familiar. All right, nice. <laughs> and you, you fit that in before we're done. Um, well, with that, please join me in thanking our panelists. I thought that was great. Yeah.
And uh, we're actually taking a 15 minute break right now. Um, but refreshments are available on the first floor and we got restrooms in this level to the left of the elevators and also on the level above us. Uh, nice.
one where we will be all sitting and talking about what's coming in the future term. Let me assure you, nothing big, nothing very controversial. It'll all be fine. DC won't burn to the ground. It'll all be fine. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to introduce the panelists. Uh, to my right is Amy Howe, who wrote the article for the review, the Looking Ahead article, which I commend to you, as I do the entire review. Uh, until September 2016, she served as the editor and a reporter for SCOTUS blog, which I hope you have heard of. Um, and she continues to serve as an independent contractor and reporter for SCOTUS blog. She primarily writes for her eponymous blog, How on the Court. Before turning to full-time blogging, she served as counsel in over two dozen merits cases at the Supreme Court and argued two cases there. She is currently occupying the Tom Goldstein seat on this panel, which is fitting. Uh, Tom, I think this is the first time in about six years Tom hasn't been on this. He's either in Venice or the Venetian. I can't remember which one. Um, <laughs> on the far side there is Eric Jaffe. Uh, he has been involved in appeals on a broad range of legal issues, including First Amendment challenges to campaign finance reform, Commerce Clause challenges to health care reform, and other federal legislation. He clerked for Doug Ginsburg on the D.C. Circuit and Clarence Thomas on the Supreme Court. And to my immediately left is Sarah Harris, partner Ed Williams and Connolly. She's a client to the high stakes appeals at the U.S. Supreme Court and federal and state appellate courts across the country. She has argued twice before the Supreme Court, prevailing in both cases, and presented many arguments in federal courts of appeals and state courts of appeals. She clerked for Clarence Thomas on the Supreme Court, Lawrence Silverman on the D.C. Circuit, received her undergraduate degree from Princeton, her J.D. Madden Cum Laude from Harvard, and she also has a it's a fact I told her I like, a PhD and an MPhil from the University of Cambridge. If I wasn't here speaking to you, I'd be a philosophy professor right now, so. <laughs> well, please welcome the panel. <clears throat> now, we're gonna start off with Amy, just to give us sort of an overview of what she wrote in her article and the cases that she covered, which are, to, so, let us say, that the blockbusters, so, so, so to speak. Yeah. Sure, uh, thanks so much for having me, inviting me to write the article. Um, happy Constitution Day. It's also Justice Souter's 82nd birthday today. Um, I sort of have him frozen in my mind when he retired, so it was kind of a shock to realize he was oh, really? okay. 82, but we can all raise an apple and a yogurt in his honor <laughs> um, tonight. Um, last term, which we just spent most of the day sort of talking about, was really unprecedented in the sense that it was entirely remote. Uh, it was the first term with since Justice Ginsburg passed away. And the court shifted to the right, and the court has now has on its docket for the upcoming term a handful of, from the press corps' perspective, at least really sort of juicy cases involving abortion, guns, uh, religion, potentially affirmative action. And so I think the real question is not whether or not the court is going to continue to shift to the right, but how far it will shift to the right, and you know, presumably the answer lies in, at least in part with, with Chief Justice John Roberts, not necessarily because he, his vote makes a difference anymore, but you know, whether or not he has any influence on the court. And so that's something I imagine we can discuss and we will see uh, quite soon. Um, I'd also like to touch a little bit on the so-called shadow docket. Uh, the article was due, the draft of the article was due on August 1st. It's a wonderfully smooth editing process, but the one downside is you don't get to add to it. And so in August, in the first part of September, there were a lot of developments on the shadow docket that I think we'd probably like to talk about, including because they, some of them are going to be showing up on the merits docket. But just to talk a little bit about some of the, the really juicy cases that are going to be at the court this term, um, as many of you are no doubt aware, during the 2016 campaign, Donald Trump promised to appoint justices who would overrule Roe versus Wade. He said he would appoint conservative justices. It would happen automatically. He appointed three justices, Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett. And so now is the time to see whether or not that promise will come true. The court is probably in December. We'll hear oral argument in a case called Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, which is a challenge to the constitutionality of a Mississippi law that bans almost all abortions after the 15th week of pregnancy. So under Planned Parenthood versus Casey and Roe versus Wade, woman has a constitutional right right now to an abortion up to the point at which a fetus becomes viable, which is somewhere around 22 to 24 weeks of pregnancy. So the US Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit 
uh, struck down the law, said it was unconstitutional under Roe and Casey. This, and I think this is an important point. The state came to the Supreme Court asking the Supreme Court to weigh in. The Supreme Court uh, told the Supreme Court in its petition for review, you don't have to rule on Roe and Casey and whether or not they should be overruled. You just need to weigh in on the constitutionality of this law. Um, the Supreme Court agreed to take it up after relisting the case something like 15 times and will now hear argument in all likelihood in December. Meanwhile, as you are no doubt aware, if you've been watching the news at all in the last month or so, the Supreme Court, uh, I guess it was about two weeks ago now, it all goes by so quickly, agreed um, on the so-called shadow docket, the Supreme Court refused to step in and block SB 8, the Texas abortion bill, which bans virtually all abortions after six weeks in pregnancy from going into effect. And uh, this was a, an order that came out about a paragraph and a half. The justices in the majority in that case made clear that they, there were, they said there were serious questions about whether or not the law was constitution, constitutional, uh, but they were, nonetheless were not going to step in and block it from going into effect. The Chief Justice John Roberts and the court's three liberal justices dissented from that order. So on the one hand, the court said that they were not, they were not weighing in on, on the constitutionality of SB 8. But on the other hand, right now in Texas, uh, until the, that law is settled, there's no right for a woman to get an abortion. Um, so that is abortion. The next. Uh, the next case that is going to be argued in November that I wanted to talk about is a case called New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin. Um, back in 2008, 2010, the Supreme Court ruled in District of Columbia versus Heller and McDonald versus City of Chicago that you have a right to have a handgun in your home for self-defense. Um, gun rights supporters came to the Supreme Court many times over the next 10 years or so, asking the Supreme Court to say more about the scope of that right. The Supreme Court repeatedly turned down requests to do so. Um, back in 2019, the Supreme Court finally took up a new case out of New York City involving a New York City rule that banned the owners of licensed handguns in New York City from taking the handguns outside of New York, even to go to a shooting range or to their vacation homes, just to give you two examples. Um, New York City, perhaps recognizing that this law was not likely to succeed in the Supreme Court, changed the rule. So much of the argument at the Supreme Court in December of 2019 was whether or not the law was constitutional, uh, whether or not the law was, the case was moot. Um, the Supreme Court finally in April of 2020, a majority agreed that it was moot. Uh, three justices dissented from that decision. Um, a fourth justice, Brett Kavanaugh, concurred in the decision that it was moot, but suggested that perhaps the Supreme Court should take up one of the 10 or so petitions for review that had been on hold for the last several months pending the court's decision in the New York case so that they could weigh in on the scope of the Second Amendment. The Supreme Court promptly put all of those cases back up for conference, relisted them something like 10 times, uh, indicating that there was something going on behind the scenes and that perhaps they were considering them, and then denied them all. Um, again, we don't know what was going on behind the scenes. The conventional wisdom in the press room was that there were certainly four votes to grant review in one of those cases involving the right to carry a concealed weapon um, but we don't know, um, but that perhaps that they weren't sure whether or not there was a fifth vote, the vote of the Chief Justice John Roberts to grant review. So then you fast forward to 2021, um, Justice Amy Coney Barrett, who had written a, a dissent while she was on the Seventh Circuit, suggesting that she would be more receptive to the argument that the gun rights supporters were making uh, now on the court, and the court agreed to take up this new New York case, new New York State Rifle and Pistol Association. Um, it's a challenge to New York's concealed carry regime under which you have to show a special need uh, a, beyond sort of just a general need, general desire to have a gun when you go, are out and about for self-defense. You have to show a real need to have one. Um, and so the court will hear argument in that case in November. Um, the next case that I wanted to talk about is a case called Carson versus, is, does anybody know, is it Macon or Macon? I think it's Macon. Is it Macon? Yes. Um, 
So back in 2020 in Espinoza versus Montana Department of Revenue, the Supreme Court by a vote of five to four um, ruled that Montana's exclusion of religious schools from a state tuition aid program uh, that provided scholarships to attend private schools as long as uh, they weren't religious schools discriminated against religious schools based on their religious status violated the Constitution. And so this is, involves discrimination, allegations of discrimination based on religious use. Um, the case comes to the court from Maine, which has kind of an unusual system for uh, secondary schools because many parts of the state are quite rural. The, the state's constitution allows uh, and laws allows states that uh, school districts that don't operate their own high schools to make arrangements for their students to attend other high schools, either other public high schools, by sending them directly there, by paying tuition for them to attend those public high schools, or by paying tuition for them to attend private high schools. And so a group of parents are arguing that being able to, not being able to use these tuition funds to attend private schools because the private schools are going to be using the funds for religious instruction uh, violates the Constitution. So I think those are the... Those are good the, to start the, with. It's I good think. to start. Yeah. Um, um, I don't want to drone on for too long. No, I'm not going to put anyone on the spot, especially on a question like, if, if you do, don't have any opinions on the abortion case, for example, you can say pass. But, but we could start it with that since Amy did. Um, in terms of what's going on. Well, actually, the interesting question I have is, realistically, is there any way, maybe it's not this case or the Texas case, can the court avoid Roe in the next three years? I mean, they can avoid anything. They're pretty good. Can, can they avoid a, a challenge that does not allow them to duck whether or not to overrule Roe, especially given what states are doing, too? I mean, I wouldn't underestimate the court's interest in brokering compromises that will avoid formally saying that they're overruling Roe, but like reframing many components of the test. Right. And like, I think, like Casey. Yeah. 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 I mean, well, like Casey, and then, you know, you see, I think, the chief's separate opinion in June Medical, which arguably, or maybe not just arguably, but certainly reframes quite a lot of whole woman's health. Uh, and so I wouldn't underestimate the court's willingness to sort of reframe the entire test, but still say as a formal matter, Roe is the law. I mean, Roe has already been reframed, but yeah, the Casey Roe framework is still something. And of course, with the, as Amy brought up with John Roberts, uh, with, with guns and abortion on the docket, I mean, what are, what are his biggest concerns, do we think, for next term? Well, I mean, I think, I think it's interesting to juxtapose the guns and abortion cases, because there, there's so many similarities, both in how states treat those two things, Right, so those states that don't like guns will literally pass anything they can to suppress the right to keep and bear arms. Those states that don't like abortion seem equally intent on doing everything they can to suppress whatever the scope of the right is, whatever you think it ought to be. At the moment, it's a right, and they don't seem to care. Uh, so I, I think the resolution to your question may end up being some kind of readjustment of the tiers of scrutiny, because I think a lot of this is ultimately sort of the standard of review is causing these problems. The standard of review in something like Casey uh, is sort of just up in the air, whatever you feel like. And so it, it emboldens people to sort of say, well, <laughs> if, it's, if it's just a balancing test, guess what? I have a new theory and a new theory and a new theory. Sorry. And with guns, I think it's much the same thing. Intermediate scrutiny in guns is just like a balancing test, it seems like rational basis in most cases. Uh, so maybe they'll, they'll solve this problem by not overruling Roe, but by coming in with a, whether it's a, a weaker or a stronger or whatever it is, but giving it some structure so that we don't constantly have to do fact-bound cases. And I, I could see that getting some traction among, like, let's say, Kavanaugh, uh, maybe even Gorsuch, to just sort of say, hey, you know, the big leap of do whatever you want and we're out. Mm -hmm. while, while intellectually appealing, perhaps, to some on the right, uh, it seems like a big step in a short period of time. I, I have made that analogy many times because it's not only our guns and abortion, our, the culture war aspect, but the Supreme Court in both instances have, have loosely, loosely upheld a, a fundamental right that, that they have not wanted to clarify very much what that is. Um, and so 
all these states will say something like, you have to be able to run a half marathon before you get abortion, but we're just trying to make sure it's for the health of the mother and we all know what it's for. And if a state says you have to be able to pass a really complex test to get a gun, we still all know what that is for. Um, <clears throat> now for the guns case, which again, New York State Rifle and Pistol Association, rewriting the question presented, uh, I don't know if anyone followed the question. Did they rewrote the question presented? I did not. Yeah, so they rewrote it to talk about licensing and not just simple carry. So does New York State's licensing system for carrying weapons violate the Second Amendment? Well, uh, w when that originally <coughs> happened, so we have a brief in that case, and I followed that case, and the, 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 the broader view was that it was probably just to more accurately reflect what the law does. And they put in concealed carry license, a reference to concealed, I thought, because the law only deals with concealed carry, uh, the law, the, their law separately bans open carry. And one can imagine differences between open and concealed carry, but I think sort of the, the view from Second Amendment practitioners is you might be able to restrict one or the other, but you can't restrict both. So there might be good reasons to, like, to not terrify the public by carrying a gun in the middle of a subway openly and waving it around, uh, or there might be reasons not to have concealed carry because then we don't know who's armed. You could go either way on that, and I think that's arguably up to a state. But to say you can't do either, <laughs> and therefore can't carry it all, I think is the way a lot of Second Amendment practitioners would approach that. And I, I think maybe they're rewriting the question, sort of try to finesse that a little bit, and hopefully uh, some of that will come out in oral argument in the briefing, that you know, you gotta at least let one of them happen if you think it's a right at all. Otherwise, just say it's not a right. I think that's right, and it also, I think, partially explains why the court relisted so many times. And I think more broadly, when you look at the juxtap juxtaposition of the abortion case and the guns case, it sort of highlights kind of two dynamics on the court. Like one is what Amy highlighted, which is, is the chief's, are reports of the chief's waning influence overblown? And the other question is, where is Justice Barrett going to fit in on this? And I think both of those cases highlight Justice Barrett is already a very powerful effect on grants. You only need four justices to grant. You need five to win. <laughs> that always creates some sort of, of attention because you, know, you may not have four votes to grant if you think that the result will be a loss or a bad outcome on the merits. Uh, but I do think it's safe to predict that had Justice Barrett not joined the court, I don't know that either of those cases would have gotten granted. I would have been surprised, very, very surprised if they were. Uh, but I think the chief's influence is really on the merit side. I mean, I think in both of those cases, what we're talking about so far is how is the court going to potentially compromise? Are they going to try to do a grand bargain on tiers of scrutiny? Are they going to try to sort of make something, uh, a, another crack at the Roe Casey successor standard? I don't know. And then Amy has also mentioned the religion, the Carson case which is also an area where the chief, I think, is very effective or has been in the last couple of terms in cobbling together very broad majorities for narrow rules. I mean, Carson is sort of like the third crack the, in it, what we might call a trinity of cases, starting with Trinity <laughs> Lutheran, to get to one result of probably a rule of you can't discriminate against schools based on either their exercise of faith in infusing relig uh, faith in the classroom or simply their religious status. But it's, they're, they're taking like sort of almost six or seven years to get to that one ruling. I'll be really interested to see because Trinity Lutheran um, was a, a narrow decision with a broad majority. Um, Espinoza was not. I mean, Espinoza was 5-4 and this was not, you know, this is not a case in which Justice Barrett's vote is going to make, necessarily make a difference. This was, you know, the Chief Justice and the other conservatives and the four liberals on the other side, you know, talking about, and I imagine we'll talk about the shadow docket in a little more detail later on, but, you know, talking about another area in which you know, we're seeing the effect of Justice Barrett. You know, the Texas abortion law in all likelihood would not be in effect if Justice Ginsburg were still on the court because there were four votes to block it. And I, mean, I have no doubt that she would have been a fifth. Uh, so. Yeah. If I could just touch a little bit on this Please. question of, you know, Justice Barrett and the, the, the shift between grants and merits. Uh, I, I think we sometimes sort of over describe the effect that the extra justice is going to have, it's less about what the outcome is going to be than about getting to an outcome that actually does anything. So I think the fear for a very long time, if I had to guess, was not that Roberts or somebody else wouldn't vote the way you hope they would vote. It's that they'd come up with some single opinion with a quirky non-test test that 
did nothing. So why are you granting a case to do nothing other than add to the confusion? Uh, and for those who remember the O'Connor years, one might have imagined that lots of cases would have been better off not being granted than actually being decided uh, as they were. They added nothing and only, only messed it up for another 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, so maybe it's that. Maybe they think they now at least have a consensus on a theory. Uh, and that theory may come out one way, may come out the other. And I'm not fully confident that Amy Coney Barrett's going <laughs> to going to do what people expect her to do. But I, but I imagine she might be firmer on a theory uh, as opposed to sort of keeping options open kind of. It seems to me that uh, the last few months of his last term uh, show maybe showed, given the coalitions and cases like <clears throat> in, uh, in Fulton, for example, that R Roberts is strength is pretty strong. I mean, his, his ability to try and get the court to decide narrowly and, and more unanimously is maybe more strong than we thought it would be after Barrett's, or do we still not know? Is it no <clears throat> for the cert docket? Um, okay, so. <clears throat> There's that whole just, Justice Sorry. White, every time you get a new justice, it's a new court. Yeah, so. and every time we have to, every time, uh, I, I write an introduction to the Supreme Court. I use that line, and so does Leo. We're going to have to have a <laughs> coin flip of who gets to use that line, hmm. I think, in, in future pieces. Um, now, so I was just so moving on. I don't know, Sarah, if there's anything you want to highlight about cases that you're watching uh, that you've added here, or because she took the big ones at the top. Um, on big ticket stuff? Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think Amy has also mentioned the shadow docket, and now might be a good time to talk about it because a lot of the. This is an interestingly lopsided term, right? I mean, like the, the really sexy, big, controversial cases are abortion, guns, and to a lesser extent, but an important extent, Carson in the religion space. And uh, many of the other cases on the docket are very important, but not sort of like headline news every week, um, except for the shadow docket, and which is, you know, there's a lot of discussion, I think, in the meta sense of what is the shadow docket? What's the court doing? Why does the court have all these emergency stays? Why does it seem to make so many important decisions these days through the shadow docket? That's sort of one set of questions. And the other set of things is just what has the court done recently in the shadow docket? And obviously, the Texas stay is really important. Um, the COVID, all of the COVID litigation has produced some actually pretty substantively important rulings, I think, in the religious liberty space with respect to non like, sort of bolstering the idea of non-discrimination based on uh, exercise and, and status alike. And uh, also the Remain in Mexico uh, skirmishes, which is sort of the latest for a, <laughs> a holdover from the Trump administration, which was a feature of the shadow docket, is sort of the skirmishes over immigration policy you see uh, the administration would enact a policy. You'd see a district court enjoying the policy. It would get litigated all the way up to the Supreme Court in an emergency posture. And Remain in Mexico is sort of a holdover of that because now the shoe is a little bit on the other foot. And other district courts are now enjoining the Biden administration from undoing these policies. Remain in Mexico being one example uh, where the court um, allowed the Trump administration Remain in Mexico policy to proceed over the Biden administration objections. And so just sort of yet another example of a lot of important sort of policy slash sort of things that are uh, visible publicly happening on the shadow docket. Now, I'm not sure the court has much choice. A lot of these uh, cases that come up from emergency stays and nationwide injunctions are coming to the shadow docket because you can't just wait for the court you know, to take 90 to 150 days to have your cert petition filed and do all the rest of the steps and get the court to act on it fast. Uh, so the fact that there are nationwide injunctions that have obviously nationwide effects on very important policies means that I think we are going to continue to see the emergency stay docket a perennial sort of fixture so long as there are nationwide injunctions. So um, I'm not sure it's sort of the court's fault that they're doing so much on the shadow docket. It's I think it's frankly now baked into the way administrative law currently works for better or for worse. You, weigh in? you know, yeah, I... I you know, the shadow docket, I hate that phrase. I just hate that phrase. It's, it's, it's implies something nefarious, insidious, whatever. It's just nonsense. You get an application for a stay. What are you going to do about that? You're going to hold public oral argument? Somebody's about to be executed, and you get a stay application. The answer is you rule on it, and you rule on it as quickly as possible. And when you get nine cats herded together to come up with an answer, you release your order. I just don't know what the world expects from them other than do the business that comes before you, give us an answer. Now, I understand that some of these shadow, shadow cases or whatever, some of these emergency applications are leading to opinions, but
But quite frankly, I would take those opinions with a grain of salt, which is they're good for now, and they're trying to discourage people from throwing more emergencies at them if they, can, if they can help it. But at some point, those will go up on the full merits. And I'm not sure anyone's going to feel particularly bound by an emergency opinion when it gets to the merits. They'll rule on it deliberatively and with full consideration, and that'll be great. What I find interesting is I think a lot of this is coming up because people are becoming so impatient. Um, you know, you used to see abortion laws that would pass and say, this is law, but we stay the effectiveness unless and until Roe gets overruled. Mm -hmm. So that there can be a deliberate challenge to the law, there can be a deliberate consideration of the law. Now you get Texas or other states saying, but nope, goes into effect today, tomorrow, instantaneously, no matter what. Uh, you see this with some of the executive actions causing and then overruling their predecessors as we had flips in administration. Uh, if people would just sort of give the institution of the court or the respect it deserves and give them at least some time to actually be judicial about things, maybe we wouldn't have so many of these rulings. So it's bad. I, mean, I do think there are legitimate transparency issues. You know, if somebody's going to be executed, you know, it would at least be nice to know how people voted. Um, not a one, you know, a one paragraph order in the middle of the night. Um, I do think that the court has responded to some of this. You know, you saw with the abortion order, it was, there was a longer order. There were opinions, the dissenting opinions that came with it. Um, you know, and I also think, you know, some of these, obviously, if you're talking about an execution and the warrant starts at 6 p.m. and it runs until midnight, you've got to get that opinion out. But if you've been sitting on something like in the, the Roman Catholic Diocese of New York, you've been sitting on something for a week, and you release it at, you know, 10 minutes before midnight on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving? I mean, come on. Like, you know, important. You really hate that. Well, I mean, that's, that's part of my job. Yeah. Um, but, you know, at least or, issue it at a time when, like, I mean, that, that is part of the reason why it seems a little bit below board is it's not as transparent as it could be. And, and we see, like, with the spiritual advisor case that's coming up, this is a case involving an inmate's right to have a spiritual advisor in the execution chamber, um, praying out loud and, and laying his hands on him because he says that that's part of his Christian faith. And the Supreme Court has had a couple of these cases come to them on the so-called shadow docket over the last two years. The first time it was a, uh, someone wanted his Muslim imam in him, with him in the execution chamber and the Supreme Court turned him down because he said he came to the court too late. The second time it was a Buddhist priest and the state of Alabama, I think, wouldn't allow him to have the Buddhist priest when they would have allowed a Muslim imam or a Christian priest or a Christian pastor. And the Supreme Court said, no, 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 it doesn't work that way. Um, and then the third time, uh, uh, Texas, I can't remember exactly what the issue was, but the Supreme Court said, no, 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 it doesn't work that way. You can either let everybody in or nobody in. And so Texas said, OK, we're not going to let anybody in. So then an inmate came back and said, well, now they're not letting anybody in. And the Supreme Court sent the case back to the district court for findings about whether or not there were actual security concerns that would require Texas to bar everybody from the execution chamber. And so somebody came back, to Tex came back from Texas to the court last week. And the Supreme Court said, OK, let's hear oral argument about it in October. And they, that, that's fine. I mean, I, I, I'm delighted they did that, by the way. Yes. I think that case, yeah. that case drives me crazy because they claim that there's no religious, no burden on religion, on exercise of religion. Right. Whatever the security concerns are, that's lovely. But if you're going to stop thinking about it at the front end because you imagine there's no burden, those cases drive me right. nuts. I'm thrilled that they took that case. But I think it'll be very interesting now. That, like, and I think that, I, again, this is all speculation, but... This came the week after there was so much criticism of the court's uh, order in the Texas abortion case. And I think it was a response to some of that criticism. And they're like, OK, you want us to act quickly? We'll act quickly. Well, um, I, guess, I guess one other feature that's unusual is two merits cases in October and November disappeared that same week. Yeah. So they had a, lot, like, a gaping hole in their docket. Right. Because <laughs> I think the other interesting phenomenon, and sort of like drawing it together, is like the shadow docket's very active, but the court, and the court now has, I think you could say, four more solid votes to grant on things. And yet, like, there has been, never been a time when they've granted fewer cases. Yeah. And so it's just a weird kind of push and pull dynamic. And maybe that means it's great that the court can be flexible when there are particular issues on like, the so called shadow docket. Eric, you are welcome to come It's up not even called up. the shadow docket anymore. It's called the so called shadow docket. <laughs> like, that's the official name now. <laughs> uh, but like. The emergency docket. Yeah. 
But it'll be interesting to see, like when you know, when the U.S. versus Texas, the U.S. litigation over the Texas abortion law, or the inevitable litigation over the vaccine mandate comes back to the Supreme Court on the so-called shadow docket. You know, do they then order oral argument quickly? You know, has the have they sort of set a precedent? The, the Texas, you mentioned the Texas law. I don't know if anyone wants to. I mean, we have the Dobbs case. Uh, I don't know if anyone wants to weigh on that craziness. Like, for the, first of all, the law is bizarre. Uh, I, I find it fascinating and difficult in that I understand the technical objection to who do you sue and can you get relief. But at the end of the day, if the answer is you're subcontracting out state action, there has got to be a legal theory that says that's not kosher. Uh, right, and, and it's not just abortion, right? It's guns, it's all kinds of stuff. It can be mask mandates. You can do this for a mask mandate and say, oh, your neighbor can sue you for not having a mask mandate. And if they win, they get $10,000 from you if you don't wear a mask. Uh, but if they lose, you can't get any money back from them. That strikes me as absolutely nuts way to enforce state law. If this is state law, then you have just deputized your entire population and other people's population to be state enforcers. Uh, but I don't know that our case law is there yet. And I don't know how to best get it there without throwing a monkey wrench into everything. But it's inconceivable to me that this model of state law enforcement can get a pass until somebody actually litigates it through. Just because the chilling effect. Imagine First Amendment law like this. The sheer chill on exercise of constitutional rights Shocking, absolutely shocking. Well, in campaign finance situations, people are often essentially deputized to do that, and IJ has brought cases about that, and this might work. I don't know if you have any comments on, on SBA. I mean, Clark made the comment at the lunch that maybe one way of sol facetiously uh, solving the Texas, uh, uh, the execution case was just subcontract out the execution, right? Like, it's a third party now, it's not the state, so. To other inmates. Yeah. Right. Oh, sure, yeah. Just open the door, <laughs> let them in. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I think the hard thing is, like, there is this push and pull, right? Because there are areas of law where you do deputize people, private actors, to enforce, to enforce sort of, to act in the shoes of the attorney general. Uh, and what exactly the barrier is to the Texas law, like, I, I think it is, it was probably apt for the majority in the state application to say, like, raises very difficult questions. And I think the reaction a lot of people have is, there are almost certainly various legal theories for challenging this. It's just very hard to do so in the posture of an emergency stay application. And that, I think, is the fundamental mismatch. It seemed like the court was deeply uncomfortable. Certainly, five justices expressed extreme discomfort with saying that they thought there was a likelihood of success on the merits when the folks challenging the law, they felt like just didn't actually present the case as to what was what exactly the obstacles with the Texas law were. And I do think it, it, like, it, it raises just really hard questions. Uh, and sometimes that just means at the emergency stay stage, like novelty may be your best friend in, in, you know, in getting the outcome you want when it's a really fast snap decision. I, I oddly enough agree. I actually think the stay for the emergency stay application probably had dozens of defects in it, uh, not the least of which is it didn't seem to include all the right defendants. Um, that being said, it would be nice on a going forward basis for them to eventually come up with a theory on how to deal with this procedural gambit because it's not going to go, if it stays intact, it's not going to go away, and it's going to apply to lots of other constitutional rights, or if you think maybe constitutional rights or so-called constitutional rights, whatever you feel about abortion, <laughs> I don't really care. Um, so I, I'm not saying that I necessarily think they made the wrong call in this case. It is just a terrible precedent, and so it needs to be dealt with thoughtfully so that you don't get caught in that bind again. Do you have anything to you, know, you mentioned this, Sarah, and I, I'm sure Rex Shaver will have. I, I, you kind of mentioned pussy, especially with the Remain in Mexico. Um, wh what is happening in admin law? Like, <laughs> I mean, it's a very broad question, but like, there's, there seems to be a last two years have created a very different landscape than what's going forward. And now Chevron and everything else is sort of being altered, but on, in the actual situation, I thought a lot of you practice, it's, it's very different now, right? Yeah, so in administrative law right now, at least on like the big ticket items, feels like endless war. And it's sort of like a war of attrition. I mean, I think like the contraceptive mandate is maybe the best example. It's like been around the block like 17 million times and will probably come around the block again because every win is so narrow and it always goes up to the Supreme Court. 
it always ends up feeling like there's a circuit split. There's always nationwide injunctions, like on both sides. Um, and it, it keeps coming up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court keeps sort of kicking the can down the road with either sort of procedural rulings or rulings that are sort of halfway solutions. And that just guarantees more litigation. And each administration, especially when there's a change in administration, will try to undo its predecessor's acts. I mean, the most meta example of that is like the remain in Mexico state order, where the court cited the DACA decision to say you didn't explain this well enough. Um, and so, it, you know, I think some people looking at this say what comes around goes around to different administrations. But I think if you look at it in terms of the development of a law, the law, it's a very weird and novel situation in which it kind of feels like no administration big ticket items ever get resolved. They often never go into effect and it's just litigation for a decade solid. And it's a very strange state of affairs, especially because Congress doesn't do as much legislating as it used to, which means that administrative agencies, I think on both sides, you know, when in both sets of administrations have tried to pick up the slack uh, and, you know, not always the greatest thing to have administrative agency is trying to take the place of Congress, but then it's just sort of stalemate. It's really weird. <laughs> is it, the DACA, it, we can take that, but go back to Common Cause. There's so many things we can think for this. I don't know if Eric, you want to weigh in or? Well, I mean, you know, I, I've followed a number of cases. I have a case up there dealing with Sir Chevron. I am, uh, in, I am permanently hostile to Chevron. <laughs> um, I just think it's a terrible idea. I think the law should be interpreted by judges, not by administrators. Uh, but I think this problem of switching administrations, once you have Chevron, then you are subject to the changing waves of politics as to how they want to work with ambiguity, which, you know, these days Congress seems to build in on purpose. Uh, so, so I find it difficult uh, and, and troubling, which is more of a reason to overrule Chevron than to constantly have the, well, we're going to fight about this for 10 years until some other administration comes in and yanks the policy or reinterprets it or says, uh, we interpret that ambiguous phrase to mean exactly the opposite of what our last administration. If you really want regulations and laws to flip-flop like that based on the current executive, uh, that's just an awful way of running the country. It's an awful way of running litigation that necessarily takes some time. Let's just get a decision. So I feel this way about the bump stock case. Yeah, definitely. Which, We've worked you know, yeah. that's crazy. And I, and I wouldn't be shocked at all if the current uh, Department of Justice changes their mind and decides we do like Chevron and we want Chevron, even though the last Department of Justice said don't. Yes. Um, I don't know what you're supposed to do with that as a litigator, as a client. I don't know how you deal with that kind of stuff. Uh, it's an interesting dilemma of who ultimately speaks for the government, right? So when the government speaker keeps changing their views, uh, this is a case that's coming up in the abortion context, right? Where the AG of what, what state was it? Was it Wisconsin? Can, can, Albert, Mr. Mr. Kentucky, Kentucky, Kentucky. Kentucky. Uh, yeah. You know, they, they defended case. the law, they defended the law, then they said, oh, we're not going to defend it anymore. The AG wants to come in and defend it. Mm -hmm. Like, who do you get to speak for a government? It's a bigger question than just ad law. Sort of metaphysically rich, if you think about it. Yeah. So, you know, Amy wrote about, wrote about that. Because, yeah. because they, yeah. the question in that is about, can he defend the law? Right. right. Uh, he, he tried to bring it to the court as an abortion case, and can they defend the law? And the court was like, eh, we're not getting into the abortion part of it. But this is a really interesting question. Um, you know, one thing about the Remain in Mexico policy, when the Biden administration, the Biden administration came to the court on the Remain in Mexico case, and it was basically the same week that they were defending on the eviction moratorium. And the Biden administration's stay request in the Remain in Mexico case had this paragraph at the end that said basically to the Supreme Court, remember all of those times that the Trump administration came to you because a district court was trying to dictate immigration policy and foreign relations, and you said, oh, no, district courts can't do that. Like, okay, this is what's going on here. And the Supreme Court was just like, yeah, no, this is, this is not the same thing, apparently. Um, yeah, well, I think Remain in Mexico also is a victim, perhaps, of the SG's office the, another feature of change of administrations being that the SG's office changed positions on an awful lot of merits cases last term, including Remain in Mexico, which is by then had matured from the so-called shadow DACA to a real merits case and then was demoted again when the administration said they didn't actually want it. Uh, so I would have to guess that I think Remain in Mexico was, I think the yanking it from the merits docket probably hurt them when it came time I to go to the court. Right. Uh, as opposed to the foreign relations aspect, which is notable. It's an important part of it, but... Uh. Now, 
and I'll be open up for questions uh, in just a, a five minutes. And but uh, for people online, if you're watching, uh, we will be looking for questions from you. The hashtag is Cato Scotus. Um, Sarah, you mentioned I wanted to give you a chance to talk about a petition you have about Bivens uh, that that could be interesting after our last year Bivens flame out. So sure. So I mean, I actually think like the theme of the coming just sort of like the coming petitions to watch a little bit is sort of like overruling things or not, question mark. Like there's a lot of petitions coming up that give the court opportunities if the court wants it to overrule various decisions. Seems like a hot trend right now. Um, so there is obviously the Harvard petition, affirmative action petition, which asks the court to overrule Grutter. You don't have to do that, but it's an option. That was CVSG. We'll see what the government says. Guessing the government's probably not going to see the same thing as they did in the Trump administration, but you know we'll see. Uh, I think we'll I'm know by December whether position is not holding my breath on that one. <laughs> there are the flurry of petitions asking the court to overrule McGirt, which was the decision that said that about half of Oklahoma should be, in fact, uh, you know, varying disputes over whether it's just criminal law or not, but was in fact an Indian reservation. Um, there are various petitions always perennially about whether to overrule qualified immunity. And then I actually have a petition that raises questions about whether the court should cut back on or overrule Bivens, which is a precedent from the 1970s about implied rights of action against uh, federal agents. Uh, it's implied purportedly under the Constitution. Uh, the court has increasingly ex expressed skepticism about whether or not Bivens is a thing. Uh, uh, and this petition presents that question, but also sort of narrower questions about whether not to extend Bivens to two different novel contexts. So it is kind of an interesting juxtaposition with the qualified immunity debate, because I think there are various folks who think that, uh, who sort of from a political standpoint, think that accountability for officers of all stripes is, is just sort of the bottom line that they want to pursue. And then I think there's also a school of thought that says, both Bivens and qualified immunity are doctrines that have been questioned as lacking some sort of basis in the Constitution or, or any sort of statutory framework. And if the court were to cut back on one, it might make it easier to cut back on the other because they sort of balance each other out in some ways. Uh, so we'll see. <laughs> I commend to you uh, Steve Loddick's article about the Hernandez U Mesa uh, that he argued uh, in last year's review. Um, I don't, do you, is there any petitions or things that you want, that you have at the court that you want to mention? Um, we, I have a few things that I'm sort of interested in. Um, you know, the bump stock petition, that's up, that's out of the 10th circuit. I have one in the DC circuit. <clears throat> that actually is, is a little bit about machine guns and bump stocks, but mostly about Chevron and raises some good issues about Chevron's application in dual use statutes, statutes that have both civil and criminal applications, which I think, uh, is a mess, and just think EPA, think SEC. There are lots of big, big statutes that create big, big crimes that apparently we're giving deference to the agencies to define those crimes, and that bugs me to no end. Um, I think there's uh, the Janus follow-on petitions that keep cropping up about um, <clears throat> whether bar dues are inconsistent with Janus, so whether Keller should be overruled. Or That's just whether or not the unions are giving people the opportunity to recover their money if, you know, like well, those two. on a Thursday in mid-August, right? <laughs> right, That's the those only time two. you can do it. Like. It's like, right, exactly. There's some procedural stuff on that, which I think is interesting. But I like the Keller overrule part, which yeah. fits with the theme. And um, who wants to pay bar dues anymore? So. Yeah. And then I think there's a big petition coming up soon, I think, um, on Dormant Commerce Clause, this, this pork statute in California. So it's, uh, what is it? Oh, you mean the one that's destroying the pork industry? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. that one. Uh, the National Pork Producers Council versus Ross is, I think, the petition coming up. It's coming out. Mayor Brown, I think, is bringing it soon. Um, but that's fascinating because it's like a follow-on to Wayfair a little bit. Uh, and I, I, I'm not a fan of the Dormant Commerce Clause, but I think it does a lot of work that should be done by other, statu other constitutional provisions that were misinterpreted 100 years ago. So like, it does real work. It does constitutional work. It's just the wrong theory. Uh, and so what do you do about that? What do you do when the mistake happened 100 or 150 years ago, and this is sort of just made up areas grown up to fix that mistake? Uh, it's a fascinating dilemma, because it's hard to imagine that California gets to tell the whole country on threat of shutting down their borders to imports and exports, which is the real clause, uh, that you've got to do it our way or, or the highway. I don't know. I'm not a fan of that either. I met, I met another fan of the imports-exports clause. <laughs> I didn't know we had that in common. You do? Yeah, all right. Um, all right, uh, I'm going to see, uh, unless, is there something else you want to add before we uh, There were a couple of yeah. cases, you know, the, the, the Supreme Court not having, uh, you know, having left Employment Division versus Smith in effect. There are a couple of cases 
that are asking the court to either clarify or reconsider Smith. Um, there's one called Dignity Health versus Minton. It's a case filed by a transgender patient who wanted a hysterectomy at a Catholic hospital. Um, there were a lot of sort of procedural issues that that the respondent said should keep the court from taking up the case because it came out of a state court. But this was a case that was on hold for Fulton, but they didn't send it back to the lower courts or deny cert after Fulton. So they considered it a couple of times before the summer recess, and it's up again at the long conference. Um, there's one that's a little further over the horizon called Seattle Union's Gospel Mission versus Woods. It uh, involves a um, legal clinic for the homeless run by uh, an evangelical Christian organization. Um, the mission told somebody who applied for a job at the legal clinic who was in a same-sex relationship that the same-sex relationship was contrary to the church's teachings. Um, and so the question is whether or not the First Amendment protects the mission's rights to hire people who share its religious teachings. Um, and so this is these are actually sort of issues similar to what the court took up in Masterpiece Cake Shop a couple of years ago. Um, and then there's one called the Roman Catholic Diocese of Albany versus Lacewell. Um, the diocese is represented by Noel Francisco, you've probably heard of him, um, which I think is up on the long conference. And this is kind of similar to the birth control mandate. It's a New York regulation that requires employers to fund medically necessary abortions through their employee health plans. Um, it has an exemption for religious employers, but not for other religious or organizations like Catholic charities. So it could be an interesting one. I actually did not know about that. That's pretty crazy. Um, all right, uh, questions. Um, Nicole, you're at, uh, on the outside of the back in the blue shirt there? Yep, that's you. She's gonna come to you with the mic. One sec, she's gonna come to you with the mic behind you. Uh, Jim Duhom, unaffiliated. Uh, this may be more of a comment than a question, but isn't the the issue ab about uh, how the uh, constitutional issue would be raised in the, the uh, Texas uh, abortion case, Shelley against Kramer? I mean, they'd have to go to court. Private parties would have to go to court to enforce the uh, uh, the penalty, and that would constitute state action, wouldn't it, when, if the court uh, uh, enforced the law? A absolutely. It's just a question of whether we allow the massive chill to happen before that. We have lots of pre-enforcement uh, challenges to criminal laws, to various First Amendment-related laws, uh, precisely because we understand that the, the, the harm happens uh, arguably well ahead of any actual litigation. So it's just a question of reconciling those two sort of disparate theories of if you believe that you can violate somebody's constitutional rights by chilling them, well, then we need a theory that deals with that. Uh, I think uh, move up here on the inside with the blue shirt. Do you see up a couple rows? Yeah. My name is Andy Hawks. I'm a local attorney. Um, I've now read the merit briefs for both sides in the Dobbs case, and it seems to me that each side has a glaring weakness. The weakness of Mississippi's brief is that it, it comes off as a bait and switch. I mean, they got the court to accept grant to review the viability rule, and then very little in the brief addresses that. And they make no real principled argument as to why 15 weeks should be okay, but 16 not, or whether some other rule should be adopted. The weakness I found in the respondent's case, that's the abortion provider's case, is that it makes no real attempt to justify Roe as an original matter. And by Roe there, I mean the essential holding in Roe that Casey reaffirmed. I'm, I'm wondering if anyone on the panel has a similar assessment. I, well, first of all, I wouldn't say that Casey reaffirmed Roe. I mean, would you, I mean, would you agree with that? I mean, I mean, I yeah. I mean, I think that is a big part of their argument is like that almost like we don't have to defend, we don't have to explain it or rationalize it because, you know, Roe was reaffirmed in Casey and Casey's been around for 30 years and it's stare decisis. Um, you know, I'm, so that's what Mississippi's challenging. Right. Uh, I mean, and, and then I think it's to go to your, your second point, I think it's going to be very interesting to see whether or not that, you know, that comes up either at, at, 
at oral argument, like this, you know, you said we don't need to reconsider Roe versus Wade and Casey, and this is what most of your brief is about. I mean, they have digged cases mm -hmm. for that, the dismissed as improvidently granted. So I was just, I was think, I think is the one of the interesting about Roe, I, I get this sense that uh, people even who are very pro choice will have a hard time defending that decision. And so Casey replaces, you know, the three, the trimester like, framework of Blackman's opinion with like the undue burden test and all that stuff like that. I don't see Roe as a jurisprudential matter has that many defenders. So maybe that's part of the answer. I guess I felt like I had the opposite reaction in that I thought both briefs were very well done, uh, both as briefs, but also in terms of making tactical moves. Uh, I think Mississippi's brief, I think, correctly captures where at least several justices start off with, with respect to the Roe Casey framework. And I think if you think about from Mississippi's vantage, how to defend the 15 week law from a sort of starting off point, like, and what they might need to defend it. I think the, the brief in some ways is very honest about what they think the court's options are. And I think the respondent's brief is also very tactically effective because its theme is stare decisis, stare decisis, stare decisis. We don't need to go further than stare decisis. Don't make it overcomplicated. We're not even going to engage with the sort of same premises. So you get this weird situation, I think, of two briefs that are in some ways two ships passing in the night. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think a feature of abortion cases is that the court knows the issues very well, and I'm not, I'm not sure the briefs matter. <laughs> they matter, obviously, in setting forth some of the factual issues. They, ma they matter as sort of pieces of advocacy to sort of anchor the party's positions. But I think if June Medical shows anything, and in some ways Whole Women's Health too, it's that, and everything else in the court's abortion jurisprudence, it is that the court often reaches compromises and struggles to figure out how to reframe its standards and that's sort of what the court will do. Uh, and it's not clear to me, even though both sides have exceptionally good advocates, uh, how much advocacy will even matter. I, I lean more in that direction, that, that at the end of the day, I probably wouldn't have engaged beyond stare decisis. <clears throat> There's just no profit there. There's no value there to say, OK, let's reconsider Roe from scratch. That just sort of invites them to do it, as opposed to say, no, 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 no. They said, no, we're not going to fight about that. This is just about what Roe means. Uh, and maybe we'll tweak the balance in KC a little bit or whatever, but we're not fighting about should Roe be flipped. Uh, I think that's probably the right tactical move from the defender's uh, point of view. Uh, from the state's point of view, I suspect they're playing for concurrences, not for a win. So yeah, you talk about all you want. Talk about Roe, talk about this, talk well, they, about I think that. they're playing for a win because they assume that the court will compromise. Maybe. I, you know, I sort of feel like the best they can get is a loss with a remand that says, think about it more. Uh, I'm not sure they get a true win. Um, and so they're just sort of playing for the concurrences to, to use on remand and, and on future cases and to understand how to frame future challenges. We have an online question here. Sam's going to read out. Uh, that's right. Uh, we have Frank Garrison asking via YouTube, to the extent any panelists are familiar with the case, what effect, if any, do you see American Hospital Association v. Becerra having on Chevron? The case is granted for next term. Ooh, I'm glad you asked. We were actually talking about this earlier. One of my backup questions. So thank you, Frank, former legal associate. Um, I'll start off because I know Eric also has views in Amy, too. So this was one of the more interesting grants because it comes to the court from the D.C. Circuit. There's definitely no circuit split. It is about like a CMS reimbursement policy calculation that is so complicated to explain. I think it would take like the entire segment to figure out like how to talk about the QP in substantive terms. Uh, and the court is granting a question about Chevron deference in a case where if you read the papers, it sort of at least seems like from petitioner's description, there may not even be sort of much of a Chevron issue so much as like, did the DC circuit simply grossly misinterpret the statute kind of question. Uh, and so it's a really interesting grant. It's obviously a split list, sort of an important case-ish for, for reimbursement purposes. But it's also sort of one that I, I wonder if the court had buyer's remorse in not taking some of the bump stock cases or didn't want to take those cases for other reasons, because it is at least a very clean opportunity if the court wants to do sort of like a Wilkie type, let's put some more guardrails on Chevron the way we did for our. This is actually a good way to do it because the stakes are not, you know, the stakes are manageable um, and the court can sort of say various things about Chevron without having to overrule it or without having to do other stuff. So super interesting grant. 
I sort of feel like, yeah, the, the Chevron issue in that case seems like non-existent, but it, it, it's, it's included, obviously, in the questions presented. I think just as sort of red meat for the courts to just sort of wave the flag in front of them and say, come on, come on. But, but perhaps they're just going to use it as an occasion to say something that will influence some of the more meaty Chevron cases that they might not want to take for other reasons, like the bump stock cases. With your uh, passionate hatred of Chevron, um, every, time, every time I try and count how many votes there might be to overturn it, and a lot of that view changed after the Kaiser v. Wilkie case, because I thought that hour was dead, right, and made this. So I'm not sure there's more than three or two, I mean, for overruling Chevron outright. Look, there are like a couple of instances where you could seriously imagine Chevron applies, where the court says, you should, you know, you should do X, Y, Z if, if the, the weight of a truck is over 20 pounds. And you need the agency to figure out which kind of scale I'm going to use. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll give you that. I'll give you a deference to the agency that has to fill in the operational details at some level. Eric, I don't know if you're enough of a passionate hater of Chevron. Yeah, I know, yeah. Come on, that's sad of me like you got to. No, no, but, but I'd require a plain, a clear statement from Congress giving them that, <laughs> okay. delegating that authority because I'm really anti-delegation too. <laughs> but... Uh, but I, I agree with you. There's not to fully overrule it from soup to nuts is hard to see, but to really ratchet it down, no criminal applications, no cross, you know, mixed applications. Major questions doctrine. Yeah. But it's so interesting too, because I think that the Supreme Court, like Chevron, treats Chevron as sort of a dirty word. Like you do not see Chevron in the Supreme Court's opinions. You don't even see people arguing Chevron to the Supreme Court so much. Yet in the DC Circuit, it's almost sort of a an, oppo an equal and opposite reaction of like being more enamored of Chevron at this point than in any time in like the last 20 years. <laughs> you see a lot of Chevron in there. It's, it's, it's attacks have created defenders, I think, <laughs> to some extent. Um, Nicole, over on this side. Uh... Well, thank you guys very much. I've gotten a question in for each panel. The, uh, I was a little surprised to, um, when I heard, I, know, I remember back in the early 80s when the Supreme Court said that women were not eligible to be registered for the draft because the combat arms, mainly infantry and armor and the army, did not relied on the draft and women were not eligible. Well, after 2015, the rules changed, and so women are now eligible for infantry and armor, combat arms. And I think one of the appellate courts made reference this past uh, few months and the Supreme Court, I think, refused to say anything because the, I think the appellate court was saying, well, the whole thing is moot because the reason the Supreme Court gave no longer applies. Do you guys envision them making them taking that up? Or, I think they said something about it's a congressional issue, which I, I find a little strange for the Supreme Court to say. But um, do, do you, are you familiar with this at all? I'm vaguely familiar, and I think they said that was isn't wasn't there supposed to be a congressional report on it, and so that's the sort of thing where the Supreme Court is like, you know, we will let them work this out. And there's a Hogan petition that got denied, and I yes. think this is a description of the perhaps a concurrent or dissental. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I'm not sure which. I'm no. I don't know. I'm not sure about the 1980 decision. There, sure certainly decision. A, there was certainly a petition recently that Hogan did that was very well done, but it got was denied. very well done. It was denied, and it, it was, but the Supreme Court basically said, "Not right now, not our place." Yeah, the Supreme Court. So, so I'm, I think the thing that people don't get about the Supreme Court is just, they don't fix every problem that rolls it through the door the second it rolls through their door. That's not their job. That's not what their jurisdiction has them do. And it would be a terrible, terrible idea to take the first case that pops up uh, just because somebody asked. I mean, you know, they're, they're not on demand. So the fact that they said no doesn't mean they're never going to take it. It just means they're waiting to see if the problem sorts itself out because the resources of the Supreme Court are valuable and limited, and, well, though less limited these days, apparently. Uh, and, <laughs> and they shouldn't be the ones making these calls. We're always so concerned about activist judges, but the minute they say no to a cert petition, we're like, oh my god, how did they say no? Uh, so this is, you know, they like things to percolate, is the phrase up at the Supreme Court, and maybe this is just that. Sam, online question? Uh, yes, this is from John J. Vecchioni, uh, specifically to Eric, but I suppose uh, anyone else on the panel could answer. Hello, John. <laughs> uh, do you think the court will take Apogean v. Garland this term or wait for the issue to percolate through the circuits? 
If I was a betting man, I'd say I think the odds are not in favor. Well, first explain what the case is. Oh, I'm sorry. So have. a potion is another one of these. There are several bump stock cases out there. A potion Can is you explain the, what a bump stock is? Okay, for those so, <laughs> so a bump stock, for, for those of you who are not gun nuts, like me and my clients. That is. It's like a YouTube, <laughs> <laughs> right, a YouTube moment. <laughs> what a firearm is first. Uh, is it a machine gun, Eric? <laughs> no, no, it is definitely not a machine gun. Uh, a bump stock is a, a stock, uh, you know, the shoulder stock that you can put on a, on a rifle that lets it recoil just a touch, maybe an inch or, or so. And that helps you use this technique called bump firing, which is you, sh you pull the trigger, the stock recoils a little bit, which resets the trigger, and then if you push things forward again, you hit the trigger again. So it lets you go back and forth and shoot the thing very fast by having the recoil sort of assist you with the release. And the ATF has said this is now a device that makes a machine gun out of a normal rifle or, or semi-automatic rifle. Uh, and there have been a bunch of challenges to that. I have a challenge in the DC circuit. Uh, NCLA has a challenge in the 10th circuit. Um, there's a challenge in the Fifth Circuit. There's a challenge in the Sixth Circuit. I think there was just a military court of appeals ruling on this in a criminal case. So there are a bunch of cases out there like this. The gate, my case, the Gatiss case, uh, was the first up right after this got passed. The Supreme Court denied cert on this, saying it's a little early. But Gorsuch, Justice Gorsuch said, well, but of course Chevron is totally inappropriate here. And so maybe the courts below will fix that and get that right because, you know, God knows this was wrong. Um, and so the cases have been kicking around since then. This, a potion is another case. It's up on preliminary injunction. Uh, it remains to be seen whether after a number of rulings, even in the preliminary context, the court is still reluctant to take it or not reluctant to take it. They might have gotten over that, uh, given that there have been a variety of rulings, or they might want to wait for a merits case. There's a merits case coming out of the Fifth Circuit. Our case is on the merits now, right before the D.C. DC Circuit. So it's just a question. And if I had to bet... They have enough drama <laughs> on their docket this term that they don't want to add that. Another gun case, even though it's well, not a gun case. Well, guns and Chevron. Yeah. So <laughs> overruling Chevron in order to allow machine guns to go, I mean, that seems like a little more drama than they may be prepared to accept just this moment. They could do it on a shadow docket. That yeah, would really be controversial. So <laughs> 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 they actually, oddly enough, should do it on the shadow docket because a lot of these cases have been decided uh, on a theory that the government can't waive Chevron. Mm -hmm. Right, so the government said, we don't invoke Chevron, we don't want Chevron, and a bunch of courts have sort of shoved Chevron down their throat anyway. Uh, absurd on its face in so many ways. But, but just recently, at the end of last term, uh, the courts accepted basically a waiver of Chevron from the government. So one could easily see any of these petitions being GVR'd just on the basis of that and say, well, why are you making me rule on Chevron when they don't want to do it? The other side doesn't want to do it. We've already accepted that in other cases. So I could easily see this shadow docket kicking this back to the courts for another three years of litigation. <laughs> Can't wait. Yeah, me neither. For the shadow docket. <laughs> uh, Devin, up there, uh, over here. Yeah, should Nicole can see you. Another former legal associate. They're, po they're populating the, the legal world. Fly my pretties. Uh, Devin Watkins, Competitive Enterprise Institute. I don't understand the justification for why the names of the justices aren't listed on the shadow docket for how they voted. I can understand per curiam opinions where there are like multiple authors or something, but why don't we know who voted in favor and who voted against certain things on the shadow docket? I just don't see any That's justification. An excellent for that. question. I was like, I bet Amy agrees with you. <laughs> Uh, maybe they feel like that they're telegraphing something they don't want to be telegraphing. That's the best I could predict. Um, I don't know they, they don't give votes on cert either. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, you know, just at some point, these are preliminary, non-binding decisions in many cases, uh, and so you do them for the same reason you do per curiams. Is sometimes attributing them locks you in in a way that you don't really think you should be locked in. And yeah, to be fair, I mean, a lot of the stuff on the shadow docket is stuff like, can I have more time to file my cert petition? Yeah. You know, can, can be things that is incredibly mundane and, you know, can only go to, sometimes only goes to one justice. And I think there may well be, and this is something the justices don't like to do, to sort of assign more merit to some orders over others to be like, this is important enough that we're going to put everybody's names on it, but this one isn't, uh, may also be something that factors into it. Yeah, I guess the interesting thing is the more transparent the court has been on the shadow docket, like the more it seems to be criticized, which may be like the wrong incentive system for them. I don't know. Uh, but I mean, I think it's hard, to, like 
now that everything is, the, the court is like so much more transparent, I think, even the last couple of years in terms of both audio and uh, online opinions and even access to sort of emergency stay applications. I mean, I think for most of the court's history, the idea that like you could access a lot of this stuff was, you could see paper copies maybe, but probably not of the, probably not of the emergency docket. And I feel like there's sort of a push pull for the court that is really difficult to navigate, which is like the more they, the more they try to give to be transparent, like the more people seem to say that the shadow docket is illegitimate and I, mean, I, I don't think wanting to works. see the filings is that of course everyone wants to see them as a reporter, but like, <laughs> I, I think the court is also sort of trying to balance its institutional interest of how it does deliberations and maybe this gets to sort of the Supreme Court reform, reform proposals too in the commission, but I think one of the interesting things just going on with the justices speaking is sort of Justice Breyer going out there and saying, you know, don't necessarily rush into this. The court, like whatever you do can get flipped and the court is an institution that tends to make its own decisions and it's, you know, I, I think most of the justices have that perspective because they know how it operates internally and it is hard to convey. Well, and I think the other thing is, you know, there's always the opportunity for dissenters on any of these. So if somebody feels strongly that people ought to be held accountable, dissents do that. Uh, and so to the extent that none of the justices feel strongly enough to dissent on, on, by name, that says that they'd rather speak with one voice as a court, regardless of what the voting conference was. It's like the, the deliberative process privilege, right? They just sort of say, okay, well, we voted, I lost, but I'm good with that. And so we're just going to speak with one voice as a court, not as individuals. And, and there's some value to that, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so any question? Uh, yes, up here. Uh, wait for the mic, please. He's coming from behind there. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Stephen Keat. Uh, I'm a retired diplomat, and I was a had a specialty in economics. And I should emphasize that I am not a lawyer; never practiced law. Uh, at lunch, a number of us were talking about the Mississippi case and abortion in general, and. Everyone except for me was of the belief that the, there was a good chance that the court would go and decide in favor of Mississippi. I was of the opinion that uh, the court will either you know, rule against Roe v. Wade, decide that it was erroneously decided, or will uphold it. Um, could you please comment on or differences of opinions and who you think is most likely to be correct? Sure. I mean, I think that the that with the state, with the lower court having struck down the law as unconstitutional, I don't think that the court, after 15 weeks or whatever of considering the ca the case at conference, took the case so that it could then say, "You're right, the law is unconstitutional." I think that some form of the law is going to survive. Exactly what the court's going to say? Are they going to say that? Are they going to go ahead and overrule Roe v. versus Wade? Are they going to come to some sort of uh, compromise that where they get rid of viability and we go back to just we go to some sort of standard that just looks at whether or not the law is an undue burden? Um, that I don't know, but I would be surprised if there are five votes to say you're right, the law is unconstitutional. I agree with that, and I think that's going to be the kind of case where John Roberts will spend a lot of time trying to make sure that the court comes out as unscathed as it possibly can to in public opinion. Like, uh, better if you guys want to weigh in. Uh, other questions from here? I have partly a philosophical question about the subject you just discussed. Making something illegal that millions of people already do just drives it underground. It makes it more expensive. It makes it more dangerous. It increases corruption, it increases cynicism about the law, it increases law-breaking. Prohibition is prohibition. This is libertarianism 101. What I want to know is why is there ambivalence among libertarians about abortion? So the prohibition of murder statutes that generally exist drive murder underground too. We wouldn't require families I'm to keep so I don't, relatives' I'm bodies I'm answer, alive I'm after your bringing question death. For why libertarian? I'm not personally stating my opinion, but if you believe it's murder, 
then you, would ha you wouldn't really care about the effects of prohibition. And what I'm saying is you, would, you wouldn't require relatives to keep the bodies of their relatives alive after brain death. We did for years. Absolutely. Terry Schiavo. And you we couldn't, you couldn't make that consistent with libertarianism, though. I, last I checked, I wasn't a libertarian in this context. I'm a lawyer talking <laughs> yeah. about the Constitution, which has libertarian components to it, but it also has allocation of power components and delegation to political branches. And your argument is, is an argument you can make to a legislature. I understand that. That's why I said it was a philosophical well, question. Well, you know, the court deals with philosophical issues, too, but the biggest philosophical issue is who gets to decide. It's not whether you think that they make, came to the right answer. Because if you don't concede the right of legislatures to make the wrong answer, well, then this whole exercise is silly. And that's why I asked why libertarians are conflicted about this. Because you, you wouldn't require, as a libertarian, you wouldn't require I the preservation of a body it. after brain death. Why? I, I, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, uh, I, um, I, we have time for one short question before we switch over, if anyone has. No? Okay, please join me in uh, thanking the panel. And please stick around for the excellent Rachel Barco on the Simon Lecture. So. <clears throat>
Her 2019 book, Prisoners of Politics, Breaking the Cycle of Mass Incarceration, demonstrates how our criminal justice policies undermine public safety and explains how we can get better outcomes by making changes that allow data and evidence to guide our choices while respecting important constitutional limits. Vice Dean Barkow received the NYU Distinguished Teaching Award in 2013 and the Law School's Podell Distinguished Teaching Award in 2007. She has served on the U.S. Sentencing Commission and the Manhattan DA's Conviction Integrity Policy Advisory Panel. In 2015, she co-founded a clemency resource center that obtained sentencing commutations for 96 people as part of President Obama's clemency initiative and earned her an NYU Making a Difference Award. After graduating from Northwestern University and Harvard Law School, she clerked for DC Circuit Judge Lawrence Silverman and Justice Antonin Scalia, then briefly practiced in Washington before joining the NYU law faculty. Vice Dean Barkow will speak on the court of mass incarceration. Thank you very much uh, for sticking around. Uh, I very much appreciate it, and it's an honor for me to deliver the Simon Lecture today and celebrate the drafting of the Constitution with all of you. Um, I'm especially happy to spend Constitution Day here at Cato, actually, uh, because of the great work Cato does generally defending constitutional rights, uh, but specifically because of the excellent work when it comes to criminal laws. Um, it's one of the leaders in defending those constitutional rights, and its work has been outstanding. Um, but I'm going to talk about a contrast between that outstanding defense of the Constitution here uh, and what it looks like at the Supreme Court, because the contrast is actually quite stark. Um, and it's the court's almost complete abdication to the government in criminal proceedings, in spite of clear constitutional language uh, and history, that's the topic of my lecture today. Uh, so plenty of blame to go around for America's uh, rise in mass incarceration. Um, but today, I want you to understand the Supreme Court's role in that, because it is one of the architects. They might not have designed it, um, and they might not have intended it, um, but they have absolutely made sure that the foundation of mass incarceration has stayed firmly in place. So let me first start by getting everybody up to speed on just how crazy our commitment to incarceration and criminalization is before I get to the Supreme Court's role in all of it, because uh, not everybody uh, is as well versed in what things look like when it comes to criminal law and punishment. So America used to look like the rest of the world when it came to incarceration uh, and its use of criminal, criminal enforcement until really the 1970s. Uh, we had stable incarceration rates uh, that look like other parts of the world, certainly other Western democracies. Uh, and then they started to explode. Uh, and we now lead the world, both in the total number of people who are incarcerated, which is right around 2.1, 2.2 million people, and the rate of incarceration per capita. Um, so we have a rate of 830 for every 100,000, and it's more than five times what it was in 1972 when we started this record climb upward. And it's five to 10 times higher uh, than other industrialized countries. So we have uh, less than 5% of the world's population and almost a quarter of the world's prisoners. All right, but as shocking as those numbers are, and I think they're shocking, uh, although not everyone is as shocked by them as I think they should be, um, they're the tip of an even bigger iceberg of state control. So one out of every 38 people in the United States is under some form of criminal justice supervision. They're either incarcerated, they're on probation, they're on parole. And in some states and communities, those rates are even higher. Uh, so for example, in Georgia, it's one out of every 18 people um, is under some form of state control. We now live in a country where one out of every three adults has a criminal record. Uh, for every 17 people born in 2001, one of them will go to prison or jail. So I'm trying to get the numbers across in as many different ways as I can, but uh, I guess I would summarize it as it's a lot. It's almost an unfathomable lot. And it's not falling proportionately across the population. Uh, in fact, black people bear a disproportionate share of the brunt. Uh, so African Americans in America make up a third of the people incarcerated, even though they're only 13.4% of the US population. So uh, one third of black men have a felony conviction. 
and black adults are six times more likely to be incarcerated than white adults. And here, too, those national numbers, as shocking as they are, um, smooth out even more alarming statistics if you look in particular communities. So here in the District of Columbia, for example, um, more than 75% of black men can be expected to be incarcerated at some point in their lifetime. 75%. Uh, at our current pace, one out of every three black men in the country can expect it to be incarcerated during their lifetimes. So hopefully these numbers paint a picture for you that uh, shows you exactly how broad the sweep of criminal punishment is in America, how many people it's reaching. Um, and I could give you much more information. I could talk to you about the thousands upon thousands of collateral consequences that are imposed upon people who have convictions, um, the inhumane conditions that exist in prisons and jails around the country. Um, but instead of giving you kind of the sweep of all this uh, in all its tragic glory, I want to turn to that question that I told you I was going to try to answer, which is, well, what does the Supreme Court have to do with any of this? Um, what is its role? Um, and before I get to that, I think I need to start with the Constitution. It's Constitution Day. Um, and anyways, that's how I start pretty much every question. Um, so you might be thinking that the problem is just that the framers did not anticipate that the government might be excessively punitive in this way. Um, maybe they didn't anticipate they would abuse coercive powers, and so the Constitution just doesn't speak to this. And if that were the case, it certainly wouldn't be the Supreme Court's fault that they that this all happened under their watch, um, because then the problem would lie with the Constitution itself. Uh, but as it turns out, the Constitution is not silent on governmental overreach in criminal cases. Um, the framers didn't kind of let state power in criminal cases slip through the constitutional cracks. Uh, it's exactly the opposite. The framers of our Constitution were well aware of how a state could try to abuse its coercive criminal powers. They knew um, about the excesses of bloody codes in England. They feared that majorities would seek to oppress their opponents through the use of criminal law and punishments. They worried obsessively about how a police state could deprive people of their liberty. So far from being silent on checking the government's power in criminal matters, the Constitution, I would say, is kind of obsessed with it. Um, in fact, one of the animating features of our Constitution is its preoccupation with regulating the government when it comes to criminal powers. So even before the Bill of Rights, uh, the Constitution provided protection for people who had been accused of crimes in the very structural provisions that the document sets out. Uh, the framers worried. What if you had a Congress that tried to single out their political enemies um, and disfavored individuals through criminal laws that would target particular people? Um, Alexander Hamilton observed that, and this is I'm quoting, the creation of crimes after the commission of the fact and the practice of arbitrary imprisonments have been in all ages the favorite and most formidable instruments of tyranny. They were worried about it. And so Article 1 prohibits bills of attainder that target particular people and ex post facto laws making things criminal after the fact. Article 2 vests the president right next to the commander in chief powers with the ability to give pardons uh, for all federal offenses except in cases of impeachment. Uh, and the Supreme Court has told us this power exists to afford relief from undue harshness or evident mistake in the operation or enforcement of the criminal law. It's in other words, the framers were aware, a way to give the president the ability to check government overreach um, when there was excess punishment and punitiveness. Uh, but what would happen if the legislature and the executive branch were to work together to single out uh, particular groups for prosecution or engage in excess overreach? Maybe they let that one slip through. They didn't have that envisioned. Ah, but they did, right? The Constitution recognizes this danger, too, and it relies on the judiciary to be a key check on the political branches. So before people can be convicted of a crime, they're entitled to judicial process. So first, you have federal judges uh, with their life tenure and salary protections. And in theory, that would give them some independence uh, from the legislature and the executive to make sure that we had fair and impartial decision making in a given case. Uh, but they didn't stop there, and this part is critical. The framers did not trust judges alone. Um, although Article III judges are relatively more independent than Congress and the executive branch, they are still part of the government, right? They still get like government pensions. They are part of all the government edifice. They are the government. Um, and they're appointed through a process that favors governmental connections. 
they are going to be naturally sympathetic to parties in power because they're drawn from that same ilk. They're part of it. Um, so the Constitution recognized that. It worried about that. Uh, the framers didn't think that judges would be sufficient protection against the possibility of state abuse in criminal cases. Uh, and so it provides in Article 3, again, the original document, um, that the trial of all crimes must be by jury. And the jury, it's, and to our modern sensibilities today, with so few jury trials, may, this may seem antiquated, but it was no afterthought for the framers of our government. Um, they did not want anyone to be subject to governmental punishment without agreement from ordinary people. And under the Constitution's structure, the jury would have a bold power to protect people from that. Um, because you couldn't twice put somebody in jeopardy. If they were to acquit, uh, that person would be free. And it would act as a check on both the legislative and the executive branches. Uh, and so it was a key gatekeeper uh, that even before the Bill of Rights, the framers thought was absolutely critical. In addition to all of that, the Bill of Rights, the framers once again focused like a laser on criminal excess. Four of our uh, first 10 amendments deal explicitly with the criminal process. The Fourth Amendment regulates the state's policing and investigative powers. The Fifth Amendment acts as a check on the state's executive powers, providing for grand juries, prohibiting the state from prosecuting people twice for the same offense. Uh, the Due Process Clause requires the government to follow proper process before depriving somebody of life, liberty, or property. The Sixth Amendment, once again, uh, brings up the jury, uh, making clear that they'll be drawn from the community where a crime occurs. And in addition, the Sixth Amendment has a bunch of other rights, uh, speedy and public trials, notice of criminal charges, the right to confrontation, the right to the assistance of counsel. And then the Eighth Amendment regulates uh, legislative judgments on punishment by prohibiting cruel and unusual ones and excessive fines. So it's just hard to imagine a constitution that was more concerned with state overreach in criminal matters. We see constitutional regulation of all aspects of the government's criminal power, from investigation to prosecution, from adjudication uh, to the legislation defining punishment. So it's not the case that it's the constitution that's fa failing to protect against the government's excess in criminal matters. And what I want to persuade you of today is that it's a failure of its guardians, the Supreme Court. And the court has failed to protect against government excess through a host of decisions that, in my view, don't bear scrutiny if you care about either the Constitution's text, its original meaning, or good government design. Uh, so these decisions only really make sense if your animating principle is, in my view, an almost pathological deference to the government. Uh, so in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, I'm working on a bigger project with this. Uh, but what I want to do for you today is highlight some of the key areas that bear the most direct relationship with mass incarceration. So if we ask ourselves, how do you end up with so many people incarcerated, it's got to be par uh, part of an equation of two main factors. You're admitting more people into your prisons and jails and or they're staying longer, right? It's, it's, it's those things working together. So obviously, for admissions, the more people that you're charging with crimes and convicting, the more admissions you will see. And then the longer sentences are, the longer they stay. Uh, so that means on any given day, the more people who will be incarcerated, because they're there for longer periods of time. Uh, and the Supreme Court has been a critical player both in opening floodgates for admission and for permitting lengthy sentences. Um, so I'm going to start by telling about the court's role in the admissions boom and what it did. Um, so we're going to start with that meteoric rise in incarceration that starts in the early 1970s. Um, and it coincides with the Supreme Court at that moment giving its official imprimatur to coercive bargaining tactics by prosecutors that allow prosecutors to threaten people with punishments orders of magnitude greater if those people have the audacity to invoke their jury trial rights. Uh, now, colloquially, this is known as plea bargaining. Um, but that is a really grotesque misnomer in my view. Um, it's really anything but a bargain for the defendants or frankly for all of us as part of society. Uh, now I can't prove causation and I can't tell you that there's an empirical study showing directly um, the line between what the Supreme Court did uh, and mass incarceration, but I can tell you it's an absolutely critical condition for it because you cannot have mass incarceration unless you have mass case processing. 
And the only way that you can process the number of criminal cases we do in America is if you do away with jury trials. So that means we have to ask, well, wait, why would a defendant give up the benefit of a jury trial uh, of their peers to make sure that the government can prove its case? Why give up the gold standard that the Constitution and the framers took such great pains to include? Uh, so the answer is defendants aren't giving this up willingly. They're coerced. Um, prosecutors are threatening them with longer punishments if they go to trial. And as more and more laws have created mandatory minimums, prosecutors have basically full control over exactly what that risk of exposure is. Um, if a defendant is convicted, that minimum is going to kick in no matter what the judge thinks. And as maximums get higher, it, it acts as an anchor to make all the sentences higher, so the charge also dictates somebody's maximum exposure. So that bargaining negotiation relationship between prosecutors and defense lawyers um, is absolutely one where the prosecutors hold enormous power. In 1971, the Supreme Court not only gave official recognition to the rise in kind of this plea negotiation bargaining uh, in Santabello, New York, um, it actually praises it in a way. It's, it views it as a necessity. The court says, if every criminal charge were subjected to a full-scale trial, the states and the federal government would need to multiply by many times the number of judges and court facilities. OK, well, so I'll give them some points for candor there. Um, but they basically all but admit, well, we have to keep things going as they are, because how difficult would life be for judges um, if we had to have all these trials, right? That would make things uh, really, really hard for them. What an inconvenience the jury would become. Uh, and so more than 200 years ago, William Blackstone warned us of this very thing. And I'm going to steal a line from Ilya from earlier today, who he said uh, that William Blackstone uh, is relevant not as a founder, but good enough, I believe was the standard that you used for him. So I do think he's good enough. Uh, and here is what he said about the criminal jury. He said, we have to defend it not only from open attacks, but from secret machinations that on their face seem convenient and benign. And he reminded us that the delays and inconveniences of the criminal jury were the fair price we pay for our liberty. All right, so here you have a court basically doing exactly what he feared that would, would happen. View it as an inconvenience. Too much work. Um, the framers fully agreed with Blackstone uh, that the criminal jury was absolutely critical and, and not an inconvenience, but in fact an absolutely critical protection of our rights. Uh, but maybe, I will say this much, you could forgive the court in Santabello for not raising the alarm about plea negotiations, uh, because at that point, the court wasn't really aware of how coercive they were. Um, in that case itself, the defendant took the prosecutor's offer, um, and the issue before the court was whether the prosecutor had to keep his end of the bargain uh, about making a sentencing recommendation. So that case didn't really cue up this fundamental problem of coercion. Um, but Bordenkircher versus Hayes did in 1978. Hayes was charged with forging a check for $88.30. And that charge carried a punishment uh, of two to 10 years. And so during the plea negotiations, the prosecutor offered to recommend a sentence of five years to the judge if Hayes were to plead guilty. Now, so we could pause for a minute and ask ourselves, what kind of world are we living in that if you forge a check for $88, you get five years of your liberty taken away? Uh, but it's going to get much worse than that. Uh, because if Hayes decided instead that what he wanted to do was exercise his constitutional jury right uh, that is in our, our, our constitution, the bedrock of it, the prosecution said, if you do that, I'm going to amend the charges, and I'm going to add a charge that shows you violated the Kentucky, the Kentucky Habitual Criminal Act. And under that law, because Hayes had two prior felony convictions um, for other incidents of you know, forgery theft, um, he would be deemed a habitual offender, and he would get a mandatory sentence of life. Okay, so again, prosecutor says, hey, you know, it's, it's your call. Um, if you plead guilty, five years. Um, Exercise your jury trial right, have at it, enjoy your constitution. Uh, but if they convict you, you will get a mandatory sentence of life. All right. Uh, now, I can't really imagine too much more coercive than this. Uh, so it's teed up pretty well for the Supreme Court to recognize exactly how this bartering is going. And yet, in a 5-4 decision, the court refused to say that was unconstitutional. The court said, uh, and here's, here's the quote, 
Defendants advised by competent counsel are presumptively capable of intelligent choice in response to prosecutorial persuasion and unlikely to be driven to false self-condemnation. So I want to unpack that with you for a minute, if I could. So the first is this idea that competent counsel does anything to help with the coercive aspect of this. Um, and my favorite quote about this is from uh, Professor Al Alshuler, who said, the presence of counsel has little relevance to the question of voluntariness. A guilty plea entered at gunpoint is no less in, uh, voluntary because, involuntary because an attorney is present to explain how the gun works. All right, I think that's right. Counsel gets us nowhere. All right. Next, the court told us uh, that this dynamic is one of prosecutorial persuasion. All right, the threat here was of a mandatory life sentence. And, and true enough, that is persuasive, right? But that's persuasive in the same way as a robber saying to you, your money or your life, I am persuaded to give you my money, right? Still coercive, so not exactly persuasion as we would think of it. And then finally, the court says, without any evidence, um, it's unlikely to lead to false self-condemnation. Uh, and it's hard to know what to make of the court's statement there. Was that naivete or duplicity? Uh, but either way, it's demonstrably false. So if we look at exonerations with uh, DNA evidence, so cases that the defendant has been proven innocent with scientific evidence, which, by the way, is itself going to be uh, uh, part of a much larger body of cases where people have been wrongfully convicted, but it's definitive science that's proving it. We know in those databases, 15% of those people had pleaded guilty. Okay, so if 15% of those people had pleaded guilty, uh, something led them to do it other than their guilt, right? It's the coercion of what they faced if they went to trial. Um, Innocent people who pleaded guilty because the prosecution was threatening so much more punishment if they just wanted to exercise their constitutional rights. Now, we have an entire doctrine that deals with unconstitutional conditions that says that the government cannot force you to give up your rights by coercively withholding benefits from the people who exercise them. So you would think that the court would view Bordenkircher as a textbook example of that, except it didn't, right? It somehow viewed this as a different category of thing and said it was part of the give and take of plea bargaining. Now, since Sanibello and Bordenkircher were decided in the 1970s, a few things we know have happened. First, guilty plea rates have skyrocketed. So 81% of federal convictions in 1980 were uh, the product of guilty pleas. Uh, and now that figures 97%, all right? So that's an enormous increase uh, that takes place. And if we look at state court data, it's a little harder to come by, but what we do have shows exactly the same pattern. Um, and the other thing that happens is the difference between the sentence that you get if you plead guilty and the sentence that you get if you go to trial has become greater. Um, and defendants now face sentences that are three times greater if they go to trial than if they plead. Um, and that's true at state and federal levels. Um, so how could a prosecutor credibly threaten a sentence that is three times longer if a person just wants to exercise their jury trial right? How can that be anything other than an unconstitutional trial penalty? Um, I just think it, the facts speak for themselves here. Um, but I want to emphasize what we're losing. Because you might think, yeah, well, the framers thought the jury was a big deal. But yeah, is it really that great? Um, is it all it's cracked up to be? Um, so let's highlight some of the really important things that a jury does. First, uh, as Learned Hand and so many others have observed, they are outside the government, right? Juries do not work for the government in any capacity, in any way. They're not allied with the government the way that judges are, uh, the way that judges are part of a system with prosecutors coming into their courtrooms every single day uh, and employees of the state. Uh, the framers were worried that judges were, quote, always ready to protect the officers of government against the weak and helpless citizen. Uh, I think the track record we have from our judiciary bears this out. Judges too often side with the government in which they're part, um, and juries by design are supposed to protect that by coming from outside the government. Uh, there's a second way that juries check governmental excess, uh, which I've mentioned, which is that because the double jeopardy clause shields their general verdict from any review, it means that the jury has the power to prevent punishment, either because it thinks the facts don't merit it, the government hasn't proven its case, or it just disagrees that's a proper case for the government to be charging for whatever reason. And, and this is an important part of the history of the jury in America. The colonists were well aware uh, of this power of juries because colonial juries had been acquitting people 
even in the face of cases where the facts did add up to a violation of the law. And they did it to resist overreach by the Crown. So we had criminal grand juries who refused to indict people um, who were accused of things uh, like political offenses, like uh, rioting or violating imperial statutes uh, such as revenue laws. Uh, and John Adams speaks for a whole host of uh, the founding generation when he said, no man can be condemned of life or limb or property or reputation without the concurrence of the voice of the people. Uh, and so they thought interference with the jury trial right was one of the worst things that the Crown was doing. Uh, and it was a reason we revolted. It was a big part of the American Revolution, right? So we all learn about the Stamp Act as being an instance of taxation without representation. Um, but what less attention is paid to is the fact that the colonists were also outraged that the Stamp Act made it so that violations of that act would be tried in admirably, admiralty courts in London as opposed to jury trials here. Um, and they were furious about that. They were furious about losing the jury trial. In 1775, the Second Continental Congress listed England's interference with trial by jury among the grievances in the Declaration of the Causes and Necessity of Taking Up Arms. Um, it's in the Declaration of Independence uh, among the grievances as well. Uh, so as my uh, colleague and noted historian Bill Nelson has observed, for Americans after the revolution as well as before, the right to trial by jury was probably the most valued of all civil rights. Each state guaranteed the trial by jury in a criminal case, Articles of Confederation did as well. So when the framers wrote the Constitution, this one was so fundamental, it required no debate, right? This was the rare area where you look and you see the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists uh, agreeing with each other. Uh, so Alexander Hamilton tells us in Federalist number 83, the friends and adversaries of the plan of the convention, if they agree in nothing else, concur at least in the value they set upon trial by jury. As he put it, the distinction is at most between the Federalist view that it's a, quote, valuable safeguard to liberty and the anti-federalist view that is the, quote, very palladium of free government, all right? They loved this thing, right? This was an absolute centerpiece of our Constitution. And it was part of, uh, part of the reason for that was precisely this checking function that it had against state power. Um, the Maryland farmer, one of the anti-federalists, described it as the democratic branch of the judiciary power, more necessary than having representatives in the legislature. Thomas Jefferson said, if I were called upon to decide whether the people should be omitted in the legislative or the judicial department, I'd say it's better to leave them out of the legislative, right? They, they were very pro-jury. Uh, so the jury is not a constitutional sideshow, but a critical way that we check against governmental overreach. And that was the way it was supposed to work, at least until the Supreme Court allowed it to become almost a non-entity. So now I want to be clear here. It's not just plea bargaining that takes the jury out of the equation, um, although obviously that's pretty much the death nail. Um, but the court has undercut the jury in other ways as well, limits what the jury is told about the consequences in a given case and what it's instructed about. Um, I, I think of that as another mistaken line of, author of authority that the court has. Um, but even without that information, uh, jurors still have a pretty good idea um, or have somewhat of an idea of what a punishment will be. And if they do have that idea, um, they can acquit if they think it's too much. And where a large proportion of a community has the go an idea of the going rate for crimes, um, we see rates of acquittal are higher in those places. So if you have heavily policed communities like the District of Columbia, uh, Detroit, the Bronx, um, they have higher rates of acquittal when cases go to trial, um, particularly in drug cases where the punishments are quite excessive. Now, if you asked a prosecutor to decide what's happening in those cases, they will call that jury nullification, uh, and they will deride it as something awful. Um, but it's exactly the role the jury was supposed to be playing under the framers' design. Uh, but they can't if you can't take your case to a jury uh, because the threat is too great. All right, so that's another, we're losing that check. We're losing that ability. Um, there's a third thing, though, that what losing the jury does uh, and how it operates, um, how we lose this operation of the check on government. And that's that a jury trial takes time. Uh, right, that's the reason. The court told us it wanted to make sure that plea negotiations were protected. Uh, but inefficiency is actually one of its virtues. Um, and 
That's because the government, to earn a conviction, has to prove its case. It has to prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt. It has to invest resources in doing so. And when the government knows it has to do that, it means the government has to actually think about its case. It has to decide which cases are worth it and which ones aren't. Um, it has to think, is it worth doing all this, um, given all the effort that I'm going to have to expend? But in a world of mass incarceration, of where you have mass convictions and pleas, Prosecutors don't really need to give much thought to cases at all. Uh, and sadly, they don't. They just churn them out. Um, and they churn them out often impersonally and without much care. So the framers knew they were putting up an architecture that wasn't efficient. It wasn't conducive to mass processing. And that was the very point. It's supposed to be hard for the government to put people into cages and stigmatize them as criminals. All right, but all it took was five justices to decide that governmental efficiency was more important than that commitment to the jury. Uh, now, even worse than all this, and I think it's pretty bad, is that the Supreme Court dismantles this protection, but it doesn't insist that anything be put in its place. So there's effectively no oversight on prosecutorial pressure. Uh, pleas are accepted with very little thought. Uh, George Fisher has documented how judges just go along with pleas to ease the burden of their dockets, right? Same reason the Supreme Court allowed this whole enterprise to go forward in the first place. They're focusing on the caseload they have before them, and they're churning things out. Um, and defendants aren't getting governmental oversight uh, within prosecutors' offices either. Uh, you don't have a right to go up the chain of command in a prosecutor's office. Um, prosecutors aren't obligated to let defendants present evidence before this negotiation takes place. Um, the prosecutor can engage in ex parte contacts with uh, law enforcement or other investigators or witnesses. And they don't need to share any of this information with the defendant, even information that's exculpatory at the plea bargaining stage. So prosecutors don't have to explain why they offered a particular sentence to one defendant but refused to make a similar offer to someone in a similar situation. We don't have transparency here. Uh, so defendants usually don't even know what other people are getting. And while the formal trial process is heavily regulated by those constitutional provisions I, I mentioned, the plea bargaining process is left entirely to the prosecutor's discretion. So I teach administrative law and criminal law. Um, and it's actually one of the driving forces in my scholarship is actually how we could possibly live in a world that there are so many more checks uh, when an agency is regulating an industry uh, than when an agency, a prosecutor's office, is, is regulating your liberty. Uh, and that world I think can only exist uh, if you have a Supreme Court that has essentially turned a blind eye to how coercive this all is and how important the jury is to it. Um, now, I, I want to point out other institutional actors have fully adjusted to this new in my view, unconstitutional normal. Uh, so we now have Congress and state legislatures promulgating criminal statutes for a world where plea bargaining is the norm, All right, which means prosecutors go into legislative sessions and they say, please pass new mandatory minimums because we need them to get more guilty pleas and cooperation. Um, and they're blatant about it, too. I'm not in making inferences here. They actually say this. For example, Congress was thinking about lowering some mandatory minimums uh, for some drug offenses. And the National Association of Assistant US Attorneys, a group that represents federal prosecutors, opposed the reduction uh, because they said it would make their job harder. They said, and now I'm quoting, that would prevent the government from obtaining benefits gained through concessions during bargaining. All right, They didn't say these are the right punishments for what somebody did as a matter of blameworthiness. They just said, this is what we need to make our job easier. Now, uh, plea negotiations that are coercive are one way to pave the way for more admissions, uh, but that's not the only thing the court did. Um, we have about half a million people in America who are incarcerated on any given day uh, who haven't been convicted of anything. Um, and they haven't pleaded guilty. Uh, they are locked up pretrial. Uh, and that is a direct result of six members of the Supreme Court giving their blessing to the ideal, uh, idea of pretrial detention on the basis of future dangerousness uh, in a case called United States versus Salerno. Um, in that case, the court decided that the Bail Reform Act um, which had said that you could hold people in the exact same facility where they are held after they are convicted wasn't punishment. Um, because that detention, pretrial detention, is regulatory in nature, uh, where after conviction, it's punitive. Now, Salerno was decided in the mid-1980s, kind of the peak war on drugs and crime. And, and I think uh, it's pretty plain when you read it that the court bought into the idea because it thought, and it said, that the government's interest in preventing crime 
outweighed the individual's liberty interest. Now, I first just want to pause so that everybody knows uh, that the entire regime of pretrial detention is actually terrible if your goal is preventing crime. Um, and here we have lots of empirical studies that show people detained pretrial are actually more likely to commit crimes when they're released than people who have been released pretrial, controlling for the crime they committed, controlling for criminal history, and all the things you control for. It's the detention itself that makes the risk of crime greater. Uh, and that makes sense when you stop to think about it, because when you detain somebody, um, they're going to lose their jobs. They are, most people are going to get evicted because they can't make their rent when they don't have their jobs. Uh, they lose custody of their children. Their life is in shambles. Think how much harder it is when you're released uh, to stay on a path where you don't turn uh, to illegal conduct when those are your circumstances. So a policy matter, it's terrible. Um, but it's more egregious to me that the court would think that liberty could be stripped away just because the government thought it was a good idea. Um, and here, I'm just going to quote a longer quote from uh, Justice Marshall's dissent uh, in that case, because I think he gets it right. He says, throughout the world today, there are men, women, and children interned indefinitely, awaiting trials which may never come, uh, or which may be a mockery of the word, because the gov their governments believe them to be dangerous. Our Constitution, whose construction began two centuries ago, can shelter us forever from the evils of such unchecked power. Over 200 years, it has slowly, through our efforts, grown more durable, more expansive, and more just. But it cannot protect us if we lack the courage and the self-restraint to protect ourselves. Today, a majority of the court applies itself to an ominous exercise in demolition. There is truly a de this, theirs is truly a decision which will go forth without authority and come back without respect. All right, amen to that, Justice Marshall. This is one of the worst decisions uh, that the court has issued. And the result is clear. We have half a million people who are detained precisely uh, because this gives it countenance. And the threat of detention is one of the other chips that prosecutors now use in their coercive bargaining tactics. Uh, because they get people detained pretrial, and they say, particularly in misdemeanor cases, hey, you know what? Uh, you can be released to time served if you just plead guilty. Uh, we'll have you detained, and then we'll get that guilty plea, because that's what you're going to want to do in order to, to get out. Uh, all right, so that's how the court played a role in having more and more people admitted to our prisons. Uh, but it also has played a role in that second factor, uh, which is the length of sentence. Um, and here, the court has just completely failed to police sentence length. Uh, again, in derogation of its duty under the Constitution, which has an amendment dedicated to this. So a majority of the justices agree that the Eighth Amendment does prohibit excessively long sentences. Uh, and I have to say, somewhat frighteningly, um, and in contradiction of language and history, we've had at least three justices, um, Scalia, Thomas, and Alito, who thought, no sentence of incarceration can be disproportionate. Um, but a majority has not bought into that. Uh, a majority of the court has said, yes, you can have excessively long sentences that violate the Constitution. Um, but the test the court uses to determine whether a sentence is, is excessively long is effectively impossible to satisfy. And in fact, no sentence has ever been struck down on this test, uh, even in a country where you can get a life sentence for an $88.30 check. So the court uses a test from a concurring opinion of Justice Kennedy's in a case called Harmelin versus Michigan. Um, and under that test, if you want to challenge your sentence under the Eighth Amendment, um, you have to show the sentence is grossly disproportionate, uh, which in the court's view means you have to show that the state has no reasonable basis for believing it will serve a penological goal. All right, but penological goals can include deterrence, rehabilitation, re, um, retribution, and this one's the kicker uh, of why you can really never win, incapacitation. Right? If the state says, oh, we need to sentence you to a really long time to incapacitate you for a really long time, then the state has a reasonable basis. And so that's how you get uh, Supreme Court and lower court decisions that say it's OK to give someone a 25 to year, years to life sentence for stealing a slice of pizza um, because uh, that's how you incapacitate them from, from stealing more pizza. Uh, so here are some real Eighth Amendment cases that the Supreme Court has decided. It's OK to have a mandatory life sentence for someone who has committed three low-level theft offenses that cumulatively total less than $230. It's OK to have a mandatory life sentence without parole for a defendant who had no prior record. This was his first offense, uh, and he possessed 672 grams of cocaine. It's OK to have a 25 years to life sentence for someone under California's uh, three strikes law who stole three golf clubs uh, because the defendant had a prior record that included other burglaries and a robbery. 
it's also okay to give someone a 50 years to life sentence uh, who had no violence at all in his past, um, but whose third strike, uh, actually his second and his third strike, were two incidents where he stole videotapes from a Kmart worth $150. All right, all uh, before the court and all okay. Um, so the Supreme Court has effectively taken the judiciary out of the business of checking the state when it comes to long punishments. Uh, the court knows how to give greater scrutiny uh, for proportionality because it's done so in other contexts, including its death penalty cases. Um, so its failure to do it in a non-capital context, even though the Constitution is no less relevant, um, is really one of the, the worst examples of a judiciary not enforcing a, a explicit constitutional guarantee. Um, there are so many other areas that I can talk about, um, but, but I think these in particular show you a direct line uh, between how you get increased admissions and how you get long sentences. Um, we could talk about other things, and I'm, I'm happy to, uh, whether you want to talk about allowing police misconduct uh, through its immunity, its created immunity doctrines, um, and various other things the court has done, but these are the direct through line. Uh, uh, and these are areas that I think are interesting for another reason, um, which is they should have been areas that would have appealed both to the more liberal justices who have otherwise shown an interest in poor communities, communities of color who have uh, borne the brunt of the excesses here, um, and that it's an area that should have also appealed to uh, justices who tend to be more conservative, who are uh, adherents to originalism, um, because these are firmly grounded uh, in all of the originalist arguments and framing and text. Um, but I think this result is odd. Um, only uh, if you tend to think of the court as being divided along those liberal and conservative lines. Um, because focusing on that division might make you miss the area where they're actually united. Um, and where they are united when it comes to criminal law is deference to police and prosecutors. There is always a majority on the court for that, no matter what their ideological background or their theory of jurisprudence. And one reason for that bias I would like to leave you with is how we choose our justices in the first place. Uh, it is a bench that is drawn overwhelmingly from the pool of government lawyers. These are people who have spent their lives, their careers, defending and representing the government, right? As prosecutors in the Solicitor General's office and other positions in the Department of Justice. Um, we have rarely seen justices who just represent regular people, right? Who see their stories up close, witness the toll of governmental abuse and misconduct. Um, rarer still would be justices who defend people who are accused of crimes. So we get a skewed perspective, I think. And I think they are more inclined to see themselves in the governmental lawyers who are arguing these cases, and they're too quick to defer, right? They're assuming a regularity, a trust in the way things operate. Um, and I just want to remind you that the framers feared exactly that, right? They really wanted to put regular people who were not part of that governmental machine between the government and any ability to punish. Uh, but that courts erased the boundaries, um, and I think we have lost a lot as a result for it. Now, I don't think there's any easy answers to this, but I do want to just, uh, in closing, emphasize one. Uh, that I think is a place to start anyway. Um, and that's diversifying the professional background of the people who serve as judges. Uh, because currently we have a bench that is dominated, dominated uh, by former prosecutors and lawyers who has, uh, who've represented the government. Um, and no one has done better research on this than Cato. Uh, there is a May report uh, by Clark Neely who looked at the background of federal judges uh, and found that 44% were former government advocates compared to just over 6% who were advocates for individuals against the government. A seven to one imbalance, right? And if we look at those with criminal law experience, how many prosecutors to defense lawyers, uh, it's a ratio four to one. Uh, Andrew Crespo has noted that since the early 1970s, the Supreme Court has sent, seen a threefold increase in the number of justices who have experience working as criminal prosecutors. Um, and it's not just that rise of prosecutors, it's the lack of any justice who's represented people who have been stopped, frisked, arrested, subject to governmental detention. Um, that can bring a really valuable perspective. Uh, to the court. Uh, we saw that with Justice Marshall. Uh, he brought that perspective, uh, and his colleagues have said that it was influential with them. But now, as Crespo notes, no justice serving now or since Marshall's retirement has spent any significant time working as a criminal defense attorney prior to joining the court. Um, instead, 
when we have people who have direct experience with criminal law enforcement, it is people who themselves were advocating with earnestness and vigor on behalf of the interests of law enforcement. Um, so we're missing the people who have seen this from the other side. Uh, so here I just want to join and applaud Cato uh, for calling out the need to get more lawyers who have done criminal defense uh, and defended civil liberties on the bench. Um, I think that's going to be critical to, to making any kind of dent in this, in this pattern. I don't know that it'll absolutely solve it, um, but I think it's something that we should pay attention to, and certainly anyone who's interested in criminal law reform should pay attention to it. Um, it would also mean not just at the Supreme Court level, uh, but at all judicial levels. Uh, when you have judicial elections in the states, uh, same thing. We've seen prosecutor elections with people focused on getting reformers in there who recognize that the government has gone too far in this area. Uh, and I think it's time to think about judges uh, and in that same light and making sure you get folks who really understand this. Uh, you know, other interest groups are out there focusing on their substantive issues in the courts. Um, we know that labor groups focus on the courts uh, because of how much importance they play in union rights or abortion rights groups understand how important the courts are. And I think people who care about criminal law need to be just as vigilant here. Um, judges really matter and these appointments really matter and it, and it matters the perspective that people are bringing. Um, and it's not just a left-right split. Uh, is the kind of last thing I want to leave with you. Uh, sometimes we see Republicans who appoint uh, judges because of their methodologies end up protecting criminal law guarantees in the Constitution precisely because they have this strong originalist grounding. Um, and, and sometimes uh, we, we see sometimes that Democratic presidents do as well, and, and sometimes we see exactly the reverse. Uh, and, and here I'll just say that uh, President Obama, who was uh, claimed to be very uh, interested in criminal law reform. I mean, he wrote a law review article about it, and so when you think, what would it take for a president to write a law review article? Uh, clearly, he cared a lot about criminal law reform, uh, and yet, of his judges, um, only 14% had public defense experience uh, and 41% were prosecutors. Um, so I think this is important to mention just to show you can't be complacent and just assume that because someone says they're interested in criminal law reform uh, that they're thinking about how it might be reflected in judicial appointments. Uh, so going forward, if you care about these issues, you know, I would certainly urge you to follow what your senators are doing, to see what names they're putting forth for judicial nominations. Um, and certainly pay attention to some of those state elections as well. Uh, I don't think this is going to change the tide of mass incarceration that we have seen, um, but I do think it's a necessary first step uh, because the courts have been key players in creating mass incarceration, uh, and they're going to have to be key players in tearing it down. Thank you. We have plenty of time, for, unless you want to answer the questions from here. No, I can sit there. Um, we have 12 and a half minutes of uh, time for questions. Uh, you can submit online, hashtag SCOTUS, on whatever platform you're on. Uh, let's go right back there. Who has the mic? I guess we don't have a mic yet. Sam, are there any internet questions yet? You have a mic, all right. No, actually, I called back back there. Back. While you're walking up, I'll ask a first question to lubricate things while we're getting uh, the muscle memory back for how this all works. Um, you sort of answered this with getting into a little bit of overcriminalization uh, on the back end, but as you were talking about the, the plea bargaining part, um, I was thinking, and a bit of a devil's advocate, is it whether it's the judiciary that's being coercive or the legislature, in the sense that in the question of the $88 forger, is it the plea bargain that outrages us, or is it that you can get five years for an $88 check, or if you don't agree to that, then you'll get life, um, which of course is what the legislature put in. Uh, and we're not talking about violent crimes. You can imagine, you know, a prosecutor who has to be reelected, uh, you know, doesn't want to go light on murderers and rapists and child molesters, but you know, the people aren't exactly riled up by being, you know, soft on forgers or or something like this. Be, and, you know, imagine if the the choice, the coercive choice, was five days versus a year, which is a bigger ratio than five years versus life. But you know, that dynamic would work differently. So you know, and again, you said you did say at the back end that the court's not policing the term either, so that's an issue too. 
Uh, but you know, the legislature is the one that, that first screws it up, right? Oh yeah, I could I could cast blame on all of them. Um, certainly, the legislative judgments in this area are um, not based in any empirical reality. Um, these things are doing nothing to keep us safer. I can definitely tell you that. Uh, and then prosecutors ask for some of these things, and sometimes legislators do it on their own, even without being asked. So it's not like it's just at the bidding of law enforcement. Um, but the key common ingredient in both, whichever one of them we're talking about, is the court could stop either, the judiciary could stop either of those things under constitution, under valid constitutional authority, because both the coercive nature of the threat, you know, uh, if you were to look at a criminal code, um, whether federal or in a state, uh, you can't even believe how many crimes there are in there, right? We have hundreds and we have so many federal crimes we can't get a count. Um, so we, we don't have a valid count, but we need it somewhere in the hundreds of thousands. And state codes maybe don't have quite that many, um, but the menu of choices for prosecutors is so great in any given fact pattern that that allows them to kind of create this coercive bargaining atmosphere because the prosecutor can say, oh, I'm either gonna charge you with this if you go to trial, or I'll agree not to charge that one and that'll really affect the sentence. So you're right that it's a combination of both of those things. It's the tools that the legislatures are giving, um, which are in many cases excessively long, um, and ha this kind of weird menu of choices that lets prosecutors do it. It's the prosecutors deciding to use that authority, that power that they have, uh, to coerce people to give up their jury trial right. Um, but the thing I want you to be most outraged about right now uh, is that neither of those things should happen if the court was doing its job because we shouldn't have excessive sentences in these cases that are effectively cruel and unusual punishments. And we shouldn't allow a constitutional right to be conditioned this way, um, just like we don't allow that to happen in other constitutional contexts. So in you know kind of both areas, I view it as the court falling short, um, but there's plenty of blame to go around. Uh, you know, It's definitely something that we could say all three branches have been complicit. And today, I just wanted to call out the one that I think hasn't gotten enough of the blame that I think it deserves. So just like with administrative law or the Commerce Clause, too much deference, too much restraint. Got it. Trey Mayfield had a question. Yes, related to Ilya's question, actually. Given that a prosecutor could stack up that entire available arsenal of charges knowing what they are, what would be your preferred framework as we sit here for reforming the plea bargaining regime? Yeah, I mean, it's it's. I will admit that it's not a super easy situation to... Uh, to deal with, although I think if they stacked it all, so you know, so you're raising the issue of well, if it's uh, if it's a case where they they charge lightly and then threaten to go harsh if you exercise your trial right, if you say you can't do that, then maybe what they would do is just stack it all up in advance and say, look, we're charging you with everything, um, and if you then decide to plead guilty, uh, we'll dismiss some of them, right? I mean, I think that's just another way of creating the same kind of coercive atmosphere. So the question becomes, what can the court do to police that kind of uh, excessive charging? So one, we could think about um, whether or not there's a real proportionality principle that says punishments for some would just be too excessive given the underlying facts of the case. Um, and then the other way would be to just think about what amounts to just like two greater uh, too big of a difference between what you face if you go to trial versus what you plea. Now, I know the line drawing is tough, right? And I'm I'm a pretty big fan myself of bright lines. Uh, you know, I, I did enjoy that aspect of Justice Scalia's jurisprudence, and we shared that in common. I'm not a huge fan of the mushier tests. Um, but here, I think they, the court could create a line, much in the way that it's done for things like speedy trial and other contexts that may kind of seem like picking a number out of error, but that is grounded in some real concerns for what's at stake. You know, maybe that, that penalty can't be greater than 10%. Um, certainly the idea that it's threefold greater is, is too much. So that's one thing. You know, short of making it something about the distance between, you know, the what you get if you plead versus what you get to trial, whether it's charged initially or it's amended later. Um, other things the court could do short of that that I don't think would be as effective but could still be helpful. Um, one would be to insist that um, you get your right to Brady material, which is all the exculpatory evidence that the prosecutor has against you, um, instead of allowing the government to, to not give that to you until just before trial, to insist that the government has to give it to you before you plea. 
Um, at least that would allow defendants to make a more fully informed choice about what their risk is at trial. I don't think that's a perfect solution, um, but it's something that is more modest, certainly doable. Uh, West Virginia has already done that as a matter of their state constitution, and some legislators have done that as a matter of just non-constitutional law, like New York. Uh, we have a law in place now that does that. Um, that, that helps a, a little bit. I think the other thing that could help a long way would be um, getting rid of mandatory sentences, which are the biggest cudgel that prosecutors have because they really, con mandatory minimums, because they really control the sentence then. There's no discretion by the judge. Uh, and pretrial detention. Uh, that is a huge chunk of the cases where people plead guilty uh, because of that kind of coercive. So those wouldn't go as far as I think that idea of setting a distinction between how much you can threaten versus uh, what you get if you plead guilty, but they would be ways that would definitely mediate at least some of that coercion. Um, and that could either happen through you know, court decisions that because the court just doesn't want to go further or legislatively. Um, we could certainly see that as a matter of, of reform. Sam has some online question. Uh, yes, uh, I, had to, I had to read this name twice. Uh, this is from Gregory Peck. Um, how do you oh, I see love Gregory Peck. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a, a pseudonym, perhaps? Maybe. <laughs> how do you a see very the, good defense lawyer. <laughs> how do you see the emergence of privately owned prisons as affecting um, incarceration rates and over-sentencing? So not much, you know. I, I, that one gets a lot of political airplay. I know it became uh, something that a fair number of uh, politicians kind of have raised as a buzzword. I have to tell you, when I hear about it, if someone lists that as like the first thing they're thinking about criminal law reform, I get nervous that they're really not knee deep in these issues because if you are, um, you would know it's less than eight percent of all the people who are incarcerated in America are in any kind of private prison or facility. Um, so. 92% are in public facilities, and they all share in common all the same awful attributes. So the distinction between private and public facilities for anything of significance is really, it's, it's, it's minor. I mean, the conditions, uh, you could take a look at something, some of the things that have been written recently, for example, about Rikers, uh, where I'm from in New York City. Uh, that's a publicly run facility, uh, and it's as bad a facility as you could possibly imagine being described. So I think it's definitely, uh, I'm not saying that private facilities aren't a problem, but that's not the root of this problem. Um, you know, if what we're worried about are conditions, or most importantly, I think, um, not to dismiss how important conditions are, but, you know, if, if the thing that you really want to ask about what we do to people who are in prisons and jails is, how are they when they come out, right? Because 95% of the people who go in rejoin their communities, and wouldn't you want to know that they were doing a good job in those places preparing people for when they come out, right? Because essentially a jail and a prison is just a big governmental program, right? We're spending a ton of money on it. We're asking them to take people in and we're asking them to, to help make things better when they come back out. We don't study a single jail or prison in America to see if they're doing a good job. We don't, there's no oversight. There's no transparency. There's no oversight. There's no nothing. And you know what? They're doing a terrible job because recidivism rates are sky high. And I think there's too quick of a tendency to say, oh, that's not the facility. That's the person, right? That's the person who went in. But think about that. If, if it's the, what good are the prisons and jails doing while they're there? Like they're doing nothing to make any of those things better. What about comparing two facilities to see is A better than B? What is A doing that works better than B? We don't do any of that. Uh, and I think that's true of public and private facilities as well. We just, there are these black boxes that uh, people go in, they're treated horribly, they're not given programming that we know could work and make things better. Um, they're put in conditions that are very violent and frankly could bring out the worst in anyone. Um, and then we take those people who we now put in a situation that's really quite difficult for them and expect them to do well afterward. Um, it's, it's crazy, right? It's, it's a really crazy way to operate any kind of punishment regime. Uh, and that's crazy whether the state is running it or a private contractor is. I think we have time for one question right there. Uh, Devin. Um, you blame the Supreme Court for a lot of these problems. I wonder, though, if the district court judge accepting these plea agreements could really cause a lot of problems with what their prosecutors are doing by asking just two simple questions to the prosecutor. 
Do you, before I accept this plea deal, is the defendant appropriately charged for the crimes he committed? And two, is what you're asking me to accept in here a reasonable sentence for those crimes? Then once they say yes, you turn to the defendant and says, prosecutor says this is a reasonable punishment for the crimes. He's convinced me. If you decide to go to trial, I don't think you're going to be punished for more than what the prosecutor says is reasonable, and I believe that's true. Do you accept this plea agreement still? Well, so first of all, I think you should consider a career in judging. Uh, but as so we haven't had judges who've done anything like that. Um, in their defense, I will say, some of what they're doing, their hands are tied precisely because what the court said in Bordenkircher, which is the, if they go to trial, the prosecutor can say, oh, no, no, that deal was if they pleaded guilty. But um, it's also a reasonable sentence for me, the prosecutor, to bring these additional charges for you under habitual law A or, you know, enhanced greater offense B. Um, and, and once that charge is brought, uh, as long as there is evidence to, to substantiate that charge, as long as the prosecutor has, you know, probable cause to believe a reasonable jury could find that uh, on the evidence that the prosecutor's going to present, then if the jury uh, convicts, a lot of these cases, the sentence is mandatory, so the judge can't do anything about it. Um, and so I do think you're right that we could get more pushback from judges than we're getting from, from lower court judges. And I will say, I think that, uh, you know, it's Constitution Day and I was focused on the Supreme Court, but I, I really do think that district court judges could be doing much more um, than they are. Uh, and we should think about the population of the whole bench, not just uh, the justices. Um, but I also think that it, it's, it's true that a big part of this problem lies in those mandatory punishments and the pretrial detention because there's nothing, although the pretrial detention is also the fault of the judges as well because they don't have to just agree every time a prosecutor asks for someone to get detained. They kind of reflexively go along with that. So they could push back more than they do 100%. Um, if they did that, it would go a long way to solving this problem, but we'd still, the, the mandatory sentencing and the ability to bring the subsequent charges makes things a little bit more complicated. I'm afraid that concludes this program. It concludes our conference. Let's give a round of applause to Rachel. Now we're having, for those of you who are here in person, uh, you've earned a reception on our Ken and Freda Levy Liberty Garden on the roof deck on the seventh floor. Please be patient and look for the event staff to help you onto the elevators. Those of you at home, it's still summer. We have four more days until officially fall begins, so I still will recommend uh, a Negroni uh, if you're going to your own personal uh, reception. Uh, and with that, we are adjourned for another year of Constitution Day. Thank you. <laughs>